Hello, Dr. Sherman. Hello, Siddharth. Uh, should we start, uh, Ujala? Okay. If you let me share my slides when you're ready. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Sadaf Ahmed from AIRC. I would like to welcome you all in the seventh session of uh, International Conference on Psychophysiology. Uh, this is the conference that we designed back uh, seven years back in such a way that participants will have the interaction with the uh, working and the experienced uh, psychophysiologists, neuroscientists. Our aim was to educate the psychophysiologists, psychologists, researchers, epidemiologists, behavioral neuroscientists, and mental health workers on the aspects and the importance of studying the brain health and mental well-being. This conference was designed to build a network and scientific community that can work together and to make a real difference, uh, especially in the countries where it is much needed. Uh, as you all know that uh, there are very less uh, career opportunities for these scholars when they want to uh, study about the body connections and the brain and body connections and how the mental health and well-being work uh, in the developing countries and specifically in Pakistan. So we wanted to educate and familiarize the early career students and the researchers who have common interest in the brain and psychophysiology and to help them in exploring the future dimensions as well. This conference uh, has been leading the path related to many uh, aspects of psychophysiology and neuroscience. And we have been doing this uh, with reference to uh, international um, aspects where the work is much needed. Uh, we are very much privileged that uh, we have some very great uh, experts uh, with us now, and we are taking this forward with uh, so much enthusiasm and so much hope that people can connect to one another and they get the opportunities to learn from the best. Uh, let me introduce our plenary speaker today, Professor Dr. Richard uh, Sherman. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Dr. Sherman uh, is uh, a PhD in psychobiology from New York University, and uh, he has more than uh, 30 years of experience of teaching and research, a very well-known teacher, a very superb teacher of uh, uh, doing uh, education as a fun, uh, I must say, for all the medical residents and the graduate uh, students and the postgraduate students. We are very much privileged that uh, in Pakistan, we have already started a diploma program in uh, psychophysiology, and he is the course director of uh, that program as well. Uh, Dr. Sherman has initiated various distance-based formats program, both on-site and distance-based program on psychophysiology, and to teach people regarding the basics of psychophysiology and applied psychophysiology. His interest was mainly when he was uh, doing the research and initiated this field on the phantom limb pain, temporal relationships between changes in muscle tension, pain, environmental studies, biofeedback, and many more. His work has resulted more than 125 research articles and several books, and we are very much uh, uh, hopeful that we are uh, surely trying to contribute in this and his research has been supported numerous private foundations as well like AIRC, like Behavioral Medicine Foundation, Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense and National Institute of Health in USA. He has been president of Association of Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback that has been a leading association for all such activities and research program. And he has initiated a lot of things from there and that platform as well. Thank you so much, sir. One last introduction that Dr. Sherman is leading Annals of Psychophysiology. Uh, that is a journal that we are trying to establish on the international platform as well. And he's guiding us a lot in establishing that on the international standards. Thank you so much, sir, for doing this. And we welcome you. Over to you, sir. Thank you for that kind introduction. Most of what you heard 
uh, of my recent efforts is largely due to Sadaf and I partnering on all of these efforts. So lest you misunderstand, she's the true leader and power behind this. So without further ado, uh, let me start my talk. If you would let me share my slides, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir, you can share the screen. Tonight, I'm gonna to spend some time talking to you about psychophysiological assessment of common problems. And this is most people's idea of what a psychophysiology lab is like. They think it's run by a mad scientist and you have all this equipment that nobody can understand. But I hope you'll realize that that's really not true. Although there may be a mad scientist involved, certainly the equipment is very much understandable. Tonight, I'm talking to you about psychophysiological assessments rather than interventions, because assessment is where we truly shine and where our techniques should be available to virtually all clinicians and coaches and educators in the world. The aim of the psychophysiological assessment is to produce information that's not available through other assessment approaches, which provides highly specific information about physiological systems and responses causing or sustaining problems. This information may be used to provide very specific psychophysiologically based interventions, which can be used to rectify the identified problem and relieve the symptoms. So that's, that's the idea. We wanna provide information you can't get in any other way. Psychophysiological assessments are used in many environments including clinical environments, figuring out the cause of headaches, type of ADHD, uh, reason for knee pain, things like that, in educational environments, for figuring out why stress responses are occurring, why people are having problems focusing their attention, optimal functioning in sports, is there something wrong with somebody's breathing patterns that keeps them from doing their best? Are they timing their muscle tension patterns properly? And of course, there are military applications, improperly sustained muscle tension leading to pain, and et cetera. Given the variety of disciplines using psychophysiological assessments, Ask yourself what education it takes to know about all of the techniques in sufficient depth to know which are useful for any of a wide variety of situations and problems, along with the pitfalls of each. That takes a lot of learning. You need somebody with a diploma or degree in psychophysiology to have this depth of knowledge. A few specialists from individual disciplines such as sports or psychology may know about a few of the techniques, but may have no idea that other techniques that would meet their needs even exist. Many clinicians, educators, coaches, and et cetera, may have only heard of a few and then use them inappropriately. So as we go through this, think of the training. My dog decided he had to go out right then. 
physiological systems that are commonly recorded as part of the assessment process include muscle tension patterns and responses to assess problems with optimal functioning in sports and work, causes of tension, headaches, knee pain, et cetera. Patterns of respiration to assess problems with optimal functioning in sports and in business and anxiety reactions. <clears throat> Quantitative EEG and basic EEG patterns to assess types of ADHD, difficulty concentrating at work at school, et cetera. Sweating is recorded to assess and track anxiety reactions. Heart rate variability is used to assess the likelihood of onset of severe illness and psychophysiological contributions to anxiety reactions, irritable bowel syndrome, and et cetera. Temperature is recorded to assess causes of phantom pain, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, migraine headaches, and et cetera. So it takes different skills to be able to do all these different recordings. In the clinical environment, applied psychophysiological assessments are increasingly being shown to be valuable tools in the diagnosis and treatment of numerous disorders. Psychophysiological recording techniques are an important tool in the clinician's diagnostic armamentarium because they can easily and reliably differentiate between problems with similar symptoms like TMD, that's muscle-related jaw area pain, and TMJ, jaw joint-based jaw area pain and objectively demonstrate abnormal patterns of function, which do not show on standard clinical medical tests of structure. So our assessments are frequently looking at problems with an intact system functioning abnormally while the structures underlying the system are just fine. So no problems show up on more common tests. For migraine and tension headache assessment, we can determine exactly what is causing this man's headaches. There's no need for random trials of miserable pills, no need for wrong behavioral approaches. The therapist knows what is wrong, can choose the most likely treatment, then track the physiology to see if the person is learning to correct the problem. In optimal functioning, psychophysiological assessments are used to identify patterns of physical and mental activity which prevent people from functioning optimally. They're then taught to control those systems so they can perform optimally in sports, school, and the workplace. Biofeedback is frequently used to help people focus better, tense when they should, breathe properly, and reduce anxiety. In sports performance, we can figure out exactly why this soldier is not doing as well as he should when he runs. We can record incorrect breathing patterns which leave him out of breath at the wrong time. Muscle tension patterns showing when he tenses when he should relax. Brain waves showing he isn't focusing when he should and lots more. There's all kinds of specialized equipment for evaluating breathing efficiency. 
that's used in the sports arena, but is now being used more and more for people who are essentially couch potatoes, who just don't move around enough to some extent because they don't breathe properly. <clears throat> I mentioned jaw area pain before. Jaw area pain is commonly caused by problems with the jaw, joint, that's TMJ, or the muscles which control jaw motion, that's TMD. Muscle tension recordings from the jaw muscles clearly differentiate between pain caused by chronic tension, splinting, and TMJ. Just a 5% increase in jaw muscle tension for several hours is enough to cause jaw area pain and tension headaches. People cannot feel that tiny difference, but psychophysiological recordings detect it easily. People with back pain, Back pain is commonly ascribed to muscle tension problems. But sometimes you think it's muscle tension, but it's something else. And if it's muscle tension, what is there about the way the muscles are functioning that's causing the pain? Are they incorrect bilaterally? Do they tense incorrectly when people bend and rise or sit? Just what is it about the way people are moving or standing that's causing the pain? Without knowing that, there's no way to teach people to recognize when the patterns are wrong and correct it. For pain in the shoulders and the neck, If you look at this colored recording, the red and the green are left and right trapezius muscles in the shoulders. And <clears throat> we're recording somebody over a period of four hours here. And this is a person who never relaxes their shoulder muscles. And they've got pain at a level of two to three on a scale of zero to 10. After training, look at the difference. There are periods when the person is relaxed and there are per periods when the muscles are all together off. So what we've shown here is that the person has a muscle tension problem and we're showing that they fixed it. This is actually part of a study that we did. And it turned out that people who did not learn to lower their muscle tension did not show decreased headaches and pain. One of our major uh, assessment techniques is the psychophysiological profile. In the psychophysiological profile, we're looking for physiological parameters that are responsive to stresses related to the patient's problems. And very often the patient does not know that their physiology is changing when they're under stress. We can also use the profile <clears throat> to track the patterns of uh, stress responses over time. So here's that same person with the headaches again, but now you can see not only we're recording muscle tension from the forehead, we're recording breathing, we're recording um, heart rate from the thumb. 
we're recording temperature, we're recording sweating, and usually we'd be recording uh, EEG as well. So this is what we're recording during a profile. And this is what we see. We see all the different areas that we're recording. And we see what happens when the person imagines that they're under tension, when they're relaxed. So we can see which parameters re, uh, respond to tension, imagine tension, and to relaxation. Um, here's an example of doing a psychophysiological assessment of phantom limb pain. Until just a few years ago, it was thought that phantom limb pain, where amputees felt pain coming from a limb they no longer have, was just imaginary. It was something in their heads. This is a woman. You can see that she's missing her lower limb, who reports having intermittent cramping phantom limb pain. What we want to know is what's really causing the phantom pain. Here's a muscle tension recording from her intact left thigh. And this is from the right thigh, which is the remaining part of the limb that was amputated. <clears throat> this person is experiencing spasms just before she experiences cramping phantom pain. When the spasm goes away, Within seconds, the phantom pain goes away. So right here, before she reports the phantom pain, here comes the spasm. The spasm goes away and then the phantom pain goes away. This is consistent. There's no change in muscle tension in the intact limb. The way reflexes work is if you were to touch your, uh, let's say you were to touch your uh, left hand to a hot stove, when you didn't realize it was a hot stove, you would jerk away, but there would be a little tiny jerk in your right hand. So you have this and also this. So if the pain was caused by something else, you would see a reaction here, a muscle tension reaction here, and you don't. So this pain really is caused by muscle tension. And we can go ahead and teach her to prevent the spasms. Blood flow can be very problematic when it comes to pain. If there's not enough blood flow to an area of your body, it begins to hurt. Like if you're laying on an arm wrong while you're sleeping and you cut off most of your blood supply, your limb begins to tingle. <clears throat> so you get burning sensations when you have decreased blood flow. What we want to look at is measuring blood flow to see whether there's a relationship between the blood flow and pain. So here's a camera that picks up heat coming out of the skin. All of the heat that comes out of the skin is caused by blood flowing within about a centimeter and a half of the surface. 
So if we're talking about the hands, we're actually getting a picture of all of the blood flow in the hands. So if we have a painful hand or a painful foot, we can see what the relationship is between blood flow and the pain. So here's a little tiny painful spot on this hand. And you can see there's a difference in temperature here relative to the rest of the hand. Now on any limbs, there's a little variation in patterns of temperature. You can see this doesn't exactly look like this. This doesn't look like this. There's always a little variation, but not a lot of variation. So here's somebody with phantom pain. This finger is missing and the pain feels like it's coming from this missing finger. With no pain, <clears throat> notice the temperature of the two hands is about the same, same colors. But as the pain increases, notice the hands are not the same temperature anymore. Here, the area is much, much colder. With moderate pain, it's icy cold. Here, with severe pain, there's virtually no blood flow at all. This is the same as the background. So what we've established is a relationship between blood flow and pain for this person. Uh, so what? So there are many treatments for increasing blood flow to an area. When we successfully increase blood flow to the area, either through behavioral interventions or medicine or nerve blocks, the pain goes away. We know exactly what treatment uh, to try. Um, assessment of pelvic area pain. When people become incontinent, when they have urinary incontinence, very often there's absolutely no way to tell why they leak. Do they squirt when they're running? Do they just plain start to leak while they're sitting still? What's happening? What's causing it? If we record muscle tension from the pelvic floor, and from the lower abdomen, we can look at people's ability to tense up. For instance, here's somebody who has urinary incontinence. When we ask the person to tense the pelvic floor, the abdomen tenses up instead. The abdomen is a giant muscle and it shoves the urine right out. But what they're trying to do is tense the pelvic floor. So look at this pattern. The pelvic floor doesn't tense up right away and it doesn't stay tense, it just dribbles on down. But after we train them, look at the difference in the pattern. Now it's the pelvic floor that goes up and the abdomen remains relaxed. This person has stopped tensing and stopped leaking. But we knew what to do. We knew what the problem was and we were able to fix it. Uh, for pelvic floor pain, if you look at somebody who has pain, uh, especially pain in the vagina um, that's not caused by anything that anybody can detect. 
very often what we find is that the muscles are abnormally tense all the time. This is a normal EMG recording. When we ask the person to tense up, they stay tense and they go down. But here's someone with vaginal pain. Their muscle tension is too high. And when they want to tense up, they can't maintain this nice level of tension. And it goes down to still being way too tense. So too tense and lack of control. The idea is to train someone to go from this pattern to this pattern. But what we've done is we've found the problem, that it's not something else. Raynaud syndrome is when your hands, your nose, or your feet become icy cold when you expose them to a cool draft or you put your hand in the uh, refrigerator's freezer. What's happening is that blood flow virtually stops to the hands or the feet or the nose. What we can do is record people's temperature as they're exposed to different stresses, different temperature stresses, and find out what starts this problem going and then teach them to prevent it. Without that, there's very little you can do. Um, Non-cardiac chest pain. Why do people have so much pain in their chest when there's nothing wrong with their heart or their lungs? Yet this is very, very common. It turns out that for most people, it's an incorrect breathing problem which brings on anxiety. Well, how do you know that? How do you know it's a breathing problem? You have to do an assessment of their breathing and see if incorrect breathing is causing the chest pain. If it is, then we know what to do. And you can skip all kinds of psychotherapy for stress. Knee area pain. Pain in the kneecap is very often caused by the major muscles that control the position of the kneecap, not tensing and relaxing in the right pattern. When people do physical therapy to strengthen these muscles, they strengthen both together, but they don't know that there's something wrong with the pattern of tensing. It takes a muscle tension evaluation using psychophysiological techniques to figure out that there's an incorrect pattern and then retrain it. monitoring stress responses for long-term health. I know I'm going through this very quickly, but I've only got a few minutes. Heart rate variability is related to how sick you're likely to get. If your heart rate does not vary, especially vary with your breathing. Here's someone breathing in and out and the heart rate varying with it. If it doesn't vary, you're gonna get very, very sick. 
So what you want to do to keep people healthy who have poor heart rate variability is teach them to vary their heart rate. And that relates to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system functioning together and creating long-term anxiety, which is probably what's causing people to become uh, so sick for so long. So again, it's these assessments that we do that tell us, aha, there's the problem. When you want to know how stressed somebody is over a long period of time, over months, and how that's related to their pain and their anxiety. Most stress tests only tell you how someone's doing at most for the last 24 hours, say a 24 hour urinary and cortisol collection. If you do a, a saliva test of urinary cortisol, that's only stress over a period of a few hours. If you want to know what's going on with your patient over a period of time, you use hair cortisol, yet almost nobody knows about that. So you need people who are trained in psychophysiology to know and guide you as to what assessments to use. And practitioners need to learn to incorporate psychophysiological assessments into their usual methods of assessing patients to improve the odds of making an accurate diagnosis than picking the correct treatment the first time. So, that's all I have to say about psychophysiological assessment. You're probably all in a daze about now since I went so quickly. I'm hoping you have questions. If you do, contact me. It's just rsherman at saybrook.edu. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, thank you so much, sir. Sir, we have some questions. And uh, if you allow, so I can narrate it here and I will allow some uh, participants to open their mic as well. Because there are two types of audience here. One is in Zoom with us. Those are the presenters of the conference and moderators. While the rest of the uh, participants are actually watching us on live on YouTube. So they are sending their questions. So if, if you allow- time, I'm very pleased to answer questions. Uh, sir, uh, Professor Dr. Samina Malik has asked that uh, which behavioral intervention one can advise to a person with pain, uh, phantom limb pain, and should he Stop tensing the area under the pain. Should he what the area under the pain? Stop tensing the area under the pain. Well, with phantom limb pain, the limb is gone. So what you have is the stump where uh, the pain is referred from the stump uh, into the limb. So it depends on what the phantom pain feels like, what the sensation is that's being reported. If it's a burning sensation, then there is not enough uh, blood flow reaching the residual limb. And you can increase that with a whole variety of vasodilators. And for some people, you can train them to increase blood flow to the residual limb. 
if it's a cramping type of a phantom pain, <clears throat> you can uh, teach people to prevent the cramps from starting using biofeedback uh, very successfully. For shocking shooting types of phantom pain, um, you have to work with uh, the patient's uh, fMRI and EEG to change how they're interpreting the pain. Am I answering the question? Dr. Samina, are you here? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Professor Richard, for uh, educating us. And this is a very innovative topic, and I'm highly interested in it. I, I just wanted you to focus on the behavioral uh, treatment uh, that the patient himself can manage. Which behavioral uh, therapy or which behavioral change you would advise to a patient who is feeling the pain at the stump of the lost limb, uh, where the pain is referring uh, to? This if, was precisely my question. If it's cramping phantom pain, record muscle tension from the major limb the major muscles of the residual limb, the stump, and show the raw recording to the person, not an average recording. I've written several papers on that. If anybody wants the papers, I can send them. But you're doing biofeedback of the raw recording so people can learn to recognize when a spasm is coming on. For burning, phantom limb pain, which is the other very common type of phantom pain, you want to record temperature in the limb. And you can do that with a thermometer and show the person the temperature in their limb and teach them to raise the temperature. That's only moderately successful because not everybody can learn to raise the temperature in their limb. We start by teaching to raise the temperature in their finger so that they know they can do it. And then we go on to the limb. But again, if that doesn't work, we use uh, vasodilator drugs that are highly successful. So, so, so I just wanted to confirm that uh, when we use a hot water bottle for a backache uh, or abdominal pain, then uh, don't you think that we are using a technique to distract uh, the, the pain uh, from uh, uh, by, by stimulating the temperature pathway, which is lying very close to the pain pathway, and both the you know, both pain and temperature pathways, they ascend in the lateral spinothalamic tract very closely, and uh, both are closely associated with each other with, because extremes of temperature is also interpreted as pain. So is this uh, the psychophysiology going on? Well, you're asking a different question. The problem with phantom pain, burning phantom pain, is there really is less blood flow there that's causing the pain. And if you do, um, if you take needles and record which nerves are responding, it's the pain nerves, not the temperature nerves that are responding uh, for uh, burning phantom pain. For putting, um, when, when you're looking at the back, when you're looking at muscle tension problems in the back where people are having uh, pain, it's truly cramps in the muscles that are responding. That's, that's the trick with doing psychophysiological assessments, especially that profile I told you about, where you record temperature from the area and you record muscle tension, you record autonomic responses of sweating from the area that's painful, and you can see what's actually going on. It's very, very rare that our traditional views of what we're doing uh, hold up. That doesn't mean the treatments aren't successful, but the underlying causes very often uh, aren't quite what we thought they were. 
Thank you very much. I got it. So we have to handle the underlying cause after getting it investigated. But the yes. patient himself will not be able to manage it without seeking the investigation. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Thank but you so much. You can, they can learn to control it once you show them what's wrong. Definitely. Thank you very much. I'm holding up uh, Dr. DeVore. Yes, sir. Sir, just last question. One uh, question that uh, uh, how a medical professional can continue their career in psychophysiology because uh, uh, actually there is no psychophysiology program in Pakistan other than this diploma that we are doing right now. But uh, the medical professionals actually uh, are not opting for that. We have two in the program. So if you can answer this question. You just did answer it. There is training now in psychophysiology in Pakistan. And um, we have a diploma program, and that's where you get it. Uh, join our program. Uh, um, sir, actually, in, actually, they also wanted to uh, ask about that. What are the career options? Uh, how they can uh, practice it out? And what are the career options after becoming a psychophysiologist? It depends on what you want to do the psychophysiology for. If you're a professional psychophysiologist who's interested in research, then you would go into academics. If what you're interested in, say, is sports, you become a psychophysiology coach. Uh, same thing for education. You coach children. So your career is uh, in guiding people to perform optimally. In clinical work, you would be, you would have your own clinical profession and add psychophysiology to it, the knowledge of psychophysiology uh, to it. What we're hoping to do is have a clinically a clinical psychophysiology profession where people can practice as psychophysiologists in many different countries. And that's growing. It's growing in the United States and parts of Europe. And we hope it's starting to grow in Pakistan. That's something that Sadaf and I are talking about. Uh, very definitely. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for the answer. I wish that uh, uh, we can uh, share this uh, moment again and uh, we will have a lot of queries after that, but we'll be posting to you uh, via email. Definitely email them to me and I'll get back to you. I can also send you papers. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Let me introduce our second speaker, the thematic talk. And uh, we are very much, very much excited to have him here. Thank you, Dr. Jerry, for uh, doing this. Uh, Ojala, can you allow Dr. Jerry to share the screen as well? Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Dr. Jerry R. DeVore. Dr. Jerry is a clinical psychologist and uh, licensed in the state of Washington. He completed his PhD at St. Louis University and uh, has had been uh, serving uh, federal services with uh, like a faculty member as a psychologist, he is an APA approved internship program director at uh, when while he was on active duty. As a civilian, he was the director of rehabilitation psychology in physical medicine and rehabilitation center. Uh, he served more than 18 years uh, for this practice. Dr. Jerry has uh, uh, recently retired from 20 years of federal services and now has been uh, doing private practice in an integrative healthcare center. 
basically what makes him more uh, uh, expert of the field is that he was focusing on the treatment with biofeedback neurofeedback hypnosis emdr dr D, uh, jerry devore is also a diplomat of the american board of professional psychology and uh, he's also bci certified uh, dr jerry is also an approved consultant in american society of clinical hypnosis he has been doing a, a emdr clinically dr jerry, uh, jerry devore is also very much uh, fascinated and uh, expert on biofeedback neurofeedback and foster uh, care recovery uh, he has also worked on health resilience uh, that is a very uh, important topic with respect to uh, the developing nations like us. So we will be learning from him. He is also fascinated with the psychophysiology of altered states of consciousness, such as uh, hypnosis, of course, and also spirituality. Uh, Dr. Jerry uh, has been the faculty of this uh, program as well, and he was very kind enough for doing uh, this whole uh, training session at uh, uh, IBRO session and connecting Pakistan with the world as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerry, for doing uh, that in July. It was a tremendous effort. And thank you so much for doing it today. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sadaf. That was a gracious introduction. And uh, I'm uh, honored to, uh, to be able to uh, give a keynote talk uh, with the focus on, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Sherman gave you a uh, a specific uh, look at what we can do with assessment technologies um, to, to look at psychophysiology. I, I'm going to take a, a, a bigger picture kind of overview and, and focus more on, uh, because a lot of the things that he was talking about are very important conditions. We might call them psychophysiology conditions, but I, I think if you look at the ICD-10 or uh, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual used uh, by the uh, American Psychiatric Association, uh, a lot of those disorders wouldn't show up as mental health disorders. They, they would be, they were, they're important physical disorders. And it's really nice that we've got these tools to both assess the nature of the disorder and also to, uh, to uh, develop some, uh, some treatment. Um, and I'm going to get my slides up here. So my, my slides are, are basically an outline uh, for, for tonight, or actually it's for night for me, it's, it's morning for you folks. Um, and I also have a, 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 a typed manuscript that I would be happy to, to send to Sadaf uh, if people want a, a bit more of the details. Uh, the, the, the outline is basically to keep me and to keep you on track to, to note uh, where we are in the, uh, the presentation. And so we've already got my introduction. Um, so one of the things is, is to, uh, to take a bigger scope on what applied psychophysiology is. And, 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 uh, and I think that's, it's important to, uh, to reflect on because when I talk with some of my colleagues who do uh, mostly neurofeedback, they think of applied psychophysiology as, uh, as doing neurofeedback or biofeedback. The, the Association for uh, uh, Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback is almost all biofeedback oriented, uh, even though stimulation technology and assessment uh, is a very important component of. Uh, of applied psychophysiology, and also, uh, you know, in the disciplines of medicine, psychiatry is a specific discipline of medicine that uses applied psychophysiology uh, almost completely. the uh, The use of medications and a variety of uh, you know medical uh, uh, monitoring procedures are, is all applied psychophysiology. Uh, it, ten it tends to be working at the level of, uh, of biochemical molecules and how they uh, affect cell membranes and, uh, and uh, ion gates and that sort of thing. And uh, I work at a, 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 a little bit of higher level up the, up the chain to look at, at uh, you know, patches of neurons and, and how they connect with each other if I'm doing uh, 
uh, EEG assessments, or if I'm uh, if I'm uh, working with uh, muscle problems or autonomic problems, we use the appropriate assessments uh, to identify those. So applied psychophysiology includes uh, anything that systematically affects physiology using medications, stimulation technologies, behavioral procedures such as hypnosis, EMDR, uh, that also uh, uh, that you were affecting physiology in order to produce effects in psychological functioning. Uh, and that includes uh, assessing psychological conditions, monitoring psychological conditions, and, uh, and treating psychological conditions by intervening uh, or, or measuring physiology. So that, to my mind, is that's the broad scope of, of applied psychophysiology. And if we think about it that way, uh, uh, it, it allows us to, to get a kind of a good scope. So it's because sometimes people kind of think, well, there's biofeedback, which is good, and there's medications, which are bad. And, 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 and that's just narrow focus. Uh, when we look at the, uh, the importance of psych psychiatric medications, so we just need to think about before we had psychiatric medications for the management of psychosis and, and schizophrenia, uh, we had people that were just um, floundering, uh, hard to maintain contact with reality and, and really requiring an awful lot of care. Um, and then uh, we all, as psychiatry developed the antidepressant medications, that was a disorder that psychotherapy was pretty useless in, in, in treating when they were, when, when the treatment models were psychoanalytic models. So psychiatric medications, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a whole history of those and I won't go into the, the details, but, but they really dramatically improved uh, the care of depression. Now, many people got completely better from medications alone. Um, subsequently, we got a little bit more intelligent uh, in, in how to do psychotherapy so that psychotherapy has at least as good outcomes as, uh, as medications. And, and as it turns out, psychotherapy plus medications is the, uh, it gives you the, uh, the, the greatest amount of, uh, of benefit. And uh, that's kind of a, an important kind of a domain. The other preliminary thing that I'd like to go over is the nature of science in contrast to applied science, because they are, are um, they both make use of basic science, but they use it in different kinds of ways. So basic science aims to develop validated theories that enable us to understand some domain of knowledge. It aspires to truth, especially truth that can be empirically validated. Applied science, however, has a much different agenda. It's more like the relationship of engineering uh, to physics. So applied science make use, makes use of the scientifically validated theories, but the aim is not to produce truth or more validated theories. The aim is to produce health improvements, some kind of optimal functioning, or some other kind of uh, uh, instrumental goal or value. It's, it's not seeking a, a, a truth and, or, or truth in its more narrow notion of a, of a map of things that, that seems to predict phenomena you know, reasonably well. Um, so because applied psychophysiology has different aims, it has to use some different procedures to analyze data. For instance, just documenting that uh, an experiment uh, is significantly better than chance. Well, that's important, but it's, it's far from being enough uh, because you also need to, as an applied scientist, we need to make sure that that difference is actually not only a statistically significant difference, which only tells us that the two groups are 
you know, the difference is not due to random fluctuations. But for a practical difference, we need to measure effect size. And we need to, uh, and we need to look at effect sizes in light of, of efficacy measures. And I'm gonna go into that in a, in a bit more detail uh, quite soon here. Uh, so with those prior, with those preliminaries, let's ask the question, where are we now with respect to mental health? And I'm breaking that down into uh, four major areas. Uh, where are we in using assessment techniques to, uh, to understand uh, mental health issues? Where are we with stimulation technology to excuse me, to, to treat uh, mental health issues? Where are we with operant conditioning to, because uh, uh, when we use the term neurofeedback or biofeedback, uh, what that really means is we're using the principles of operant conditioning, only what we're conditioning is physiological behavior uh, rather than uh, you know, arm movements or lever presses or or reduced talking about pain or reduced talking about hallucinations. Those are all, all things that have been uh, treated with operant conditioning. But uh, here with biofeedback and neurofeedback, we're, we're addressing uh, operant conditioning. Uh, and then there's the issue of where we are in terms of training informed skillful trainers uh, and, and treatment providers. So uh, part of where we are now is to, to note that uh, there's a well-developed discipline of psychiatry and it uses uh, medications to treat a variety of psychiatric disorders, including major depressive disorders, bipolar disorders, and a variety of psychoses. Physiology measures tend to be used to check medication levels and side effects, but they are generally not used to assess initial conditions or to plan treatment or to monitor treatment progress. So what I mean by that is uh, one of the promising areas, for instance, for uh, EEG assessment is the idea that uh, what different kinds of conditions like depression or anxiety or attention deficit disorder uh, may have a different, different brain patterns and those different brain patterns uh, may result in needing different medication combinations to, to have effective treatments. I use the word may result because right now uh, in the current state of the art, uh, there is only one biomarker for a mental health condition. And that's uh, uh, you know, looking at some, uh, particularly the theta beta ratio in the EEG to assess for attention deficit disorder. So we've got some promising biomarkers. Uh, what's needed is to, um, to do applied research so that those promises deliver on their, on their hopes and so that uh, clinicians um, can have more confidence that psychophysiology measurements uh, can be a real useful aid in determining uh, how to treat a patient. You know, for instance, uh, when people have anxiety disorders that include uh, uh, panic attacks, you know, physician panic attacks are really miserable and, and psychiatrists and, and other physicians are often quick to look at uh, anxiety medications uh, to reduce the panic attacks. And they may be effective for reducing that panic attack, but it doesn't teach the person uh, to change the underlying conditions that cause the panic attack. And it turns out when you use a particular physiology measurement, uh, namely what's called capnometry, if you measure the end tidal CO2 that, is a breathing, that a person breathes out, you can get an estimate of how much carbon dioxide they're retaining. And it turns out that the hyperventilation um, is primarily a disorder 
of insufficient carbon dioxide. We tend to think of carbon dioxide as a waste gas, uh, but it's not a waste gas. When it's, it's, it's not a waste gas only. When carbon dioxide is flowing in your circulatory system, it uh, helps the blood vessels remain open. When, when we don't have enough carbon dioxide flowing in our system, blood vessels constrict. Uh, it turns out that our system uh, changes its pH to become more alkaline and with a more alkaline pH, uh, hemoglobin that normally, uh, you know, in the lungs, it binds with oxygen and then it carries the uh, oxygen to the various places in our tissue where it's needed. Well, if we're hypocapnic, what happens is that the, uh, you know, the oxygen gets to the tissue, but the hemoglobin doesn't let the oxygen go. So the oxygen doesn't flow into the tissues. And uh, so that turns out to be really important because the treatment is, is you train the person to, uh, to breathe slower and to breathe in a way that retains more carbon dioxide. So there's a, a, uh, a condition that at this point, um, the assessment is, uh, is not part of the, of the ordinary, it's not part of it if you were, if you're a psychiatrist or if you're a psychiatric resident, you're not gonna find any treatment manual that, or assessment manual that says, oh, if you've got a person that has panic disorder, you should find somebody who has a, uh, a uh, psychophysiology uh, monitoring for, for, capnea, for hypocapnia. And uh, because if they're hypocapnic, what you need to do is you need to treat them to, uh, to retain more, uh, more carbon dioxide. Uh, So another aspect of uh, is uh, the use of stimulation technology. We talked about medications and how medications can be very useful, but uh, psych it would be even more useful if we could use psychophysiological measures to, uh, uh, to give more guidance about which medications when or is something other than medications indicated? Well, it turns out psychiatrists had a long history of using stimulation technologies, especially electroconvulsive therapy and repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, these are evidence-based technologies uh, in the United States. They both they both have a clearance from uh, the FDA that. Uh, that's the agency that reviews whether there is empirical literature demonstrating that what you're doing is safe and also that it's at least better than placebo control. I mean, the, the bar to, uh, to be cleared by FDA is, is fairly low, uh, but uh, you, you certainly, except for safety, it's, they've got fairly stringent standards on safety. And when you're causing a, uh, uh, convulsions due to uh, uh, electrical current, you, you really want to make sure that uh, uh, the physicians who are doing that are extremely well trained in how to do that safely and, uh, and, and comfortably for the patient. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of development in, in exactly how to do that. And uh, there's also specific indications. It's not like you use these technologies for anybody. You use them for people who are, have severe treatment resistant major depressive disorder. And so when we say treatment resistant, what, what that operationally means is that a, uh, is that a person uh, has already not benefited from uh, two appropriate courses of, of medication or an appropriate course of say psychotherapy and medication. So if they've had those courses and they're still severely depressed, then uh, ECT or a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation could be uh, viable alternatives to, uh, to fairly rapidly reduce a person's depression and help them become uh, you know, happier and, and more uh, adaptive in their functioning in day-to-day -day life. 
there's also some other stimulation technologies uh, that have been variously called transcranial alternating current stimulation, or uh, yeah, that's probably the, the the term that you'll find most used in, in literature today. So this is low powered electrical stimulation. So less than two milliamps. Uh, and that's been deemed to be fairly safe. And then there's a, there's a, a number of issues of, uh, well, uh, if you've got an alternating current, what frequencies or, or do you, you pulse? And where do you put the, uh, where do you put the stimulators so that they have the maximum benefits? So all of that's under, current investigation, uh, but um, that's a, a lively use of stimulation technology. That also happens to be an area uh, that I'm keenly interested in, uh, in stimulation. I teach courses in stimulation technology and, uh, and I'm fascinated with, it, with the possibilities of, uh, that they offer in, in helping us uh, not only reverse psychological disorders, but, but also the possibilities of, uh, of functioning more optimally. And then where we probably have the most success uh, is in the area of biofeedback and neurofeedback. So one, uh, one aspect of that success is there's a nice manual produced by the Association of Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback uh, that's uh, then let's see, I think I've got my copy here that I, so I can get the name. It's called Evidence-Based Practice in Biofeedback and Neurofeedback. It's got a third edition. And so it goes through a huge number of, of conditions, including mental health conditions. And it, it does some kind of unique things. Uh, in America, a lot of practice is determined by insurance companies and what they will uh, authorize uh, for treatment. And, and insurance companies basically will authorize treatments that have uh, research evidence that they're efficacious for a particular condition. And mostly insurances don't believe that, uh, that there's adequate evidence uh, for biofeedback or neurofeedback, uh, so they don't pay for it. And, uh, and it does turn out that they, uh, they do believe that there's adequate evidence for uh, uh, ECT and, and the repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they will often, they will, will pay for that. And I work actually closely now with a psychiatrist who that's primarily what he does in, in treating people. And I'm working with him on, on, a, on a nifty research project that, uh, that I'll, I might be able to go over in a, in a few minutes to just briefly discuss that. But uh, so we've got this uh, manual that has, it actually has criteria formulated by people who do applied psychophysiology as, as a profession. So these are folks who actually know what they're talking about when they're developing a rating pro protocol. And they also kind of say, well, efficacy is not a yes or no questions. There are levels of efficacy. So we could say, you know, if, uh, Somebody just said, well, I tried this procedure. I, I tried to, to bring, drink berry juice from this particular plant. And boy, I felt wonderful after that. So that we call, we call that testimonial level of evidence. And testimonial might be a good starting place. You kind of say, well, I wonder if more people, if they drank that berry juice uh, would have good effects and hopefully they wouldn't have harmful effects. So, so uh, maybe you find a group of people and yeah, it seems to be consistently uh, Elevating moods when they when they when they drink this particular juice and uh, and then you may take it up to uh, so so from testimony only only would be called level one efficacy so level two efficacy would be well maybe you write up some cases so you systematically study and you kind of say well since they they took these juices so uh, you know they started feeling better and. Uh, and maybe you, uh, you write things up and you kind of say, well, this is sort of a, a pre-post uh, experimental design. Now, the problem with pre-post experimental designs is they can tell you whether a change has happened or not. They can tell you whether there's a statistical difference between two groups. And, uh, 
if there's no statistical difference, you have to conclude that there, there's no change. You thought there was a change, but it turns out it's just random fluctuations. If there is a change, you can say, that's nice. That means that uh, there's some non-random difference between the two groups, but you don't have a clue about what could cause that non-random difference. Maybe it's uh, because you are a person that has a lot of charisma and people really like you. And if, if people like treatment providers, they tend to respond better. Um, they may happen to just happen to like this particular plant. And, they, and so they think drinking juice from this plant uh, makes you better. And, and so simply their um, expectations of success was enough to have a, a, a benefit. And, and, uh, but it may not have been anything due to, uh, uh, to the juice of the plant. So, so in order to, to move from, well, an effect has occurred, now we wanna ask, well, why did that effect occur? Um, well, for that, you, you can sometimes get away if you do multiple baselines. So in, in psychophysiology, for instance, uh, if I wanna say, well, I've got an anxious person and I'm measuring their electrodermal response, and uh, their baseline is uh, their electrodermal response is very high. And I do some systematic uh, desensitization training with them uh, guided by uh, biofeedback. So I'm doing biofeedback assisted uh, psychotherapy and using systematic desensitization. And I find that uh, in uh, three sessions, uh, they went from being uh, triggered by a particular stimulation and getting really high levels of uh, galvanic skin response to uh, by the end of the fifth session, I can expose them to the, uh, to the stimulation and they have, have no galvanic skin response. So we would say uh, the multiple baseline is I'm asking the person's subjective response, a report of anxiety. And I'm also measuring psychophysiology. So I could say that well, because I've measured the psychophysiology and the change was in a non-random direction towards a, uh, you know, from a high arousal to low arousal, and that seemed to correspond to their change in psychological functioning. Well, that's that's a little step closer to leaving you feeling that the psychophysiology training might have been the causal agent. But the real way to explore causal agents is by using. Um, control groups and experimental groups and randomizing, random assignment of, of cases to the uh, uh, control and experimental groups. So when you've got uh, two or three uh, reasonably large size studies using this kind of randomized control research, that gets you all the way up to level four in the rating scheme, which uh, rating level four means that uh, the treatment has been established to be efficacious. And there's a, a level five that uh, where basically you have to have randomized controls and you have to demonstrate that it's efficacious compared to, uh, not just con compared to a placebo control, but efficacious compared to, uh, to other successful uh, measures. So having this rating scheme, and also understand the nature of how do you calculate effect sizes so that you can identify how big of an effect that you're having and that you can identify what level of evidence that you have gives you kind of a, a guide map of kind of saying, well, if we're already level four, what I really need to do is just get trained in this procedure and use it with my patients. If the intervention is a level three, which means uh, uh, probably efficacious, the, the most reasonable next step would be to convince somebody to, uh, to do an adequate amount of research to move, move things from level three to level four. So uh, it turns out when, you, when we go through this, uh, this manual, the kind of things that are already at level four or level five, level five in mental health are the using of psychophysiology uh, uh, operant conditioning to reduce anxiety, uh, to reduce adult headaches, to reduce attention deficit disorders, 
to address some chronic pain disorders, some of the things that Dr. Sherman was talking about, uh, to reduce depressive disorders, and also to reduce erectile dysfunction in men. So those are the things that are, are established. You could kind of say, well, if I get this book, I look at what treatments were used, I make sure that the training program that I'm going teaches me how to use these procedures and that, and that also that I have the psychophysiology monitoring equipment. And, the, and uh, so that's really a matter of uh, having the equipment, learning how to use it and, uh, and applying it to, uh, to various kinds of patients. A number of other conditions are, uh, are at level three or what's called probably efficacious. And those include alcohol and substance abuse disorders, arthritis, and especially arthritis pain, um, asthma, autism, chemo brain, muscle skeletal pain conditions, insomnia, performance enhancement, and, and PTSD. And then we come to validated assessment technologies. They certainly have been very helpful to uh, diagnose seizure disorders and to assess sleep patterns. Those are the two shining stars of, of assessment uh, technologies in psychophysiology. Um, but seizure disorders, it's an important neurological condition, but we don't think of that typically as a mental health condition. Sleep patterns, they could tell you about a person's uh, whether they have onset sleep insomnia or whether they have, uh, whether they're waking up and have sleep fragmentation in which they're waking up several times at night. But the primary use of, of, uh, of sleep studies, because to do a psychophysiology study there is a person basically is hooked up to an EEG and several other measures and they sleep overnight in a sleep lab. And uh, some tech is monitoring to make sure all the, uh, all the electrodes are collecting information. And then typically uh, all that information is fed to, into a computer algorithm that looks at sleep stages and identifies whether a person is uh, what's called adequate sleep architecture. So every 90 minutes, there are several stages of sleep that you should go through. And you can calculate whether the person's getting adequate deep wave sleep and adequate uh, REM sleep. And when those are disrupted, uh, and especially when you, those are disrupted and you also, the O2 sats really go down, then you suspect that there's sleep apnea. And, uh, and that's a medical condition uh, that needs to be treated by uh, medical problems. Insomnia itself, if it's, if it's not sleep apnea, is, uh, is a condition that can be treated by uh, a variety of strategies, including uh, behavioral training, as well as psychophysiology. Um, when it comes to well, what do we have in psychophysiology that gives us validated assessments? And, and uh, basically uh, the measurement, the EEG measurement of attention deficit disorder uh, in the, uh, is, is, has been recognized as, as a valid way to assess uh, the presence of attention deficit disorders. Um, many measures of anatomy and physiology bearing on psychology have been offered in the past. Some of you may have heard about phrenology. And that's the analysis of bumps and depressions in the skull, in the skull uh, that were thought to uh, be related to a person's psychological capacities. Other people have just looked at people and they said, well, you're fat, you're stocky, or you're thin. And these are the, the called endomorph, ectomorphs, and mesomorphs. Uh, well, it turns out that these kind of uh, capacities, they were a, a good stab to begin with, but it turns out as we empirically investigate them, uh, they don't really tell us much about psychological functioning. In psychiatry, uh, when I was initially getting trained, psychiatrists were really interested in this test called a dexamethasone suppression test. And because uh, it was thought that people who were depressed would show abnormal readings on this test. Well, that was really hopeful because it would be really nice to have a biomarker for depression. So you could gauge how depressed the person is and whether they're, whether they're just having a, um, 
you know, a brief reaction disorder that maybe counseling and guidance would see them through or whether they have a major depressive disorder that uh, is uh, at a moderate or severe level that probably will require medications. Well, it turns out the dexamethasone suppression test didn't work. Um, and other measures of uh, psychophysiology have not really developed enough what we call psychometric data. And this is where my background in as being a clinical psychologist. In clinical psychology, we get a huge amount of training in, uh, in tests and measurements and what kind of psychometric properties do you have to have in a measure before you can say that this measurement actually is telling you something about how the person's functioning. So for instance, we have, uh, there's one organization that uh, uh, provides a very elaborate uh, way of, uh, of visualizing and depicting uh, a, a two to three minute uh, integrated average of, of a 19 channel EEGs. And it can look at, it can take us through uh, the surface EEG. It can take us through the Loretta EEG that actually estimates activity and brain function. And the developer of this says, uh, well, what you do, you use this assessment and you look at uh, uh, what condition the person has, and then you look at the, uh, the EEG profile and you match the symptoms to the EEG uh, network, and, uh, and you train the, uh, the networks that match the symptoms. That's a really good logical way of thinking, and it would be particularly useful if we had any valid data that said that symptoms actually match onto EEG patterns. Right now we have only one piece of valid data that uh, ADHD symptoms map onto certain particular kind of EEG patterns. But for everything else, anxiety, depression, distinguishing between bipolar and unipolar depression, psychoses, uh, autistic disorders. Uh, people say a lot of things, but right now nobody has done the psychometric homework to identify uh, inter, or, or reliability and stability of findings and, and, and whether those findings actually have construct validity. You know, when, if you're a physician and you take a blood sample or you do a urinalysis, uh, you expect that those findings are actually going to tell you something about the physical health of a, of a person. And, and typically they do because there are norms that you can look at those findings and see well, how normal a person is. And, uh, and also, you, by knowing something about pathophysiology, you know what kinds of conditions will produce what kind of results. We don't have that in psychophysiology yet because uh, as psychophysiology was developing, uh, they, they weren't very keenly attentive to uh, what's necessary in order to document biomarkers. You have to have appropriate psychometrics. So. We're close to, you know, we're, we've, we kind of know what needs to be done. What we need is, is people doing the research uh, so that we can, uh, particularly the psychometric research to, that helps us relate findings that we, we have in psychophysiology to, uh, to what's happening with mental health conditions. Well, some other areas that are, are more encouraging is that we have, uh, these days, we have a very high quality technology for uh, assessing uh, psychophysiology and using the psychophysiology in practical applications such as biofeedback. Um, unfortunately, those good quality equipment is, is also being challenged because a lot of people are getting in the market and they're, and they're generating equipment that hasn't been validated and they're selling it at, at very cheap prices and they're suggesting that, well, people can buy these, uh, this, these cheap pieces of equipment, so, you know, like a mood ring or heart rate variability monitors or, or a, uh, you can spend $100 and get this uh, little gizmo that this, uh, supposedly measures your brain waves uh, uh, from your... Uh, uh, from your forehead. And generally they don't do a very reliable job of doing that. So 
you know, the marketers are happy to build people for their money, but it's the, the devices really aren't leading to um, improved mental health or even improved optimal functioning. So uh, we need to be aware to, to guide our patients so that they don't buy junk. <laughs> and so that we can identify uh, what, what good quality equipment is and so that it can be used in a responsible manner. Well, another thing we have is we've got a, a, some growing recognition that not just anybody can buy psychophysiological equipment and, and, and start using it. And I say that, it, it should not be obvious, but we have, we've had uh, people who are real estate agents, you know, people who are selling, buying and selling property, deciding to supplement their in, income by doing a brainwave training and even selling packages of brainwave training uh, uh, when the real estate salesman doesn't know anything about neurophysiology, doesn't know anything about the training protocols. They just decided to do it because they could. So, uh, and a number of people just decided to, to try this out kind of as a hobby. Well, these days, there's an international organization called the Bio -Cert Biofeedback Certification International Alliance that has developed basic knowledge and skill templates to guide practitioners in several domains of biofeedback, including neurofeedback, general biofeedback, heart rate variability, and pelvic floor training. And there are a number of focused didactic courses that uh, meet the BCI requirements uh, um, for documenting a minimum foundation in, in knowledge and skill. And there are professional organizations and conferences such as this conference here. Uh, there's also uh, the uh, Association for Applied Psychophysiology Biofeedback. There's the International Society for Neuronal Regulation. And there's some other uh, societies that are, uh, are developing. Uh, for, uh, you know, in the area of medication and certain kinds of stimulation technology, um, well, there's certainly, if you go to medical school, you can attend a psychiatric residency. Uh, and in America, we have uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners, which is an advanced level of, of, of nurse training. Uh, and and they're often, they often operate independently, uh, you know, kind of uh, like junior psychiatrists. That, that tends to vary in, in the United States. It varies from state to state. And, um, and I think there's a lot of variation internationally about uh, the training of, of mental health personnel and what kind of training and, and what they can do with their different kind of training. But in, at least in, there's, for prescribing medications, there, there's some systematic way of addressing medications. Uh, but if you're, if you're not a physician that has access to medications, um, then, you know, many schools don't, don't really have much in the way of, uh, of applied psychophysiology training. So there is one university program that confers a doctoral degree in applied psychophysiology. I teach at it, the Saybrook University. Uh, but uh, as I see the uh, Advanced Educational Institute and Research Center uh, is developing a graduate education as well to, uh, to help feel fill some of the, uh, the training needs. Uh, so we need, to, uh, we need to think about how to use current technology skillfully for evidence-based applications uh, as a good start, but we need to go beyond that because there's, there's a huge amount of applied psychophysiology research that needs to be done. Um, in order to do that, we also have to, we have to know enough about psychophysiology and its applications to be able to ask useful questions to guide research. We have to be able to critically think about research that's already been done, uh, as well as research that we might want to do. Um, and I emphasize that because but we also need to know about what different research designs, how they counter different threats to validity. And, and, and that's an important because leaders in the field have said, 
in public documents that the double blind controls are overrated, may not be necessary, and there's probably little need for placebo controls. And, I, and when, I've, when I've heard those, I dropped my jaw and I kind of thought, well, yeah, if you just want to practice magic, you don't need placebo controls. But if you, if you actually want to know what you're doing, the meta, very minimum that you need is, is placebo controlled research, because otherwise you can't make any causal inference. But there's a, a lot of people who bought equipment and started training first and, uh, and um, never got to the idea that, well, maybe we should train intelligently. We should train by, by, by things that research tells us is, is useful to do. Well, I'd like to uh, wrap this, for, or maybe if Sadas available, how much more time do I have? Sir, you can take your time uh, because uh, we are actually uh, not running ahead. And next, our speaker, next speaker is not uh, coming because her uh, son is admitted in the hospital. Okay. So okay. We, we, so, uh, so good. I, uh, um, I won't rush through things, but, I, but we're sort of moving towards the tail end. Um, Yeah, so I'd like to now speculate a little bit, you know, when, when we try to project into the future, uh, I don't know anybody who has got a good crystal ball and, and uh, certainly uh, not me, but why I can sort of think about what do we currently have available and what would be some next steps that would, would really, you know, help us grow in knowledge, skill, and uh, in ability to help people. So uh, applied research is really necessary to increase the number of mental health conditions that are amenable to interventions that have moderate to large effect size and, and with levels of efficacy that are, can be rated level four or level five. And that could include using biofeedback and neurofeedback interventions, as well as stimulation technology. Uh, one of the things that uh, before I got really interested in the stimulation technology and neurofeedback, I was very interested in, uh, in chronic pain management. And in fact, I've been, uh, uh, Dr. Sherman was my initial uh, trainer in biofeedback back in the 1982. Uh, he was at the internship site that I, I trained at. And uh, and he was doing muscle biofeedback to uh, alleviate chronic back pain. And he was pretty successful at it. And, and I knew that chronic back pain was something that uh, hardly anybody's successful at. And, and it turns out that uh, it seems like the reason why they're not successful is because they're not treating the problem. The, the problem is muscles that, are, that, that aren't operating the way they're supposed to. And if you put sensors on the low back area and you do a dynamic muscle evaluation, you'll find that 80% of people who have uh, chronic low back pain have abnormalities in how the muscles are functioning. And whatever intervention you do, if you, if you improve the muscle functioning, you will reduce the chronic pain. And one intervention that's pretty simple is doing a muscle awareness training. It's a kind of biofeedback that, uh, uh, and that, that works out to be pretty successful. And that, well, now I say successful, um, that's in individual cases that I've had and that a lot of other people have had. Uh, right now, that, that kind of intervention is, is, is rated as a level three intervention, which means that it's probably efficacious, but we need a little bit better studies and, and, a, and a little bit larger ends to, to actually demonstrate that. But, but uh, it's, it's not really a complicated research to do. It's, you have to have muscle sensors um, and you gotta, you gotta put them in the right place and you gotta know what a dynamic muscle evaluation is. And, uh, and Rich Sherman's book on, on, uh, on pain, uh, and the psychophysiology of pain goes through in, in, in exquisite detail on exactly what you need to assess and how to go about training. So there's already a really nice book about how to do it. It's just, we need to find some people who uh, want to advance the field by doing uh, 
applied research, this would be a great project to, uh, uh, because uh, low back pain afflicts just about every, every uh, a huge number of people in every culture. And typically when people get chronic low back pain, there isn't much that's successfully done about it. It's, uh, in, uh, in Europe and America, people often get uh, back surgeries. And it turns out the back surgeries are, uh, don't leave a person improved. Uh, they, the light, in fact, the, uh, uh, you're just as likely to be worse than you are to be improved and you're most likely not to be improved. So that's, uh, that's a, an invasive, expensive procedure that doesn't do anything compared to potentially uh, huge success rates that could be attained if people were doing uh, muscle biofeedback, muscle assessment and biofeedback. Um, so just kind of getting down and doing the applied research uh, for interventions uh, could be a really good next step. And I'm hoping that people were, are going to be doing that. That's what we're trying to encourage our students in, at Seabrook to do is to, uh, to take on some of these research projects and uh, so that we can add to the literature that uh, can help guide professionals who want to treat people and, and help and also to assist in uh, uh, the health and well-being of our clients. High-tech biofeedback and neurofeedback, you know, those are you know, just having the technology are good, but uh, there are also a number of minimal technology uh, kind of interventions such as hypnosis, behavior therapy, respiration training, and a number of relaxation, mindfulness, and meditation procedures that could be more fully developed if they were developed by using psychophysiology monitoring to, to assist their development. Uh, right now, you know, you may have heard about mindfulness, and it, and it turns out uh, you know, mindfulness is, is initially a term that was taken from a particular kind of Buddhist meditation practice called Vipassana. And then it was translated into English as mindfulness. But what the term mindfulness means in English is often about the exact opposite of what mindfulness means in a Vipassana meditation. So, uh, so it's hard to trust what that term means, but at least We've got people like John Kabat-Zinn, who's done this uh, program called Stress Reduction or, uh, through uh, Mindfulness-Based uh, Relaxation, or MBSR. Uh, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, that's the program. And, uh, and he actually has uh, had uh, a number of, uh, of psychophysiology monitoring to, to look at what's going on with people as well as uh, tracking out the data uh, fairly carefully. So we, we could do more of that. You know, For instance, in hypnosis, some people kind of say, well, you know, hypnosis, that's not anything real. That's just people pretending to, to have different kinds of exper experiences. Well, we can put a person under hypnosis in, uh, in an fMRI scanner, and we can see different areas of the brain light up depending on which quality, if we, if we talk about pain as uh, being a sensory quality of throbbing or burning or uh, electrical, uh, it turns out that the sensory motor cortex lights up. If we talk about pain as being miserable, I, I, you know, I can't stand it anymore, I, I, you know, I just feel terrible, then you find that the anterior cingulate cortex lights up. So, uh, so that tells us, well, hypnosis isn't pretending at all. It's, a, it's actually a technique for altering brain physiology. And we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have some ways to, to measure that brain physiology. Um, and then we need applied psychophysiology for assessment. Uh, uh, and, and especially we need more psychometric documentation. And, and this is something that I'm doing something about. Uh, when most people use EEGs uh, for mental health treatments, they, they basically they're encouraged to, uh, you know, take a a five minute eyes open and a five minute eyes closed sample and 
uh, you, you take away the artifacts and then you average those uh, samples together and you do a fast Fourier transform on them and you get these nice little maps uh, that tell you, uh, you can even, there, there's some normative references that tell you how normal or abnormal are different frequencies at different uh, uh, electrode sites. And even fancier, you can, you can uh, use a mathematical procedure uh, called Loretta that can estimate what's going on at, at, in the brain uh, at those frequencies and even how different areas of the brain are connected to each, with each other. Well, well that's kind of nice stuff, but you're, you're getting a slice in time. And we know that the brain changes states every 100 milliseconds. We also know that if we do a sleep study, that the brain goes through several states, you know, big macro states every 90 minutes uh, for the whole night that you're asleep. Uh, we also know that uh, if, you, if you just have a person close their eyes, tell them to rest, and, uh, and you record their EEG for 10 to 20 minutes, you'll find that the brain goes through different kinds of states. And, uh, and people who are fairly healthy, their sequence of states that the brain goes through in that 10 to 20 minute period uh, is quite different than people who have different kinds of problems. For instance, substance abusers, if you ask them to close their eyes, uh, most of the time, most people, if you ask them to close their eyes and you look at their EEG, you'll see alpha waves fairly prominent. And substance abusers, you have them close their eyes and tell them to rest. And you look at their posterior brain regions and they don't generate alpha waves where most people would. And if you, uh, if you treat them so that you train them to, so to, to start generating alpha waves, uh, their, uh, their substance abuse disorder goes, goes away. You know, the success rate is some uh, 70 to 80 percent uh, using that methodology uh, compared to uh, to using uh, you know standard uh, uh, you know in, in the U.S. we use Alcoholics Anonymous and models like that. The and, and sometimes inpatient, sometimes outpatient, but the success rate of those programs at best is about 25 percent of people who uh, who stop abusing substances. So 25 percent is a lot less than 70 to 80 percent. Um, the problem with that is that we don't have, uh, uh, it's good pilot research, but we don't have uh, enough assessment information so that we can uh, track things out further. Um, so I am, uh, I'm actually participating in some research. We're going to, we're actually going to be looking at uh, brainwaves as a time series rather than as, a, as different slices of time so that we can detect those, those changes. And the first thing where we're doing is we're having raters looking at, look at some EEGs and we're just seeing, can raters who, are, who have been trained with a rating manual, can they, can they agree with each other? Can they look at an EEG and say that, come to the same conclusion? That's called inter-rater reliability. And you've got to have that Whenever you've got things being being judged by experts, you have to have inter-rater reliability before you can say anything else. And the next thing to do would be to, to do test retestability. You know, like, is this a pattern that just fluctuates and will be different tomorrow? Or will it be stable tomorrow? Or maybe stable next week? Or maybe even stable next month? Um, so that tells you about stability. And then we need to go on to say, now that we got this pattern, does this pattern tell us anything about what's going on with major depressive disorder or anxiety or substance abuse? So those biomarker studies, so far uh, people haven't, uh, haven't been, had much success in looking at EEGs for biomarkers, but I think part of that is because they haven't been looking at the EEG as as a pattern that unfolds over time. They've been looking at little three minute time slices. That may tell us something, but it, but it hasn't told us useful biomarkers. So I'm, 
I'm uh, betting my research time that, that, that maybe looking at how the EEG unfolds over time will, will, will provide us some of the assessment information that we really need. I'm also working with a psychiatrist who, who is doing a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we're developing a research protocol specific for major depressive disorder. I'm, I'm doing a EEG analysis before they start their treatment and, and after they conclude a, a, a course of treatment to see whether what changes in the EEG we can detect. And ideally, can we detect people who are going to, who, who get better and stay better versus uh, is there a different EEG pattern for people who don't get fully better, uh, who or maybe don't get better at all, or people who get better and then, then fall apart? Uh, you know, I think there's uh, fairly good reasons to believe that the, uh, that the EEG may help us get a little bit more precise about how to use some of these technologies that we have available. But uh, we only get that by doing some research. So I'm, I'm very happy to be actually, uh, at my age, to be involved with some cutting edge research that uh, is really fun to do. Um, the other aspect uh, in, in talking about stimulation technology is we've got this AAPB manual that tells us about biofeedback and neurofeedback as training technologies. We don't have any similar kind of uh, manual that tells us about uh, stimulation technologies and, and, uh, and what level of efficacy that do different stimulation technologies uh, uh, have to, to guide practitioners and decision makers. Um, and then finally, there's the whole issue of Supposing we've got really good validated technologies, how do we get those technologies and that information disseminated to treatment providers and, and to, to patients so they can actually make use of all of that material? So those are, that's my, uh, my take on uh, where we are and where would be useful, useful ways for us to, to proceed further? So I've got some time. Uh, if, we've, if you've got time, uh, I could answer any questions that might come up. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we have a few questions. And yes. uh, Dr. Samina, uh, you are writing uh, questions. So if you can, if you can uh, open your mic and just ask them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sada. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jerry, for a very useful piece of information. And you have a big range of your uh, application of clinical psychophysiology. So nice to hear about hypnosis as well from you, because I have observed uh, uh, this uh, hypnosis uh, uh, therapy. And I've seen that uh, certain people are uh, uh, less hypnotizable. So what is your uh, precise strategy uh, when you handle people who are low hypnotizable? Uh, maybe they have insomnia, maybe they are introvert, maybe they are very conscious, maybe they do not let go. So how do you handle such subjects? This is my first question. Yeah, well, I like the question uh, because you're right. Uh, hypnosis works well for a lot of people, but for some people, uh, I can try all my skills and it's not useful. That's where it's really handy to have uh, training as because uh, my training was uh, initially in behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy. And I added biofeedback to that. And I would almost always do biofeedback. Uh, and and you know, typically I would do a combination. I would be doing behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy and biofeedback together. Uh, got it. So Dr. Sada, do you allow me to ask another question? Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay, sure. thank you. So my, my next question is uh, again to Professor Jerry that uh, have you observed that uh, just thinking about an activity like a person is running fast, although the person might be a patient of stroke and is paralyzed and unable to run now, uh, if he's just imagining that he's running fast, uh, he is uh, 
uh, actually uh, invoking uh, the same kind of EMG spikes as if he was actually running. So can this kind of positive imagination actually help such patients in their recovery of their motor function? Any experience regarding this? Um, that's uh, for motor functions. Uh, if the loss has been to, due to uh, brain damage, to say through strokes or traumatic brain injuries, um, so far the literature isn't very encouraging. Um, it, it's, it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be hurtful. You're not gonna hurt a person by having them do that. Um, but it also, unless people really believed that they were gonna get better and then they got really disappointed because they didn't get better. Because we, we typically know that wishful thinking doesn't result in practical <laughs> effects. And on the other hand, what you're saying, actually using your imagination does have real effects on the brain and, and other aspects of physiology. And for typical mental health problems, um, for instance, if a person has a nightmare disorder, uh, rehearsing, uh, if, you treat, if you think of a nightmare as a, as a scary story that your brain is telling you, and you wake up, well, you can retell the story so that it's not so scary. <laughs> And it turns out that when you, and now that's, that's, a, that's a simplification, but basically if you retell the story and imagine now that, now that you're, you're back in the story, but now you're using this new story in which you come out ahead <laughs> or when you turn something nasty into a, uh, into a comedy or, or, or some way that in which your affect is responds to the, the nightmare images uh, now that they've been revised that you have an, an entirely different emotion because of this new story that you have well it turns out that actually reduces it, it will cut nightmares about 50 percent in a month so that's probably the most powerful intervention that we have for people who have nightmares because uh, uh, just telling a person well that's just a bad dream get over it that doesn't that doesn't reduce nightmares and particularly if, if people have had nightmares due to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we all are, <laughs> the world has got lots of opportunities to have, to experience trauma. Uh, and so there's, there's way too much post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of people are just living with the symptoms because they don't know what they, what they can do. Well, it turns out that using uh, imagery, kind of like you said, imagining, imagine doing something different with this scenario that's initially scary. Uh, right. well, so, well so is it so so Professor Jerry, is it so that when we um, imagine or when we speak to ourselves, then we are actually sending conscious signals to the subconscious mind, and that subconscious mind in turn will stimulate the conscious conscious mind, just like what you do in hypnosis. And eventually uh, you are trying to uh, giving a positive message to the brain and uh, uh, draining out the negative messages so that uh, uh, it supports uh, the statement by Rhonda Burney in her book, Secret, that uh, anything that you can conceive, you can achieve. And there, there, there is a story, a true story of a miracle man who was a pilot who fell down from the plane and he broke his back and he was just able to blink and nothing more. And uh, the, the doctor said that you will not be able to do any better for the rest of your life. But just by with the power, and this is a true story, that, and this man is still alive, and he is known as the miracle man. And just by, with the power of positive thinking, uh, he promised to himself that he will walk his way home on the Christmas. And it was only a month after and, and he actually just imagined and he started walking. Uh, he used to imagine every day that he's walking on his feet as he's leaving the hospital. And he actually did at that time when he was discharged and everybody was mesmerized at how it happened. So is it only a story or <laughs> have you ever, ever seen it in your experience or practice? Well, I haven't had that, that dramatic of a, of, of accounts, uh, and I think uh, 
I think the power of positive thinking uh, has some merits, but also a huge amount of, of harm. <laughs> Uh, because it's actually often used to kind of say, well, uh, the reason why you're not getting better is because you're not thinking positively enough. <laughs> um, and, and you're also kind of illustrating what I talked about a little bit earlier. When uh, people get better, uh, but we haven't really tracked out everything that's going on. Well, it's nice they get better but we really aren't in a position to say why they got better. So the person says, well, I picked up this book, this power of positive thinking. I pictured myself doing this and by golly, I'm, I'm, I'm out of there. And well, it may have been the positive thinking. It may have been that, uh, well, he was preoccupied by positive thinking, his uh, inflammatory processes uh, got better resolved than, than, than the physicians expected. And he may have had neurological compromise primarily because of a reversible inflammation rather than a, than a, uh, you know, a, a resection of the, of the nerves. Uh, Very right. So it, it needs to be measured scientifically and only then we can say that. You, you also spoke about mindfulness meditation, which is a common therapy these days, even for treatment of cancers and whatnot. So do you think that mindfulness helps in uh, focusing uh, on the present and uh, it helps a person to let go of the past and uh, past worries and the future worries and uh, it actually helps them in developing an attitude towards life to focus on the present and, uh, and accept it just as it is. Is, uh, is this the theory behind Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, from the... Uh research that John Kabat-Zinn and, and other people who have uh, um, worked with uh, mindfulness-based uh, interventions. Um, it, it doesn't, it's, it's an interesting approach by, by saying, well, some of these problems we can't fix. You know, you, 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 we don't have any reliable way to psychologize your way out of cancer. But if you've got cancer, you could become dreadfully depressed about it. Uh, you could become, you could pretend like you don't have it. You could just ignore it. Or you could say, well, we all get afflictions. Uh, some are associated with, uh, with, with diseases that can uh, you know, lead to a premature death. But instead of focusing on dying, I'm going to think about how do I maximize the quality of my life now? How do I focus instead of thinking of getting caught up and thinking about everything that might happen? Maybe I should just focus on the quality of my breathing. And while I'm noticing the quality of my breathing, maybe I can hear the birds singing out uh, in the tree. So it, uh, it, it is uh, a very powerful technique for helping people not get stuck in, in one particular mode of experience. And it, so, it, so it kind of helps you tune into what, what you can tune into so that you're not, so, so yeah, I, uh, uh, I am a, a strong advocate of, of mindfulness and, and any kind of, actually any kind of, uh, well, in religious practices, they're called contemplative practices. So there's a whole bunch of, uh, that can be actually religious, typically silent prayers, but they can also be chants, things like that. Uh, what mindfulness-based stress management uh, did was to say, well, these were procedures that initially were lifted out of Buddhist meditation practices, a concentration practice and, a, uh, and an insight meditation practice. But, but you don't have to practice them within the religious context. That just happened to be, uh, you know, Buddha kind of said, well, you can't get very far if your mind is scatterbrained and they're always going from place to place. And, and it turns out that to with, with uh, that a lot of people, now typically the more the, the mystics of, of most religious traditions, uh, what they've discovered is that uh, besides the beliefs and rituals and practices, uh, there are meditative practices that help your mind get stable and focused. And it turns out that uh, they not only can help you spiritually, but they, they can, you can use them purely sexual, secularly to reduce anxieties and uh, and mind wandering and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think those are 
those are the kind of low budget sort of thing. When we think about mental health for everybody, you know, teaching people things like the slow, slow diaphragmatic breathing, breathing around six breaths a minute, uh, teaching them uh, concentrative meditation, mindfulness meditation, um, yeah, and even finding within a particular culture where that practice is, is honored and, and uh, yeah, so that you can, so, so because the, these practices, they occur in virtually every culture that I've come across. Um, and, and so you don't know, we don't want to necessarily, uh, you know, practices that people do in, in uh, urban United States might be different practices than a person uh, might do in, 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 uh, in tribal Africa or some other place. Uh, but um, people throughout millennia have discovered that you can alter your, your, what goes on in your mind by, by either learning to concentrate in th on things or learning how to, because often what Vipassana practice does when, when we think of the practice is you're sitting and you're simply watching the content of your mind without getting engaged in it. So the term for that's called equanimity. Right. So, and so if you get so, equanimity, then things aren't going to fluster you so much. Great. So, so I, I have just one request uh, to you, Professor Jerry, that uh, would you like to supervise a research project uh, and why, whether it could be educational, uh, like uh, students, maybe one, one, one group of students may be exposed to mindfulness and the other group is not exposed to mindfulness and they are then performing in their uh, MCQ test. Uh, at the end of the uh, teaching and learning session uh, with the content coming out of the same teaching and learning session. This was one idea of conducting a research. I was looking for a supervisor like you. And oh. another, <laughs> yeah. And another idea, sir, because you are a clinical psychologist. So, so another idea could be of a randomized control trial. Like if it is possible that uh, two groups of patients uh, of beat any disease, they are receiving the same treatment. Uh, they continue to take their allopathic treatment and in one group there would be in addition to that uh, uh, clinical therapy we can introduce uh, mindfulness meditation and uh, we will then see the outcome of the two so do you think that uh, you, you are ready to supervise is it doable <laughs> yeah i think that that's uh, uh you know those are kind of nice designs because they can you can potentially do them on a very low budget <laughs> and uh yeah, I mean, I would be happy to uh, to work with you. So, uh, so for interest, okay, I, I should you. make sure that you have my my email so that you can follow up with me. So, sure. uh, 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 with the help of Dr. Sadaf uh, and involving her as well, we would like to have a collaborative project uh, yeah. by triangulated study, hopefully. Yeah. So, Dr. Sure. Sadaf has my email. So, yeah, let's let's so let's work with that further because I'd. Yeah, after after talking so much about the importance of research, <laughs> uh, of course I would be happy to foster and encourage uh, a research project. Well, thank you very much. You made my thank day. You so much, day. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. And we would definitely uh, be connecting with Dr. Samina and then letting you know about the project and the protocol and we will surely connect. Thank you so much, sir, for all the time, valuable time and the guidance and also a brilliant lecture. Uh, as soon as all the other questions from the YouTube channel will gather, I will be emailing you for the further queries, if, what we have received for your uh, talk. And thank you so much. Again. Well, thank you. Bye now. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you so much, uh, all the participants for listening to uh, this session and appreciating and sending us your feedbacks and sending us your queries. Uh, most uh, awaited session again for before the oral presentations, we have uh, the expert talk session. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Ruxar, uh, who have to present uh, from UAE, she got a family tragedy and uh, her son is admitted in the hospital. So we'll be taking a five minute short break and then we will get back to you with the presentation of uh, the experts and uh, 
we will be continuing this session after five minutes. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome back to the conference. Uh, we will be now conducting our scientific session. Uh, Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, welcome back everyone. We will be now conducting our scientific session feature talk uh, for which I am your moderator. I welcome Dr. Samina Malik officially. Uh, thank you Dr. Samina for being with us from the start. Uh, Dr. Samina Malik is an MBBS doctor from Nishrat Medical College, Baudin Zikriya University, Multan, followed by MPhil in Molecular Physiology from University of Health Science, Pakistan. Dr. Samina is a PhD scholar working on massively parallel sequencing of 25 candidate genes in inherited breast cancer. She is currently serving as professor at University of Lahore, Pakistan. Thank you so much, Dr. Samina, for your time and your presence. Uh, Absolute pleasure, Dr. Jada. OK, thank you, ma'am, Samina. Uh, for co-chair, we have with us Dr. Muhammad Zafar Iqbal Abbasi from uh, uh, Dr. Abbasi is a clinical research certified professional and practicing diabetologist. He is currently affiliated with International Diabetes Federation, uh, Bakai Institute of Diabetology and, and Endocrinology as project manager. Dr. Zafar has been actively involved in research regarding diabetes, its management and education. Uh, he is also a member of a number of uh, scientific committees, including American Medical Society, uh, Cancer Society Pakistan, National Association of Diabetes, and Pakistan Endocrine Society. Dr. Safar, I welcome you to the conference. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our, our first expert talk, uh, our first expert expert is Dr. Fazan Mirza uh, from University of Karachi. Dr. Fazan has currently completed his PhD in physiology from the part, uh, uh, from University of Karachi. His thesis focuses on healthy aging and degenerative sciences. He has been indulged in teaching for a long period now and is currently a lecturer at Department of Physiology. Uh, Dr. Fazan has develop, uh, delivered many lectures on stress management and mental health and has also attended many sessions. His research in interest mainly focuses on psychology, psychophysiology, and neurosciences. I welcome Dr. Fazan to the conference. And sir, you can share your screen now. Thank you so much, Ajala. Um, so this is Dr. Fazan Mirza. I hope my voice is clear. And... I, I would like all the participants to be welcomed. Um, I'll be sharing my screen here. Thank you so much, Ujala, for the kind introduction. Okay, uh, so the, uh, the study that uh, we conducted in University of Karachi uh, was based on uh, identifying psychophysiological indicators of healthy aging. Uh, aging is, is actually associated with gaining functions as well as loss of functions. And uh, we know how gradually a person ends up uh, getting more functions in the body as we are born. And as we grow older, uh, we attain our youth and then eventually we go to an old age and we see that uh, various functions of the body keep getting lost. So this was the basic uh, aim that we should have an indicator, a standard that can be used uh, to assess how this loss of functions is occurring in healthy aging. For example, dementia is associated with neurodegeneration and it can be used as an indicator of aging. Uh, WHO, it ident they, they identify aging as a process of developing and maintaining functional ability that enables well-being and older age. So this was what this is what uh, WHO reported in 2015 that uh, aging cannot be cannot, uh, you can't uh, really fight back aging. 
uh, you have to get old. But functional ability should be maintained and uh, as, as the body grows older. What are the components of healthy aging? Uh, the components of healthy aging include uh, engaging yourself in, uh, in challenging physical activity and cognitive functioning, avoiding diseases and uh, that, that can lead to disability. Leading an active and sustained social life. So all these factors contribute to positive aging. What are the dynamics of Pakistan? Where are we standing right now? Pakistan is a developing country and uh, uh, we are we rank fifth in increasing the lifespan of our individuals among developing countries. So we have a good standing. We have seen 300% rise in the increase in the old age individuals in the past few years, according to the recent census. Life expectancy right now, it, uh, it's increased to 66.8. And by 2023, it is expected that our life expectancy would go to uh, about 72 years of age, which will again be a very positive factor, which Pakistan aims to achieve. When we classify the, uh, the physiological indicators of aging in our current study, so we identified various, uh, various uh, variables and we went on to see how they are, uh, are changing with age. So we started muscle strength uh, through the hand grip strength. We, we uh, measured olfactory performance through the smell identification test, blood. Uh, we identified uh, BDNF and interleukin-6 as the markers for uh, for aging and cognitive decline associated with verbal fluency, 6CIT and de-statistic time were also, were also added in the study. The objectives of the study were, uh, the objectives of the study were to find out the possible association uh, between indicators of aging and how the chronological age is, uh, can be used uh, to predict the biological aging because chronological aging and biological aging, they might not necessarily be same at all the times. Uh, we identified the psychophysiological alterations in an aging body and uh, we tried to identify how the environmental factors are contributing to it. We also wanted to correlate the physiological indicators in promoting healthy biological aging and the importance of lifestyle among different socioeconomic strata and how that affects the process of aging. According to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals 2030 by WHO, Sustainable Development Goals, the target 3D, uh, it ensures it, it aims at ensuring healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. For all at all ages, uh, the target 3D primarily aims to encourage and to strengthen the capacity of countries for the early warning signs, reduction of risk, and its management regarding any national or global pandemic or health risk especially in the developing countries. So the current study that was conducted uh, was uh, actually aimed at this target 3D of Sustainable Development Goals 2030, because we are a, we are a developing country and we have a lot of uh, unscreened uh, 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 variables in our population that can be used as indicators for uh, underlying pathologies. Uh, the methodology that we, uh, we took was our exclusion and inclusion criteria. The exclusion criteria was that anyone who had moved to our to, to Karachi in the last five years were excluded because we took all the samples in a cross section study from Karachi. Uh, the age group we were included into were from 19 uh, to uh, 70. Anyone below 19 or anyone below uh, anyone above 70 was excluded. Uh, we excluded night shift workers as well uh, because a part of this study uh, uh, was uh, was identifying cortisol as a marker. I, I won't be discussing cortisol in this study though. But since uh, this was a larger study, so uh, we had to include, uh, we had to exclude the nitrate workers. Anyone, indivi any individual with diagnosed chronic neurological or hematological or motor disorder was also excluded. The inclusion criteria was uh, both the genders in the range, age range were included. Uh, this, the, the, the questionnaire in the study was, uh, was independent, was approved by an independent ethical committee. Uh, the data for invasive and non-invasive measures was taken. Statistical analysis was carried out and the interpretation of results followed. The study measures were, uh, we had 412 subjects and they were stratified in three age brackets and four socioeconomic classes. Uh, Non-invasive indicators and invasive indicators were used. Invasive indicators were BDNF and IL-6 in circulating blood. 
whereas non-invasive indicators included cognitive performance, which was assessed uh, through verbal fluency, 6CIT, and DSST. We also included sniff scores, which are smell identification test scores, and grip strength. The tools that were used for, for this particular, uh, for, for these testing criteria were liquid chromatography, ELISA, and uh, uh, DSST was used, and 6CIT was used, and uh, we, we imported uh, some uh, a, a kit for testing olfactory performance that was that was our sniffing sticks test. I'll come to that uh, in due time. And hand dynamometer was used for evaluating uh, the grip strength. Blood parameters, blood was calculated, peripheral blood sample was calculated, and it was uh, assessed for these markers. Verbal fluency, uh, I'll just come to the variables which I have discussed here. So verbal fluency, when we classify verbal fluency, we have chronic verbal fluency, which is sensitive to frontal lesions, and semantic verbal fluency, which is sensitive to temporal lesions. We, uh, we worked on, the, on identifying uh, the phonic verbal fluency and how well those the subjects are performing with respect to one another. The test that we used was FAS test. In DSST time, uh, in FAS test, what do we do? In FAS test, we, are, we, we give the per, a subject uh, a time of 60 seconds. And in that time, the person is asked to pronounce or, or just speak out as many words as the person can that, that begin with the letter F. We count those words, plurals are not counted. Uh, then we give another 60 seconds to the same subject and ask him or her to just speak out words which he or she can from the letter A. And we count those as well. Again, plurals are not counted. The same goes for 60 seconds given for S and then we add up all the FAS uh, letters together, the words together, uh, how many of these have been uh, the spoken by the, by the subject. And that gives us a FAS score. DSST time was calculated, digit simple substitution test is carried out. Uh, this test includes about uh, these nine uh, digits are there. And for each digit, there is a symbol mentioned. This key is given to the individual and the time is noted for them to correctly place all the digits according to the symbols in the rows provided to the individual. The time taken for completing this task is noted. Sniffing stick test is what we conducted next. Uh, this was uh, this was where we, we carried out the test using a uh, 12 uh, uh, test screening kit and uh, this kit was imported from uh, from Germany. I'll just go to a video here and uh, um, and, and and outline how the smell identification test was carried out. Okay, uh, is my my video visible to the to the participants here? Can I get a nod here? Uh, not yet. Okay. Yes, they are visible. Okay, so uh, this was the testing kit that we used. I have cited, I have just muted this uh, the sound of this video so that I can uh, just explain it while on the videos on the go. This was a demonstration that we recorded in our lab, psychophysiology lab. So uh, this kit was used. This is called sniffing sticks uh, kit. It is having twelve felt pens. Each uh, uh, the pen is the pens are held uh, in this uh, this box. Each pen is having a number mentioned on it. And according to the number, uh, there are 12 pens. Each pen is having a different uh, smell in it. Uh, what do we do? We provide one pen to the subject at a time and we ask the subject to inhale and then try to assess which smell is it. Later, at, once the pen is given back by the subject, we give the subject a card. The card is then uh, given to the subject to ask to just to just see which of the four uh, fragrances was there. For example, here, for example, the pen pen one is given to the subject, and pen uh, pen one is having the fragrances or the smell out of any of these. For example, orange or strawberry or pineapple or blackberry. 
when they are when the person inhales uh, that uh, that pen A or pen one, the person tries to identify which smell was it, and when we give this card to that person. Uh, the person then try to assess that the smell belong to A, B, C, or D, which category. The the uh, the uh, the record that 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 the subject will give uh, will be recorded on this uh, sheet, which is provided with the kit. This kit is uh, used in routine screening in European countries, but in Pakistan, we were the first ones to uh, to get this imported in Pakistan. And uh, uh, we this this such a screening has never been conducted in Pakistan ever before. Uh, and this was the first time that our population actually got screened for olfactory performance. So this is how the pen is given to the to the subject. The subject inhales. The subject try to identify what smell this is. I give the card to the subject, and the subject asks the subject just identify which of the smell A, B, C, D was it. The subject marks it, and I give the second pen to the subject. With the second pen provided, the same process is repeated. The second pen will have a different uh, fragrance on it, and the four options will be displayed on the card, and they will be a set of different four fragrances. Again, the person, the subject will then identify which smell was this out of the four, and the subject will mark it on the paper. So the same subject, the same process is repeated for all the all the twelve uh, pens here. And this is the key which is provided by the supplier. And using the key, we uh, just calculate how many fragrances or how many smells was the subject able to identify correctly. And uh, once this is done, we uh, we we just uh, look at the uh, distribution of how many correct answers were given to the given by the subject. This normogram is also provided in the kit, and uh, the normogram is differentiated for both genders, males and females with different age categories and the values out of 12 are given as uh, normosomia hyposomia or ensomia if a person is able to identify uh, any fragrances between 10 and 12 correctly the person is having normosomia which means normal olfactory performance but if a person is able to identify uh, any number of fragrances between 10 and 6 in that case the person is hyposomia and if the person is able to identify fragrances less than six, then the person is suffering from ensomnia. So these were the cutoffs which were used uh, by us to identify how well our subjects are performing in the olfactory performance test. So olfactory performance was uh, was calculated, and uh, and then we moved on to calculate. We, go, we moved on for uh, for hand grip strength. The hand grip strength was also measured, and in hand grip strength, we used the electronic hand dynamometer uh, for this process. I am playing the video for the for the perform the grip strength hand grip strength how the hand dynamometer was used. This is the uh, uh, hand grip strength that we were using. This was funded uh, by uh, Abbott Pharmaceuticals. Sorry to interrupt you. We cannot see your video. You have to unshare your screen and again share it. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Okay, is it is the video visible now on the screen? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, so this was the hand dynamometer that we use. This was provided to us by Abbott Pharmaceuticals, and this electronic hand dynamometer is is it comes with an electronic manual uh, with an electronic device, battery operated, and the manual comes with it with all the settings. So we use this, and this the the, the lever there the, the it is provided with the lever. And the lever is to be pulled by the subject, and we uh, we just add the settings according to the subject, age, and gender, and uh, uh, it is fed in this in this uh, electronic hand dynamometer. The person is then asked to just hold the lever and pull it with all his or her strength using the dominant hand. This uh, data is provided to us by the by the manufacturer, 
and it categorizes the strength, the hand grip strength into weak, strong, or normal. Three categories according to the age and gender of the individual. So I, I this is what I did. I provided this with the subject, this to, to the subject, and the subject was then asked to pull it with all his strength. The maximum uh, value will be recorded here. For example, this subject, uh, this subject gave us the reading of twenty four point five. And this was categorized as a weak grip strength according to his age. So uh, the, the data provided to us, the cutoff values were given by the manufacturer only. And this is how we categorize the, uh, the hand grip strength into three categories, weak, strong, or normal for that individual according to that age. I'm resuming my slide show. Uh, the results of our of our uh, study showed that they uh, that our our participants were in the age category of thirty two point six five uh, plus minus twelve point six two, with a normal BMI of around twenty two point six nine. The gender we included fifty two point nine percent of male and forty seven point one percent of female, um, and these were just socioeconomic uh, uh, and the classification was there. Uh, coming to results now, uh, BDNF. When we uh, noted the gradation of BDNF in the three age categories, we found that BDNF was decreasing in the three age categories. The first age group, 22 to 36, then 37 to 53, and eventually 54 to 70. So BDNF was found to be decreasing. The relationship was found, the correlation was significant, and it was significant, and results uh, can, although cannot be generalized because all the values of BDNF were normal. Uh, accord, they lied in the normal rate, but a decline was still seen. Uh, the decline in BDNF is related to reduction in the hippocampal volume and females with characteristics of anxiety, they have been reported to, uh, and, and, low, and childhood trauma have shown a low levels of BDNF according to uh, studies conducted earlier. BDNF is a neuroprotective factor in relation to physical activity. The more a person is physically engaged, it promotes angiogenesis in the brain, as well as neurogenesis, as well as synaptogenesis. This increases the BDNF concentration in serum, as well as in the central nervous system. And when BDNF increases, it's a neuroprotective factor. So physical activity is something which, uh, which actually relates with, directly with the concentration of BDNF present in the body. Interleukin-6 was the next parameter when interleukin-6 was found to be, uh, was, was taken into consideration in the three age categories, we found that interleukin-6 was increasing in the three uh, age categories here. And uh, we know that IL-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine and it promotes heart disease, it, it, promotes, it, it, it promotes atherosclerosis as well as deposition of fibrinogen. fibrinogen. Uh, it promotes obesity as well. So individuals with higher IL-6 uh, have a lower reasoning as well as, as compared to people who have low IL-6 because IL-6 shows an inflammation. Uh, and a person who is having a higher IL-6 is more, uh, uh, more susceptible to cognitive uh, impairment as well as dementia. So in our subjects, we saw that IL-6 was significantly increasing in the three age category. Interleukin-6, uh, overproduction, it leads to atherosclerosis, thrombogenesis, skeletal muscle breakdown, cognitive decline, disordered B cell uh, generation. So all these factors just contribute with the uh, increase in interleukin-6 levels. Bubble fluency. Bubble fluency, as I already discussed, was noted by FAS score. And FAS score was how many uh, words each subject was able to produce using letter F and D and, 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 and S. Uh, and 60 seconds was given as time for all the three uh, letters individually for each subject. We found uh, that uh, there was no significant correlation in verbal fluency there. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a common use neuropsychological tool for determining any injury in the lesion. So this actually just showed it that, that our subject did not suffer from any, uh, any um, neuropsychological disorder at the time of the study being conducted. Verbal fluency as reported is mainly developed during middle childhood. DSSC time, symbol substitution, uh, was the time was calculated. And again, we saw that the individuals lying in the older age category took more time uh, to, to substitute these digits uh, for the symbols provided. Six CIT, the six cognitive impairment test uh, was used, and it is it is just, it's a screening tool for uh, uh, for actually just screening an individual for any uh, neuronal damage in the hippocampal region of CA3. Uh, and, and stress and increased glutamate level and inflammatory cytokines, they inhibit neurogenesis 
and can lead to a reduced CCIT. And neuroinflammation uh, can be can be uh, recognized using CCIT. But in our subject, there was no significant increase in the CCIT scores. The SNF scores. This is what uh, this is what our um, our study was able to uh, to screen the subjects that. SNF score was uh, was uh, was found to be uh, something uh, very strange here. We found that majority of our participants were hypersomic, and uh, uh, and uh, the participants belonging to all age categories. We had many individuals who had who were suffering from a low a low olfactory performance, and the 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 statistics the statistical correlation was found that smell identification ability uh, it reduces with age. Olfactory functions decline with age. We know that the fibers in the olfactory bulb, they undergo degeneration, the receptors decrease, and uh, the association, uh, studies have suggested that uh, that ability to smell and the social status of life uh, is negligible. This study was repeated, reported in 2019. Um, so uh, as the smell performance uh, decreases with age in our subjects, olfactory impairment leads to mood swings and depression and social seclusion, nasal obstruction, head trauma, medication, Respiratory infection and endocrine disturbance, they all lead to olfactory impairment. Uh, you can see in this graph here that a uh, majority of our subjects in each age category were having a low smell identification score. As I already discussed the cutoffs previously, that uh, the, the normal score for a normal individual having a good olfactory sense will be able to identify smells between 10 and 12. That's, uh, that's normal somia. But if an, if an individual is able to identify smell between 10 and 6 pens correctly, so that's the not, that's uh, that's hyposomia. So majority of our participants lied in lied, uh, in the category of hyposomia in our study. So uh, this this just highlighted that many of us uh, probably think that our olfactory performance is good enough, but actually when you screen the individuals for olfactory performance, it is it is found out that no, they are not uh, actually able to uh, smell. At the, at the same uh, way as a normal olfactory chamber would be functioning. Grip strength was found to be decreasing uh, in the in the three age categories. Group, hand grip strength, it's a marker used for predicting mortality. A person with a reduced grip, hand grip strength is likely to uh, uh, suffer from mortality at an early age. And there are various studies pointing to this relationship earlier as well. Uh, females generally have a lower hand grip strength as compared to males because of the muscle strength and the various changes in the hormonal um, the distribution in the body. The decline in the muscle activity increases when obesity increases. So yes, obesity can be a factor that leads to a reduced hand grip strength as well. Uh, as already discussed, uh, I, I, just, I just already spoke about this, that lower hand grip strength is, is found with, uh, with uh, increasing risk of mortality and uh, higher insulin levels, and uh, this actually shows the decline goes faster. These were the psychophysiological indicators that we discussed, and these are the correlations mentioned with here. Uh, we, we, we compared age against all these factors, and we, we uh, discussed these factors against one another as well. Uh, we found out that there were negative correlations as well as positive correlation between various of our study uh, uh, variables here. Correlation between age and aging indicators. Age and CWDF level were negatively correlated. IL-6, significant positive correlation was seen. Uh, ISTIF score, FAS test, DSSC time had a significant negative correlation and grip strength showed a negligible correlation. What was the impact of the socioeconomic uh, status on the study parameters? So there was no uniform pattern though, but subjects belonging to 37 to 53 age had an increased cortisol IL-6 and in non-invasive indicators had increased as well. BDNF was significantly associated with socioeconomic status. Here, B grip strength uh, was present in all the study participants. Poor olfactory performance was present in all the all, uh, all study subjects at all age groups. BMI was found to be affecting socioeconomic status because uh, in our study we found that 58.5% uh, of subjects were normal, but 99.9% were underweight. 21.6% were overweight or obese. Upper socioeconomic status uh, tends to be associated with increased obesity because of the sedentary lifestyle and because of increased intake of refined sugars and uh, access to uh, nutrients in high quantity. Low socioeconomic status individuals were found to be having B grip strength. The lowest, the lowest BDNF found was in the same in this age gap in this uh, socioeconomic status of, uh, of uh, uh, low category. Uh, highest IL6 was found there. Longest DSST time was found in the same category. Um, the upper socioeconomic data, we know that they, uh, they, they have access to social benefits and they lead a balanced life. 
and uh, they have a, a, a greater chance of in, enhancing their muscle strength as compared to someone who is suffering from, who is actually facing a low socioeconomic status in the society. So social class bias uh, as and, and bad habits, they affect IL-6. Um, an inappropriate lifestyle, they include DSST and cognitive dysfunction as well. The middle socioeconomic status was found to be having, again, the strip set was common in this as well. And individuals in the age category of 20 to, 20 to 36 had the weak grip strength. Now, this was a kind of concern for us because individuals belonging to an age category of 20 to 36 are the ones who should be having the, the, the highest grip strength because that's the age when you have the highest energy. But somehow our student, our, our participants in the study, uh, they thought that they are, they would be having a stronger grip strength or a normal grip strength, but they were mostly categorized to be having weak grip strength. And a weak grip strength is a predictor of early mortality. That needs to be kept in mind. Majority of individuals belonging to upper middle class, uh, in, they had a raised BDNF. And as per our knowledge, this no such correlation uh, is found in any category so far. A low, so a low so childhood socioeconomic position is also associated with reduced ability to smell as adults. Quickly coming to uh, the highest, uh, come, I, I'll just come to conclusion now. Uh, this, this, is, this is study, this was the first study ever conducted on indicators of aging in our local population. We were able to screen individuals, our local subjects for olfactory performance. This has not been done ever before. We found out that cognitive person, cognitive performance, weak grip strength, and altered olfactory performance was seen in all age brackets. Socioeconomic status was a key variable in the dynamics of aging. We accepted obesity, poor olfactory performance, poor grip strength, raised IL-6, low BDNF as indicators of aging. Uh, recommendations uh, are that since we conducted this study in Karachi, a similar study can be conducted in the rural areas of Pakistan to and and and, and we were not able to we were not able to uh, control the ethnic groups here. So yes, other ethnic groups can be included, and a specified study can be conducted uh, on a particular ethnic group to just uh, increase the uh, the uh, the strength of such studies. Um, uh, what we recommend is that our population is going unscreened for uh, for olfactory performance as well as hand grip strength. And probably these are those early markers or indicators which, which suggest that our population is suffering. Uh, there, are, there are people in our population who are suffering from uh, an accelerated biological aging, although their chronological age belongs to a lower category. For example, a person belonging to an age of 25 is having the chronological age of 25, but the biological aging within the body is way more accelerated. And the person is more susceptible to developing diseases and disabilities in future at an early age because the body is undergoing uh, a faster degeneration as compared to a person belonging to the same chronological age, but a better biological age. Limitations of our study, we, uh, the, uh, the ethnicity was not controlled, gender side, gender wise sampling was not balanced. Uh, there's lack of awareness as population regarding lifestyle. Unequal number of subjects in age in, in age age group. There are no socioeconomic class boundaries availability available in Pakistan, which can be used as uniform indicators. Towards the end, I would like to just acknowledge all my uh, all the individuals who were there to support us in this study, uh, and and prime most uh, the all right goes to Dr. Salaf at the to uh, who who was there at the as the captain of the ship and all our team members there. This study was funded by Karachi University as well as HEC and International Brain Research Organization. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fezan. Uh, Dr. Samina and Dr. Zafar, I will now welcome you both to open the forum for the question. Uh, yes, Dr. Zafar, you can go first, please. If you wish. I have posted a lot of questions for this yes, I mean, I'm just, presentation. I'm just, uh, I'm just <laughs> going through the questions right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> it was so interesting. So I posted a lot of so questions. Much, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Actually, just... an innovative idea. Thank you so much. So, if Dr. Zafar uh, has. Dr. No... Zafar, we cannot hear you. I guess your mic is not working. Hello. 
now yes, it is sir, really sir. okay uh, yes it is really sir. very interesting uh, uh, his study and uh, especially so much, for the, if, if it has been done for the first time uh, especially pointing out so many parameters so many so many facts uh, especially uh, our, our dr fazan has mentioned one in one slide that uh, uh, the uh, people who have the low socio economic uh, um, uh, status in the beginning in, in their childhood uh, were really uh, not uh, able to have the smell identification and the, as as adult so uh, uh really uh, it's a very good finding and uh, so much, that also helps uh, in uh, developing other uh, conditions other diseases also that uh, those who come from uh, low social economic con uh, conditions when they they are exposed and they have uh, they have become fluent and then they they have a, a better lifestyle uh, they they come up with these some some especially as for my for my area that they they develop diabetes with that uh, tram uh, effect uh, occurs so um, i again congratulate fazan uh, dr fazan did very well thank you so much sir thank you so much yeah, uh, yes dr fazan would you like to comment or should i ask a question uh, miss you i think we can proceed with the questions Okay. Uh, before I ask any question, is there any question from uh, the participants who are attending? Okay. So uh, the pa participants can continue to post, and uh, it will be later on sure. forwarded with the help of the moderator, yes. uh, Dr. Jala. So I have a couple of questions as you are, you are already reading them, Dr. Fazan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate you and congratulate you on your PhD and Thank your you so uh, innovative so project. Uh, along so with much. your team, so it's a it's an actually innovative study. Did you measure the social life? Uh, the last slide revealed the limitation, and you said that you haven't uh, studied the social uh, aspect. Uh, is it so? The social yes, the life social, uh, criteria. The social, yeah. the social life uh, uh, cannot be assessed using a certain tool. Uh, but yes, we did categorize the individuals uh, for a physical performance test, and that since this was a larger study. And I have omitted the variables which were not relevant to psychophysiology uh, uh, from our study in this particular slideshow. And we screened the individuals for frailty using a physical performance test. And that physical performance test actually screens the individual for having uh, whether the body is frail or not. And when we, we knew that our individuals are not frail, only then we, were, we, we uh, led them to uh, continue with the study uh, uh, analysis. So that actually is a predictor of that the generalized frailty in the body is just not there. So the body is, is strengthened as compared for that particular age category. Right. So I would like to just add that uh, everything can be measured in research. And okay. if anything cannot be measured, you can, uh, you can innovate a scale like Dr. Sadaf did. Right? She's a pioneer of one of the scales. Gee. I was impressed to read that. So yes, you can create a scale of measurement of social life. You can develop a questionnaire. You can pilot study it and you can peer review it. And eventually you can develop a scale for social life so that you can, if the, if the, if the patients or the subjects are still uh, in your access, then you can reach back to them and you can further dig out their social life uh, criteria. Like uh, uh, if they are parents, are they living with their children or not? Uh, are they how many people they meet every day? So uh, what are what are their uh, social activities? So so they, you can derive questions like that. So later on, maybe, maybe, maybe you can add this very important parameter sure, because sure. I, have, I, have I have undergone a study. It. Yeah, I have undergone a study which says that uh, the elderly people who have who live with their children, uh, uh, they they have uh, uh, a higher life expectancy and they have. Uh, a healthy aging, uh, or we can say delayed uh, side effects of aging. So maybe uh, you can even reach to that level uh, with the help of this study, or maybe you can uh, incorporate it in a future study, right? And uh, likewise, there's another important parameter like exercise, you know, because exercise helps in developing the skeletal muscle, uh, including the hand grip, it can improve. So exercise can be one of the uh, confounders 
uh, just like this, uh, 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 it can be one of the confounders that can, that can help you uh, in uh, or that can affect the results. So if you include it as a parameter, it is also going to have a very powerful impact on your study, this study or future studies. Uh, likewise, uh, I would like to ask you that uh, this was actually unique to see the pens, use of different pens for as olfactory stimuli, because in um, uh, traditional physiology labs, you know that we dilute the, the olfactory substance and we make the subject uh, smell those uh, 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 test tubes that are labeled as ABCD. And uh, we, we approach from mild to uh, pungent uh, uh, stimuli. So when you made them smell those pens uh, or, or card or whatsoever, uh, was there a definite sequence of uh, proceeding from a mild smell to a pungent smell? Because if the receptors, uh, olfactory receptors, they are stimulated by a pungent smell first, then they, they may not appreciate the mild uh, olfactory stimuli. So what was your sequence of uh, uh, stimulation with the help of olfactory substances? Was it mild this, to this, the, the, the kit comes with 12 pens and the 12 pens have to be used in the sequence of 1, 2, 3, 4 till 12. And they, uh, they are, these pens are, are made in Germany and the paper that we cited was, uh, was by Hummels and his, uh, his colleagues. And Hummels, they, they, uh, they reduce these number of pen, pens from 36 to 12. And this is what's used in routine screening as well, as I mentioned in my, in my talk as well. So uh, the, 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 uh, the fragrances which are there are all the routine fragrances. There is no pungent smell there. And uh, the time duration between first and the second pen is four minutes. We give one pen to a subject and then we wait for four minutes and then we provide the second pen to the subject. And the subject can then uh, can, can ask, for example, if a subject is unable to identify the smell, the subject can very well ask that I want to smell the pen once again. So we provide the pen once again to the subject. So there is no uh, limitation of how many times the person wants to inhale that particular pen. But that needs what needs to be kept in mind that yes, we go in the sequence from one, two, three, until 12, one after the other, giving a break of four minutes between every pen. Right. So, so this simplifies the problem. Uh, and do you think that literacy can affect this uh, verbal fluency output? Yes. Uh, how do yes, you definitely. handle this parameter of literacy? Uh, because not yeah. everybody can narrate a number of words suddenly of mm. any alphabet people with the same level of vocabulary and literacy. So how did you miss, manage uh, this? Miss, miss this? Since this was a cross-sectional study, uh, we, we took participants from various parts of our, of, of our city and uh, we had individuals with various educational backgrounds, uh, but our criteria included that every individual must be having basic literacy of greater than uh, graduation. So graduation was a category that we included and an in, anyone who was an undergraduate was also included, but anyone who was below university, university uh, education or someone in intermediate or not educated was not included in the study. So great. So you have taken care of it in the inclusion criteria. You are safe. Yeah. <laughs> so have you have you compared grip strength with BMI? Uh, because yes, you know we, we, obesity uh, you measured. mentioned is one of the we factors. Did. We did. We did, and our paper is published on uh, obesity and the hand grip strength. And we found that uh, people who are who are obese they have a poor hand grip strength and obesity. That's why we included as one of the indicator of aging. And that paper is already published of ours. And right. another paper, in another, in another paper, we, we already published that paper as well, in which we compared obesity with the olfactory performance. And we found that individuals belonging to uh, an obese class, they have a poor olfactory performance. Right. Do you think that obesity can be categorized? Last question. Do you think that obesity can be categorized into high or low socioeconomic status? Because people from both status, status can be obese. Miss, uh, they uh, we did found we did we did uh, get subjects from all socioeconomic strata, uh, strata who who were obese, and it was not just bound by upper socioeconomic strata. So yes, uh, it can be categorized, but obesity is generalized obesity, and in Pakistan we have obesity uh, found in every socioeconomic strata in both genders. So it means that obesity was a str stronger parameter as compared to the socioeconomic status. Yes. Right. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think Dr. Sadaf is running short of time, so she will not allow me to ask yes. another question. <laughs> yeah, I can read it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fazan. Uh, moving to our thank next so expert, uh, we have with us uh, Sir Shamoon Nashat. Sir is currently serving as Assistant Professor and Director QEC at Malir University of Science and Technology. He is a graduate from Physiology Department, University of Karachi, followed with a master with a specialization in applied and clinical physiology and a, a master of philosophy in health science with a specialty in stress and neurodegeneration. He has completed three post-graduation diploma in clinical psycho psychophysiology, cognitive behavior therapy, and clinical research. Thank you, uh, Sir Shamun Nashad. I am sharing your screen. Thank you, Jala. Yes, sir. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let me start. <clears throat> Basically, what is happening in Karachi uh, since last 25 years, uh, citizens of Karachi have uh, been severely affected by terrorism, uh, target killing, violence, and uh, missing persons crisis and un unfortunate accidents. Uh, people living here are working in severe stress conditions and uh, several studies have identified that they are highly affected and uh, the majority of them are dealing with traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress. Uh, over the last decade, several psycho uh, psychological effects on human body and brain have been studied uh, due to the direct exposure of traumatic stressors. Uh, uh, basically, experiencing or re-experiencing of trauma can lead to progression of different kind of uh, traumatic stress, including alterations of cognition, memory, and learning behaviors in different human brain uh, developmental stages. Uh, while uh, these exposure to traumatic events such as war, abuse, uh, be it physical, sexual, or mental, or any natural disaster can uh, typically leads to post-traumatic stress, uh, that could uh, further lead to mental health problems, uh, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, <clears throat> uh, basically, uh, PTSD is a heterogeneous uh, psychiatric disorder whose diagnostic criteria according to DSM-5, uh, including uh, exposure to any type of uh, traumatic event, uh, several adverse effects are associated with uh, development of post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder that includes impairment in psychosocial functioning, uh, increased risk societal thoughts and dependency on uh, substance abuse objects. Uh, basically, individuals with uh, PTSD along with mental health and well-being uh, distortion also have very high prevalence of physical comorbidity uh, that includes diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndromes that leads to premature mortality. Uh, several studies uh, suggest that individuals with post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder uh, had almost double risk chances of having uh, metabolic syndrome as compared to control individuals uh, due to increased smoking rate, uh, disturbed sleep uh, cycle, and uh, low amount of physical activity. Uh, uh, basically, we have uh, let's try to understand post traumatic growth. Uh, what is my focus right now? Studies in the uh, last two decades that have demonstrated that besides the negative psychological uh, adverse effects, positive growth with beneficial outcomes have also been documented in recent research. Uh, in individuals who have faced uh, highly traumatized life events, such positive changes in the psychology of individuals that is experienced after traumatized stressful life event is referred as basically post-traumatic growth. Uh, 
post traumatic growth usually focus on the uh, major stressful situation or event in contrast to stress related growth that shows the positive changes after any major or minor crisis or event uh basically ptg is highly influenced by many different factors that include avoidance of coping intrusive thoughts a uh, type of traumatic stress that tends uh, to affect the social support and timing of the traumatic event timing of the traumatic event is really important and individual developing post traumatic growth tend to have minor to major transformational changes that includes uh their view about them self uh, relationships and philosophy of life along with uh, minor positive changes uh basically research in this domain suggests that uh, the positive changes entail several different uh, realms including perceived changes in self uh changes of sense in relationship with others along with uh, perception regarding philosophy of life uh basically uh, what happens uh, evidence from studies suggest that children and adult who have faced any natural disaster or uh, have observed a moderate level of post traumatic growth uh, that is followed after like hurricane earthquake or any any other kind of uh, natural disaster several number of systematic studies or systematic reviews or meta analysis have suggested uh, the adaptive significance of post traumatic growth suggesting it association with uh, improved psychological well being uh, increased satisfaction towards life and decline in depressive symptoms traumatized uh, individuals developing post traumatic growth uh, tend to experience increased sense for the appreciation of life with improved sense of personal strength and uh, self understanding including uh, reduction in drug alcohol consumption or any kind of substance abuse uh, along with appreciation for intimate uh, relationships uh the basic concept starts with resilience basically resilience and post traumatic growth may resemble to each other in concept but on ground level resilience is the maintenance or return of normal human functioning without elevation of any pathological outcome uh whereas growth or post traumatic growth uh involves the changes in human for their own betterment after any adversity or trauma exposure uh several studies or we can say few studies related to post traumatic stress or post traumatic stress disorder and post traumatic growth uh have suggested a curvilinear relationship between them uh results of adolescent study of exposure to terror such suggest a a uh, basically a positive along with a inverted u curvilinear relationship between post traumatic growth and uh, symptoms of post traumatic stress disorder uh, several researchers have conducted uh, empirical investigations regarding post traumatic growth and its relationship with uh, symptoms of post traumatic stress uh, basically to demonstrate whether or not post traumatic growth uh, serve as a protection barrier against post traumatic stress and ptsd a uh, number of studies have suggested the fact the higher level of post traumatic growth uh, is associated with increased symptom of post traumatic stress while uh, opposite to these studies some studies claim that uh, a greater post traumatic growth is related with decline in post traumatic stress symptoms however few studies also uh, support the fact that post traumatic growth and uh, psychological distress is not relatable to one another although uh, post traumatic growth and symptoms of pts or post traumatic stress have been examined in number of studies and in different variety of trauma context uh, let's discuss about a meta analysis which uh, included 77 uh cross sectional studies that suggest that avoidance and intrusive thoughts related to greater trauma was associated to post traumatic growth uh while evidence suggests that emotional struggle 
डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट एंड ड्यूरिंग ट्रॉमा इज द कैटलिस्ट फॉर पोस्ट ट्रोमेटिक ग्रोथ सजेस्टेड बाय फंडामेंटल डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट सिमिलरली बेसिकली द कोर बिलीफ आर चैलेंज एंड कॉग्नेटिव प्रोसेसिंग is initiated by the negative changes of the related events uh basically what happens uh, uh what nature's uh, do on health or what are the effects of nature on health uh i am trying to connect the traumatic stress post traumatic growth and nat- nature uh drastic changes in uh, human being is response to nature with the perception of relaxation uh, recuperate uh, followed by finding the temporary freedom from the stresses in normal day life have been extensively studied through centuries uh among the most dominant and self reported motives uh, is stress relief uh scrap uh, from civilization important issues uh, reflecting life along with uh experiencing beauty and connected uh, with nature are included uh basically it is suggested that uh, uh the nature exposure with the restorative effects have been psycho logically or psychophysiologically or simply physiologically accounted for the reduction in cognitive fatigue along with stress levels and uh, increased focus positive effects and decline in negative adverse effects uh, along with decreased activity in sympathetic nervous system all these actions are interpreted with respect to the uh, two most dominant uh, theories of nature basically those are uh, basically art theory the attention restoration theory and the psychophysiological stress reduction framework uh, let's discuss the art first the focus of art is on the determinant factors regarding mental fatigue it focuses on the individual capacity to direct the attention of being in nature and associate the restorative effect with the potential to conjure up soft fascination uh this restorative theory suggests that uh, basically it is remedy that is needed for the recovery and resting while uh, talking about the another theory that is psychophysiological stress reduction uh, have abrupt and gradual positive effect with an affective stress relieving response to nature with a non threatening environment although both these theories of nature restoration are based on the assumption of the nature affiliation uh both of these theories also presume the fact that nature promote faster uh with complete restoration for mental fatigue and individual with stress as compared to other environments basically what happens if uh, you can see a study conducted by Jelkov uh, have demonstrated a significant relationship between uh, post traumatic studies uh, basically post traumatic stress and uh, he chose israeli veterans with ptsd and suggested that symptoms of post traumatic stress disorder and depression reduced along with improvement in functioning hope and control of an individual on the symptoms of post traumatic stress disorder with uh, no change in the physiological uh, quality of life factors as compared to the control group uh, the nature adventure rehabilitation in the study was conducted with three main aims uh, uh, that include to teach participants how to sail uh to provide the space in which the individual have the authority of making the decisions of how to cope up with challenge uh related to sailing and challenge the participant emotionally uh physically socially and uh cognitively the results of the study also focused on the fact that uh basically the interventions uh might be helpful in reducing the symptoms in the entire span of symptomatology while uh 
it is observed that mood and psychophysiological responses are assessed uh, suggesting that the individuals who were asked to walk in nature have restorative effects over and above the effects of exposure of individuals to nature scenes. Uh, basically, this is uh, the second study. Uh, in the past 30 years, correlational and experimental findings have provided the evidence of the restorative effect of the nature. Uh, moreover, experimental findings based on the evidence of psychological, physiological and uh, biochemical levels suggest that exercise along with exposure of nature uh, is considered more beneficial than exercise in built up places. Moreover, recent study uh, conducted in 2020 uh, suggested that post-traumatic growth is positively associated with transport-related uh, household and leisure time physical activity while exposing to nature. Uh, uh, Dowell and Kaplan conducted a study in 2013. Uh, basically, it was a non-randomized control trial uh, on uh, 98 veterans, uh, which included uh, post-traumatic stress disorder patients. Uh, the activities in the study all focused mainly on uh, developing the recreational skills regard, uh, regarding wilderness uh, that includes uh, backcountry navigation and safety of water. The results of this uh, study basically demonstrated uh, veterans participants experienced several benefits uh, with respect to uh, psychological well-being, socially functioning and engagement of individual uh, in, in several other activities. Uh, basically, it was also such suggested that after outdoor experience, after uh, one month, uh, the positive outcomes were sustained, uh, concluding that uh, the group uh, based outdoor recreation program seems to be promising approach in improving the mental health veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and achieving post-traumatic stress. Uh, basically, uh, this recently, uh, this article is uh, published in uh, Scientific America and it's, it's, it's a really interesting article and uh, I'm quoting specifically from uh, this uh, paper that uh, the author quoted that in the 1990s, researchers announced a series of discoveries that would uh, append a bedrock tenant of neuroscience. For decades, the mature, mature brain was understood to be incapable of growing uh, new neurons. Uh, once an individual reached adulthood, the thinking went, the brain began losing neurons rather than gaining them. Uh, but evidence was building uh, that the adult uh, brain could in fact generate new neurons in uh, one particularly striking uh, experiment with mice. Scientists found this simply running on a wheel led to the birth of new neuron in the hippocampus. A brain structure uh, that is associated with memory. Since then, uh, other studies have been established and conducted. Uh, that exercise also positive effects on the brain of humans, especially as we age, and that it may help reduce the risk like Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, but uh, these uh, this study raised have uh, have raised several questions. Uh, so it it's it shows that exercise and exercise with nature. Uh, in current era have shown a positive uh, relationship with the mental health and with the uh, uh, with the new new, uh, new studies in the neuroscience uh, uh, recently uh, our team has conducted a randomized control trial on effect of nature based physical activity on post traumatic growth uh, and we specifically focused on the healthcare providers with post traumatic stress uh, Basically, we have uh, uh, our study has been completed 
and we have uh, received quite promising results and our uh, the manuscript uh, is in uh, is under the consideration for publication uh, in an international journal right now uh, so in uh, next conference or in coming uh, uh, conference of psychophysiology aapb in texas uh, we will surely present the results of this findings uh, with the team uh, with the uh, entire psychophysiology community thank you Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Shamoon. I would like Dr. Samina and Dr. Zafar Abbas to uh, comment. Uh, Professor Zafar, please go first. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Samina. Uh, uh, Dr. Shamoon, uh, uh, in fact, we observe in our uh, clinical setups that uh, the disease status, health status, prior to the um, trauma uh, and um, helping uh, societies or helping aids, uh, helping hands which are available to an individual um, um, post-traumatically uh, also affects the or uh, determines the outcome. What's your comment? Sorry, sir. I didn't get your question completely. Uh... Uh, in fact, what happens, those, those people who are exposed to, the, uh, prior to the exposure to the trauma, they, mm. they are already diseased. They were on some, certain medicines or having some, some uh, disabilitating disease. Mm -hmm. they, once they, they get the exposure to the trauma, uh, the post-traumatic uh, growth was very much affected and very much of the slow pace. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, again, that comparison between the those after after the trauma, those who have the uh, access to the uh, helping hands and helping societies or rehabilitation uh, 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 services, they have a different different outcome than the other one. Mm -hmm. Exactly, uh, uh, sir. That's true because. Uh, there are two different conditions. Uh, 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 the, uh, traumatic stress uh, is of two different kinds. Uh, as I have explained in my slides that uh, there is a, a person who is affected by the violence uh, directly in the city. I have focused the, that part. Although there is a patient who, which is coming directly to your clinic and uh, after conducting some tests, and you concluded that that you have cancer right now and or you have any kind of certain uh, disease which is fatal and uh, the patient will uh, definitely go towards post-traumatic stress in that condition and if you will consider an imaginary line here uh, uh, suppose if the patient is right now is focusing towards his health uh, is this imaginary line and when you tell him that he has uh, the third stage cancer and he's towards the fatal line, uh, his, his lifeline or his approach towards his health will decrease from here, from this imaginary line to here. But what will happen uh, after some times or in few, uh, in few days, it will move from this imaginary to decrease from here to now it will move upwards here. And basically, this portion is called post-traumatic growth. And uh, this post-traumatic growth is achieved uh, uh, differently in different, uh, uh, in different uh, uh, basically, environments. Uh, so in, uh, uh, while discussing the clinical settings, uh, majority of the time, it has been seen that religious aspect create more post-traumatic growth as comparatively environment. But what we are trying to do, that we are trying to create an, uh, an universal type of uh, therapy like uh, environment and nature, if they are uh, producing or giving a uh, good effect uh, as compared to other therapy, then why not we uh, promote nature and exercise directly? And uh, have you also 
or consider the socioeconomic conditions um, uh, prior to the uh, trauma? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have considered the socioeconomic con uh, conditions, and uh, it's it's true that uh, uh, the people with low socioeconomic uh, conditions have uh, difficulties. To, uh, um, to conduct these exercises in natural environment uh, because it, uh, first of all, uh, there is, uh, natural environment is not present in Karachi or in uh, basically the majority of the cities of Pakistan. Uh, natural uh, environment is completely demolished. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, while th this happened, while, while we were conducting this study, we only uh, get approval from Safari Park which uh, and after visiting Safari Park, we were uh, we were also quite depressed that how we will con conduct this study uh, because including Safari Park is is, is in in uh, was in a destructive state. Uh, you cannot say that it is a natural environment there. Uh, things have changed very uh, drastically in uh, Karachi, and uh, I'm sure uh, the environmentalists should think that uh, we should consider that it is a gr uh, great problem coming right now. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thanks. So great, uh, uh, Dr. Shamoon. It was an interesting presentation, and this should be our focus to seek nature. Uh, no matter where we find it, <laughs> no matter we have to go and visit nature somewhere. Maybe you can uh, uh, later on uh, go for a collaborative study and uh, you can compare the environment of Karachi with the environment of uh, any other place like Lahore. And I welcome you for that. And uh, because the environment is quite friendly over here uh, in comparison mm -hmm. with Karachi. Uh, I can also add. I can. Yeah. I can also add to Dr. Samina's advice that we can also compare the uh, uh, environment of metropolitan cities with the villages as well. Because in Punjab okay. we have very good and rich environment in the villages and also in the KPK. So we can also compare those specific environment, and there must be some. Um, uh, very significant changes in the improvement or uh, maybe uh, the post-traumatic growth as well. Yeah, I, I endorse uh, Dr. Sadaf and I would further say that uh, northern areas of Pakistan, they are blessed with the uh, very rich uh, natural environment. So maybe uh, this uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, growth uh, might be higher over there. And there has been a lot of trauma, um, earthquakes and uh, 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 natural disasters uh, have held over there and people have grown out of it. So uh, uh, was there any difference? Uh, maybe you can see in future because this is your uh, study of interest. And uh, my question uh, to you originally was <laughs> that how do you challenge the patient diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder cognitively? Because you mentioned in one of your slides that uh, uh, one should challenge them emotionally, uh, and also cognitively and so and so. So I could not understand how do you challenge them cognitively so that they build uh, th that growth. So how do you challenge them cognitively? Okay, uh, basically uh, it was not a, a, it was not a literally meaning of challenging them uh, uh, for cognitively. It was basically it uh, it's related to the post traumatic growth if if you will see the post traumatic growth inventory uh, you will see uh, there are five possibilities and it, it basically focus on the new possibilities uh, your desire towards your sexual health your desire towards your entire health your past and it it's basically uh, it covers all the aspect of the traumatic stress and the post traumatic growth uh, uh, here uh, the question arises, uh, basically, uh, the concept of post-traumatic growth is not clear in, uh, uh, not, I'm not discussing right now in Pakistan, it's not com uh, 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 basically common in the community of psychology or psychophysiology or even in physiology community. It is not common that uh, people have not uh, understand the complete phenomenon of post-traumatic growth uh, because it is relatively a new phenomenon. And uh, basically post-traumatic uh, growth model is something different. Uh, it, uh, it works uh, uh, a bit differently 
from the uh, aspects of psychology it's it's work uh, uh, as dr jerry said is directly uh, work in the in the of the psychophysiology so i'm i I'm not sure I'm uh, I'm I will uh, be able to explain it completely uh, that how uh, how this models work, but uh, 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 because uh, I'm not sure uh, that this mo uh, it's a very complicated model. So I have no. Uh, idea. I think I think you have answered my question appropriately uh, uh, by uh, saying that. Uh, we need to give them awareness and knowledge about how their body works and how they can improve the function of their body so that would be kind of giving them a cognitive stimulus or challenging them positively and motivating them uh, by showing them that they can do this and they can do that uh, i hope you mean this yes ma'am okay thank you very much thank you very thank much. you thank you Great. thank you Thank you, Sir Shamoon. Uh, moving on to our next presenter, Dr. Sadaf Ahmed. She need no introduction. She is the main founder behind this conference. She is a PhD with expertise and interest in psychophysiology and behavior neuroscience. She is the pioneer to introduce physio psychophysiology in various institute and mental health sector, and co-authored Pakistan first stress evaluating tool, Sadaf. stress scale dr sadaf is an active member of recognized society like international brain research organization uh, pa canada pakistan research and development council the science bridge world association of medical editor pakistan society of basic and applied neuroscience and many more uh, i will be sharing the screen over to you dr sadaf thank you jala uh, due to some internet issues so jala will be sharing my powerpoint and i'll be just talking and due to time constraint i'll be very quick uh, as uh, this conference is uh, now uh, beginning uh, to discuss about the things that uh, we haven't discussed in past so my presentation is not much more scientific based on the hardcore psychophysiology that dr sherman and dr jerry has talked about a lot and then uh, shamoon and fazan has given a very good uh, uh, aspect of uh, the aging and the lifestyle and the trauma and everything so my presentation is basically based on the uh, paradigm shift and how we are going uh, towards the research aspects uh, and specifically psychophysiological research aspects of well being so recent years have witnessed an exciting shift in the research and as you all know that it has mentioned a lot in the research literature now that from emphasis on the disorder and dysfunction and understanding the mechanisms we are also now focusing on the well being and positive mental health aspects of life and uh, of being on mind and body connection so this paradigm shift has been specifically uh, very prominent in psychology research in physiology research now and uh, if you can say now the field of psychophysiology is also focusing on that because our outcomes are totally based on uh, the well being of a person so it but it has to be captured uh, uh, the attention of the other scientists as well like epidemiologists like social scientists like economists like policy makers because now policies are now basically grounded and based on the, the those aspect where we should focus on the outcome and livelihood and the well being of the populations so this health uh, perspective and positive per perspective is also endorsed by who in their constitution where the health is being defined as a state of complete physical mental and social well being and not merely the absence of disease uh, uh, i must say most recently who has also defined that uh, positive mental health and uh, the state of well being the state of well being is normal uh, um, is actually the individual uh, ability Uh, where one can cope with the normal stresses of life one can do productive activity they can act pro fruitfully and productively and and they can able to make a contribution in the com community so my talk will summarize that uh, what we do 
or what we know about the factors determining an individual's level of psychological and physiological well-being and the effects of well-being on our perceptions as well. What are our understanding right now? Our thoughts and behaviors are how they are changing and on our physiology and health. Uh, we might be able to explore in my five to six slides that uh, what knowledge do we have and in, uh, the current knowledge, how we can use this current knowledge and utilize this current knowledge to improve the well-being in individuals and po populations. So uh, uh, basically when uh, uh, we talk about the well-being and psychological well-being first, so evidences are there and uh, there has been talked and debate about the causes and the consequences. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the recent research on mental well-being has come out uh, 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 and there are a number of reasons we are discussing that the rec uh, how to recognize the absence of ill-being and how we can discuss about the existence of well-being. Uh, there is uh, certain other aspects where what need to be discussed that uh, to uh, distinguish between the approaches to improving psychological well-being. But when we talk about the uh, neuroscience of uh, the psychological well-being or mental well-being, so the first thing uh, as psychophysiologists which come into our uh, interest is pet terms of brain activation because we all know that the emotion circuitry and emotional circuitry of uh, the brain is very complex and involving primarily structures like prefrontal cortex and there is a lot of work has been done on prefrontal cortex but uh, we can uh, also talk about amygdala hippocampus uh, anterior cingulate uh, cortex and the insular cortex and so on so these structures normally work together to process and uh, general emotional information and emotional behaviors. So research has particularly focused on prefrontal cortex. Uh, let me tell you that uh, unlike other brain regions, uh, prefrontal cortex is actually involved in the emotion processing. And there are so many asymmetric activation in relation to the positive and negative emotions. Uh, the research has also reported that individuals with positive emotional style show higher uh, levels of uh, left than right prefrontal activation. For example, when we uh, have done the EEG or uh, functional MRI studies, while those with negative emotional st uh, styles tend to show higher level of right than left prefrontal uh, activation at rest. So there are so many in, uh, important studies that contributed and important links uh, have been identified between also the brain development aspects where the child uh, development and the appearance of individual differences in the patterns brain activation has been also reported. So neuroscience also say that the brain activation studies have tended to focus either on emotion or on cognition. Where research is integrated, it is usually concerned with emotional disorders such as depression and anxiety and future research can be conducted to integrate this fully aspect where cognition and emotion to develop the understanding of relation between the emotional and cognitive processes and how we can understand the neuroscience of uh, uh, actually psycho uh, psych psychological well-being. And we have to identify the role of other regions and distinct regions as well, like uh, uh, um, other brain areas that are actually coordinating and also inside the prefrontal cortex, the dorsolateral and ventromedial and orbitofrontal, how th these are working. The other aspect than the uh, uh, pattern of brain activation is the neurochemical uh, effect. We all know that there are so many neurochemical influences uh, happening in the brain and there are synapses and we are, we are actually uh, running throughout uh, by these uh, connections. So exposure to stressors, everyday life stress, stressors, whether mild, moderate, or severe type of stressors, exposure to these stressors activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal excess. And we all know that uh, it might increase the stress hormones re release and the stress hormone, particularly cortisol. And however, individual differences are there. And every, uh, every person have their own self-esteem, their own personality, their own emotional styles. So they can modulate and cope with the stress uh, and the induced uh, elevated cortisol as well. I will not be talking about whether we what we have to do with the cortisol, but 
uh, what I can uh, say that there are so many researchers that report that there are certain other important chemicals as well, like serotonin. When we talk about serotonin, that deficiencies in the serotonergic function may reflect the relative absence of the positive mood and suggestions also warrant uh, the uh, further investigation. There are so many animal studies, there are less um, human studies, but together these findings can support the idea that mental well-being and ill-being have different neurobiological as well as behavior effect, and there is a change in the chemistry back uh, in the background. Uh, there have been also attempt to establish uh, other other um, focuses uh, focuses on the other chemicals like oxytocin, and there is a lot of work done on the mammalian uh, uh, oxytocin. And uh, people are reporting that how oxytocin is secreted by both males and females, and it is associated with the bonds with the, and it plays a, play a very important role in the well-being, which is social bonding. So an important component of overall well-being. So there are so many other chemicals. People are even working like we are doing. Uh, uh, I'm supervising few PhDs where we are working on the genetic aspects and these receptors and the genes behind these. Uh, or neurochemical things, but uh, on the whole, when we talk about the uh, whole scenario, the overall well-being has certain components. So, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, there are so many other things like uh, the psychological well-beings have their certain aspects. The development of psychological well-being have social factors. Uh, during the brain development. In mammalian species, we know that later emotional well-being and cognitive capability are profoundly influenced by the social environment that we are exposed to in our early childhood and then in the adolescence age and when the brain fully developed up to 32 years of age. So uh, there, is, there is a journey where all the rodents and the other, uh, 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 other mam mammals, while the humans as well, uh, have their uh, survival uh, neurons and have their survival mechanisms, underlying neurobiological mechanisms, they have been identified. And uh, when we talk about the social factors that impact uh, the um, well-being and the development as well, studies uh, have proven that prolonged maternal separation, for example, leads to the lower density of the uh, site. Uh, prolonged uh, exposure to the chronic stress or trauma uh, leads to the dendritic um, dysfunction, leads to the uh, changes in the density of the dendrites and the exon terminals as well. Uh, it also has uh, certain other uh, aspects where it can reduce the uh, stimulus uh, uh, receiving or it, if you can say that it is also responsible to make uh, brains vulnerable when uh, comes to addiction, when com comes to the behavioral uh, uh, other aspects. But adverse early environment, uh, is it possible that there is recovery or uh, we can uh, say that this aspect can largely influence or have the powerful impact? Yes, it has the powerful impact, but we can also change the scenario where uh, the findings also support that powerful effect of environment uh, impacted the um, responsiveness and cognitive ability, as Shamoon said earlier in his presentation. But uh, there is a critical postnatal period, and uh, we have to identify that during the life course, later stages as well, what are the opportunities and what are the aspects where it can be controlled. Uh, other uh, studies also show that uh, there are so many other aspects of uh, uh, well-being or you can say psychological well-being where uh, we cannot uh, ignore the genetic factors and genetic predisposition. There can be no doubt that an individual genotype also has an influence on the development of psychological well-being and resilience to stress. Uh, but recent researches has shown that uh, there are different transporter genes uh, to the different neurochemicals. For example, 5-HTT genes confers vulnerability to depression, but only when there are appropriate environmental triggers. So the uh, uh, what we always say in genetics that uh, the uh, loaded gun is there, but you, ju you just have to pull the trigger. So if environment is not pulling the trigger, so your genetics is there. 
but the environment is safe for you. Most recently, uh, this gene, uh, 5TT gene has also been found to affect brain activation in those regions. So we have talked about the brain activation in the neuro, uh, neuro, uh, neuro, uh, neurological aspect. But when, but when we talk about the psych, psychological aspects, so genetic factors are predisposing uh, and the processing of emotion is very different in every individual because of the, uh, these genetic variations. Research is advancing rapidly in the, uh, in the uh, uh, study of genetic factors behind this well-being thing and also the ill-being thing, which confer increased risk of psychological disorder, actually, these, genetics, uh, uh, these genetic aspects. And research is also needed to identify the link between and probability of psychological flourishing and the role of these genes. So uh, my question is that our drivers of well-being are the same as the drivers of ill-being. Uh, you said uh, uh, you see that there are many risk factors. Um, if we if we talk about risk factors, so there are so many risk factors, and there are uh, there, there there are so many meta analyses very brilliant meta analysis that actually shows us that how risk factors and vulnerability have been studied. And uh, these uh, risk factors and vulnerability factors for mental ill-being have been identified. And uh, for example, we talk about an individual uh, level. So there is a change in the genotype, mother infant in attachment, parenting style, adverse life events, and so on. And on the social level, uh, like uh, Shamoon and Fazan have also talked about that on the social level, we are actually under the influence of so many uh, social aspects like poverty, like uh, unemployment, like discrimination. And what happened uh, yesterday in Pakistan, what we did and what we uh, do uh, for, uh, as an extremist, uh, as a, a prevailing extreme, extreme behaviors and how we are actually threatening the psychological well-being of everyone. So these are also incorporating to those risks and vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, research and principal drivers of psychological well-being uh, identified uh, actually need to explore that what are the opposite of these risk and vulnerability factors, how we can resolve, and also what are the opposites. Several sources of the evidence suggest that while there are some drivers, but there are some drivers, these drivers are not leading us toward only the ill being, but they can be resolved and the opposite of them can save us as well. The first one is personality. Personality is like uh, individual factor, one of the strongest predictor of our usual emotional style in personality is personality. And there are dimensions where uh, one can be extra version on the extra version side or the other side. So uh, someone can be social, someone can be uh, very introvert and uh, there are so many longitudinal studies uh, on the relation of that but personality is related not only to how we feel but also how we physiologically function and psychologically function so there is a lot of need again to do research because I'm throwing the research question at you as a psychophysiologist so we can work on that uh, but this, this whole domain of research actually covered the dimensions of autonomy, environmental uh, aspects, personal growth, personal relations with others, purpose in life, self-acceptance, everything counts. And everything can bring you in the psychological di distress and everything can take you out of the psychological distress. So we need to know what factors can be controlled, what cancer ca factors can be altered, what factors can be protective uh, uh, for us. Then comes the demographic factors. So demo the demographic factors are there. Like there are so many researches regarding gender and demographic char characteristics show many differential effects uh, of well-being and ill-being where women have substantially higher rates of symptomatology. Uh, they can uh, have a higher intensity of symptoms and frequency of symptoms such as an anxiety and depression than men. But the effect of gender is much less clear again till now, and uh, we have to explore it more. Uh, then there is an association of age, Fazan have talked uh, beautifully on that, So, but it is complex. Again, the relationship and association of age with the mental well-being. Uh, usually there is uh, supposed to be a U-shaped uh, relationship with age that younger and much older uh, adults have uh, higher uh, 
uh, well-being scores rather than the middle-aged one because they have all the responsibilities, they are facing all the social factors, they are facing all the psychological factors. So the he health and well-being is actually reported to be declined uh, in the uh, middle age. Uh, and it, this uh, vice versa as well has been also reported. But there is more complex picture emerges when well-being is assessed using more defined measures, not only the self-report measures, not only the single item measures, scale and such like that. Well-being actually improve in advancing age. And there are so many other measures like uh, I talked about in neuroscience conference uh, about the coherence. So there is a sense of coherence with the age, with the increasing age. So there are so many subjective uh, things as well and positive well-being uh, has to do with a lot of things. Then comes the socioeconomic factors. We always, Dr. Samina also asked with all these speakers that uh, have you have you actually not, uh, noticed and observed and uh, recorded the socioeconomic factor because in Pakistan, where we are living, we are also ex uh, actually, um, you can say that totally dependent on most of the socioeconomic factors that are changing uh, us physiologically and psychologically. So major socioeconomic factors tend to have comparable effects on mental well-being and mental ill-being as well. And uh, when we talk about the higher levels of income and socioeconomic status is associated with higher sense of well-being and lower rates of disorder, it is only an assumption because uh, 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 studies have suggested that uh, with the uh, increasing amount of uh, money, with the increasing amount of uh, uh, achievement, although it also diminishes progressively higher level of uh, well-being. So higher level of income or lower level of income, both are actually affecting the well-being. And uh, uh, most of these studies also found out that higher educational qualification is uh, protective against poor mental health. But few also found the reverse gradient where they say that uh, increase in depression associated with high level of education may be an indication uh, of because of the job related stresses, because of the occupations, because of the requiring degree, because of the uh, work pressures, because of the raising expectations and to do more and more and to earn more and to uh, develop a, a certain lifestyle. So there are so many factors actually linked with the education education and then the productivity as well. Then comes the income, uh, income inequality uh, in, uh, in our society. It also impact the well-being and uh, it can uh, uh, promote uh, uh, the uh, mental disorders. So higher national income inequality is linked with higher prevalence of the mental illnesses as reported by UNICEF and certain other uh, organizations as well. Unemployment uh, is also a risk, as uh, I have quoted earlier as well in my various talks, that uh, uh, even uh, when uh, we were talking about that northern areas must have the uh, better resilience and better, but uh, recently we visited Chitral, recently we visited certain northern areas where the suicide rate is high. Uh, and the reason being the unemployment, which has long been associated with the presence of mental health problems. There are other drivers as well that I cannot list down fully, but uh, uh, so many researches, so many researches actually uh, reported that the intentional activities that are like the activities that we can control can be the important drivers of uh, well-being like behaviors such as taking regular exercises, being kind to others, uh, your humble nature, your, uh, your uh, good deeds and everything. And these behaviors and these things can contribute to the well-being. Then cognitions, cognitions like interpreting the event on the positive side, feeling gratitude, saying thanks, and uh, doing these things are also the aspect of uh, the well-being. And then the motivations such as striving towards your focused goals, uh, reflecting deeply with the uh, uh, origin, with the uh, external, not with the external rewards, but uh, actually because uh, uh, of the fact that you have a focused goal, you are deeply connected with your roots and such like that. So behaviors, cognition, motivations also can increase the level of happen happiness and can uh, alter your well-being explained by the interintentional activities. So these are the things.
next please so psychological well being is known to lead uh, uh, to better physical health actually uh, it has uh, long been known that negative emotions are related to higher prevalence of disease but how strong this evidence linked with the positive mental states and health evidence from both longitudinal and experimental studies shows that a positive emotional style has a beneficial effect on physical health and survival so psychological well being is directly related to the physiological health an important physiological mediator what we as a physiologist actually work a lot on and uh, is the underlying the relationship between positive emotion health survival and the functioning of immune system I, and as we are in uh, uh, the pandemic uh, and we are going through the pandemic and uh, we are seeing that uh, how this uh, uh, condition can impact people and the negative emotional style and the uh, uh, chronic stress is leading to poor immune system and uh, people are actually making themselves more vulnerable towards developing a risk to even cold to getting a coronavirus um, all the researches have been done and uh, shows that also there is a positive effect uh, of uh, being positive uh, being uh where people can significant significantly make more antibodies to vaccine so uh there is a, a scientific relation as well using an intervention for example mindfulness meditation yoga or exercise or writing or expressing they all reported that uh, these groups and these intervention these testers group uh, uh tested group are actually uh improving the well being for example the cardiovascular response to stress become enhanced the mood become elevated there are certain other aspects to health uh, uh, decline in the infections uh, prevailing infection and other so prolonged reactivity to stress is also harmful to immune function and there are other physiological processes that can impact on the rapid recovery from stress and that can be beneficial to uh, uh, health so uh, there are also cognitive outcomes of positive activities and if you can say that what are the positive outcomes and what are these positive activities so there are so many positive activities and uh, um, we can say that uh, the well being outcomes of positive activities as i as i was mentioning that gratitude and kindness are widely reported have the good cognitive outcomes of uh, uh actually uh, from a uh, shift shift from ill being to the well being mostly the research focused on the cognitive domains of attention memory situational aspects like high level of perception across the studies different variable have been used psychophysiologically as well like a uh, heart rate variability like a pulse rate like a skin temperature like a skin conductance uh then there are so many other variables like biomarkers uh inflammatory uh, cytokines uh, can be studied and there are certain other electrophysiological aspects where uh, we can study uh, from electromyography we can study from certain aspects of uh, skin conductance like uh, electroencephalogram autonomic nervous system can be uh, uh, studied from blood volume pulse Uh, and skin temperature oxygen sense uh, saturation uh, like our lab is doing a lot of work on that uh, respiration can be uh, monitored uh, blood pressure volumes can be monitored uh, all these studies doing uh, uh, people are doing on that have different advanced analytical technique and emotion and cognition can be studied and they also reported that there are significant changes in the skin conductance and blood pressure volume and they can classify emotional state of uh, being uh, accurately from uh, and the studies have reported that from 78% to 92% they are actually very correct from these uh, these parameters they can actually identify the emotional states and the sense of uh, and the status of well being so physiological rec recording not only provide a uh, alternative to the uh, single self report emotional state because we used to use a question or only and uh, th that was the self report emotional state measure uh, but uh, these physiological recordings can reflect uh, 
on very particular level where uh, uh, they are also low cost as dr sharman and dr jerry mentioned uh, the commercial uh, they are commercially available they are wireless devices where we can monitor all these these devices are readily very feasible to use outside the lab environment and thereby potentially scal scalable in field settings as well clinical organizational educational context even airc ha uh, have been doing so many sessions uh, with people uh, uh, with uh, organization with the corporate sector where we are taking our biofeedback devices where 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 we are taking our instruments and where we are actually uh, asking them asking them to actually practice biofeedback and neurofeedback and everything so it is very uh, cost effective uh, aspect where we can not only study uh, the uh, you can say uh, the well being status but we can also evaluate and then we can also uh, do the interventions and uh, study the impact of that uh, that as well uh, this is uh, the scenario where uh, uh, one can, uh, you can say, the improve the research and uh, uh, outcome. So, uh, physiological outcomes of positive activities, there are so many um, outcomes. And as I have mentioned earlier, that uh, we have to test the interventions like uh, uh, neurobiological uh, aspects and exercise aspects, the uh, other interventions, and not to mention um, the um, as, uh, aspects where we are talking about the psychological, but uh, uh, the intervention uh, like uh, writing protocols, uh, emotional writing, uh, you can say expressive writing, uh, you can say uh, the, these are all, all, all cost effective. You can say the uh, exercises where we can do in daily life. Uh, there are so many yoga exercises. There are so many meditations. The regular exercise are like walking, like swimming, as Shamoon talked about, expose, exposure to nature. Uh, then there are so many other interventions as well. And I, I'm talking about this instrument thing. So biofeedback and everything where you are, you are actually watching yourself uh, doing uh, uh, what is your heart rate, what is your breathing pattern and how you can improve it by looking at your breathing pattern. Uh, you can also do that listening to music, uh, uh, listening to music and then there are so many other things uh, you can improve uh, yourself with. Taking together the diverse body of diverse body of neuroscientific evidence uh, actually explore the uh, impact of many other uh, interventions. And we can amazingly uh, reshape the brains and we can amazingly uh, change the uh, mindsets and improve our well-being. One way to enhance well-being is to address the rising tide of chronic stress, uh, as anxiety, depression, and uh, uh, the first ever study that we have done in Pakistan under the HEC um, uh, project. And then we have uh, developed a scale as well, Pakistan First Stress Scale, which is also uh, uh, with the uh, um, co-authorship of me and uh, Shamoon. So uh, we developed Pakistan first stress scale as well. But uh, uh, we have to do a lot with reference to not only the identification of the stress and then the chronic stress is there, anxiety is there, depression is there. We also have to identify that what negative impact it is making on the life and well-being of an increasing number of people uh, nationally and then internationally. Another way to engage the activity, the positive impact is, is to bring people uh, aware, uh, keeping people aware or making people aware about their symptoms, about what's wrong with their bodies and with their brain and physically engaging and mentally engaging themselves their selves into produce physical changes and physiological changes in their body or you can say psychophysiological changes in their body because we know that these striking changes uh, can bring the structural functional and communication changes in the brain regions and support the well-being helping us to be very happier or healthier lives the focus is not being only healthy the focus is being very emotionally balanced because both emotions are necessary we know that as physiologists we know that as psychophysiologists that the emotions are necessary so well-being might be enhanced through training and future research should be uh, done 
in uh, further to tap the areas where what are the potential effect in terms of the interventions what are the potential areas where we can work on what are the potential factors that are actually uh, shifting us from well being to ill being and what is actually the difference between the ill being and well being and what is actually the well being where we can produce changes with long lasting consequences so that we can in totality we can work together and move forward so understanding the psychological alteration and can inform the effective approaches is one of the best approach where we can uh, nurture the mind and uh, self as well so uh, next please so this is my message where uh, you can say that uh, there are so many things uh, we can do but what we can do with us is that we should try to be well we should try to work well and we should try to uh live well but uh we should also try to work as a psychophysiologist on how to do this these three things and where should we strike so as a as a psychophysiologist this was my take and last slide please this is my invitation to all of you that as a director of uh, center of health and well being university of karachi i would like to invite you all to participate in this first annual well being symposium that we are hosting on 22nd of december and it is one of the effort uh, uh, by uh, us in university of karachi to develop this uh, whole uh, center of health and well being for the well being of our uh staff and students and then uh, connect it with the uh, well being of the whole uh, uh community and uh, th this is there is also a poster competition and there is also panel discussions uh, the topics are all domains of well being there is occupational well being physical well being intellectual well being spiritual emotional and social well being so if you li like to question uh, uh anything from the presentation or uh, for the for the for the conference you can contact ms ojala so she will answer after the conference thank you so much thank you i'm actually i'm actually drowned in this talk <laughs> dr sadab this was so impressive this was so impressive it has so much so many lessons like if it, if ajala you allow me i would like to say something sure ma'am you can okay thank you so so i would like to say that uh, my take home from uh, dr sadar's talk uh, is that uh, there is actually a dire need for the incorporation of a preventive medicine module like university of lahore has recently incorporated a module on preventive medicine because when we ask the doctors uh, in oral examination that what prevention would you uh, uh, advise to the patient beside medicine the answer is again medicine so <laughs> so medicine is not the treatment for everything and there must be some complementary medicine and there must be some advice and there should be counseling which is very effective and there is uh, personal and trainment which is very important so there should be workshops on personal and trainment that i would also like to offer in your future conferencing Uh, conferences and workshops like how to be a happier person and uh, uh, the students can be taught uh, uh, such counseling techniques by workshops and by observed ospi stations with involvement of uh, role play or uh, uh, dealing with the subject surya rehman therapy one of my friends uh, associate professor dr zainab has personally used this uh, technique of surya rehman therapy to get rid of uh, her very bad uh, postnatal depression and she succeeded uh, mindful walking like you mentioned mindfulness exercises yoga these all things are very very helpful and uh, it depends that uh, you make a heaven out of hell or you make a hell out of heaven it depends on the person and it depends on uh, us as uh, uh, educators and as researchers to teach the future doctors that there is uh, there is there, there is much to do Uh, in this uh, kind of things and we can always build their capacity so that they they do not uh, fall uh, down but they rise after every fall uh, so this was my take and uh, th this also this also reminds me of uh, 
beautiful quote by Khalil Gibran when you were saying that both the emotions are important. Khalil Gibran also endorses Dr. Sadaf and says that I would not exchange the laughter of my heart for the fortunes of the multitudes, nor would I be content with converting my tears invited by my agonized self into calm. It is my fervent hope that my whole life on this earth will ever be tears and laughter, tears that purify my heart and reveal to me the secret of life and its mystery, laughter that brings me closer to my fellow men, tears with which I join the broken-hearted laughter that symbolizes joy over my very existence. I dedicate it to you, Dr. Sadar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, this was this was just an effort to uh, explain uh, the potential researchers who are actually uh, an academician who are actually attending this conference and via this conference that we have a whole domain and this is like very low cost effective very very cost effective and very uh, you can say effort effortless uh, act where we can we can contribute to science and where, where we can contribute to overall health. Because as Dr. Samina said, we always uh, uh, actually prefer to take medicine. We, we actually prefer to get diagnosed, but we never want to change these little things which have high impact on our brain and body. These like uh, someone someone wrote in the in the comment section as well that thank you for mentioning the gratitude, uh, even a gratitude, even even a smile, even even your even your environment, even your even your small gesture can change a lot of synapses and lot of connection in your brain, and that has impact on your digestive system, that has impact on your heart, that has impact on your skin uh, blood flow, that has impact on every every cell of your body. So we can we can improve things, but uh, we have to do three the, three of these things. One to incorporate these uh, lessons and incorporate these uh, things in our curriculum, as we did in Department of Physiology recently. We have incorporated uh, these uh, uh, courses in Department of Physiology, University of Karachi, with for our final year students, and they will be now discussing all this, uh, and they and they will all be learning from those courses. And then second, we have to do research on these uh, important aspects. And third, we need to incorporate them in policies and in practice and in our lives as well. Certainly, Thank that so would much. be a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Sadaf. I would like to ask Dr. Zafar for his few words. I expected a good presentation from Dr. Uh, as expected, uh, Dr. Sadaf has uh, justified the our presentation uh, and telling all, all the aspects very, very well. Um, well, uh, uh, in, in general, uh, starting from the indicators of healthy age by Dr. Uh, Fezan, um, uh, no doubt uh, he has uh, also made a very ex excellent effort uh, in presenting what is required. Uh, so is the case with the Dr. Uh, Shamoon, uh, who was talking about the nature-based. Uh, again, the factors uh, that uh, not only the awareness, but the persistence of uh, making the uh, all all those habits and all those uh, and, uh, remedies uh, and and uh, and working for them for uh, to make the uh, really achieving well being um, uh, as far as uh, uh, ma'am is concerned uh, dr sadaf has uh, really uh, given a very detailed and good account um, uh, this is really very, very, and uh, with the um, achievement. Once, once somebody has a goal, and once he has the success, so that success also determines the the how how much uh, he will be remain uh, good and live good and uh, work good. Uh, uh, this is also a very, very good, good presentation. Thanks. 
Thank you, Dr. Zafar. Uh, now, without uh, wasting any time, we move to our next three paper session. Uh, I would like to welcome Ms. Yusra Saleem, moderator for the session. Ms. Yusra, over to you. Thank you so much, Ujala. Uh, with that, we are moving to our next uh, free paper session. And for that, I will be inviting our chair and co-chair of the session. Our chair is uh, Professor Dr. Zia Muhyiddin, and uh, the co-chair will be Mohammad Bilal Siddiqui. Uh, Dr. Zia Muhyiddin is a scholar with his principal interest in biomedical electronical engineering. His exploration and research work during the course included analog and digit, uh, digit uh, circuit design. Uh, he designed and implemented low power battery operated biomedical devices like EEG, EOG and uh, neural spike detector. He has been serving as in charge of biomedical engineering department at Sir Sayyid University and then he is now currently involved with uh, Air University Islamabad as uh, head of department biomedical engineering. Dr. Zia has been involved in uh, many research projects for biomedical devices and neural amplifiers and electrical neural stimulation. His knowledge and his skill in designing brain devices make him an expert in the field. With that, we have with us the co-chair, Dr. Mohammad Bilal Siddiqui. Uh, he's a PhD scholar with his uh, area of interest in maternal and child health epidemiology and policy. He's associated with Zebest at the moment, and he's the director research of child, child health registry of Pakistan in collaboration with Health Advocacy Council for Women and Children. Uh, Dr. Bilal is also a consultant and uh, head of the Center for Maternal and Child Health uh, Research Division at Advanced Education Institute and Research Center. And he's a recipient of various national and international research grants to identify reasons and solutions increasing maternal and child mortality in urban slums. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zia Muhyiddin and Dr. Bilal for joining us today. With that, I will like to announce for the first oral presentation that would be carried on by Ms. Sidra Muhyiddin. Sidra, are you with us? Hello, assalamu alaikum. Okay. okay, so the title of the presentation is Morris Elba, A Ray of Hope for Mental Illnesses. Sidra Muhyiddin, over to you. You can start now. Sidra, you can share your screen. Uh, I'm trying. I'm sorry. I'm I'm not used to Zoom. This is like one of the you know few attempts. I'm so sorry. Okay, it's a green green button in the middle of your screen says share screen. Share yes. Then. Then you need to choose the window that on which your presentation is. Uh, are we, uh, Sidra, can we move on to our next presenter till the time you display your presentation and uh, get in touch with it? Okay, maybe I'll try uh, like after the other one. Like I can okay. be the next one maybe. Okay, are if we that's having okay. with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's perfectly fine. Are we having Thank with you. us, uh, uh, Miss Aksa Saad, for awareness symptoms and stigma for multiple sclerosis and neurological disorders in general? The second oral presentation from University of Karachi. Aksa, Aksa, are you with us? Okay, uh, maybe Aksa is not with us right now. Momal, are you are you available right now? Momal Ahmed. Okay, Momal, uh, the topic of presentation is poor familial sleep hygiene practices, sleep deprivation, and effect on cognitive psychology and physical health of adult population of Karachi, a cross-sectional study. Momal Ahmed, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Momal, we can hear you. All right, perfect. So I will just go ahead and share the screen. Um, okay. All right, so my name is Momal. I'm a fourth year medical student at SMC, JSMU. 
And our topic for research was uh, poor familial sleep hygiene practices, which lead to sleep deprivation and the effects of sleep deprivation on cognitive psychology and physical health of adult population of uh, Karachi, which was a cross-sectional study. So some of the key words in the research are sleep hygiene. Uh, sleep hygiene refers to the habits and practices that are uh, conducive to sleeping well on a regular basis. Then the next one is sleep deprivation, which uh, means inadequate sleep and that uh, causes many cognitive and health deficits. The next one is cognition, which is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and senses. So um, as an introduction, this the purpose of this research was to find the link between familial sleep hygiene practices and its co-relationship with physical and mental health. And it is an important area of study because um, Poor sleep hygiene leads to sleep deprivation. Uh, sleep deprivation is directly related to poor cognitive function, grouchy mood, decreased memory, anxiety, decreased alertness, body aches, sore eyes, and low energy. So this was seen uh, across researches, and this was also the primary goal of investigation. That is, is that true? That was the first thing. And then also investigating what are the sleeping patterns of many families uh, in Karachi. So again, uh, as I said earlier, the purpose of the study was to investigate if poor sleep hygiene practices are causing sleep deprivation, the effects of sleep deprivation on cognition and physical health. Materials and methods, this cross-sectional study uh, a questionnaire-based study was carried out in six medical colleges in Karachi, JSMU, DUHS, Liaquat National Medical College, Ziauddin University, Jinnah Medical and Dental College, and Fatma Jinnah Dental College. The questionnaire was filled in by 350 adults. Some of the study variables included uh, the determinants of good sleep hygiene, which were duration of sleep, the schedule for sleep, caffeine intake, daytime naps, quiet or dark room. Uh, then the late, uh, late working hours uh, due to a parent's job or if the students were working or any of the adults in the family were working for later hours. The late use of electronic devices, uh, which we all know is a very, um, it, it's a very common thing in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. Some of the study variables in cognitive psychology were, um, that were affected by sleep deprivation were alertness, the concentration span, comprehension ability, distractedness, low mood or mood swings, irritability, and depression. Uh, under physical health, uh, the main variables that were investigated were palpitations, aches or pains, particular sicknesses uh, and anxiety. So the data analysis, was, the data was analyzed using SPSS version 20. T-test, chi-square, ANOVA uh, were used for the data analysis. A p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant in case of comparative analysis. So the results that we got uh, in this uh, research study were that the majority of the particip participants said that they were not aware of or do not practice proper sleep hygiene practices leading to sleep deprivation. Participants stated that their reasons for lack of proper sleep hygiene were late dinner, which gave us a p-value of 0.02, which is very significant and shows us that many, many people in Karachi do have late dinner that causes them to sleep less, less number of hours. Uh, leading to sleep deprivation, and that comes under the umbrella of poor sleep hygiene. Then, using social media, media or watching television, which was uh, the which was the case with twenty eight point six percent of the adult population, or studying, which was uh, seen in forty percent of the individuals. With regards to psychological and cognitive effects of poor sleep hygiene practices, more than seventy six percent participants reported to feeling sleep deprived, and experienced mood swings were irritable. 75% of the people said that they were irritable due to sleep deprivation and they were forgetful. So 60% of them were forgetful, 62% were distracted and 56% stated that they felt low if they were sleep deprived on, on a given day. The alert concentration span, 
which was seen in 64% of the adults. And 38% um, said that their ability to deal with challenging situations decreases uh, on a given day when they are sleep deprived. In terms of the effects on physical health, participants reported headache to be the most common symptom, which was reported by 66.7% of the population, followed by backache, which was seen in 32.5% of the, of the population, sore eyes seen in 28.9%, and lastly, shoulder pain, which was seen in 26.5% of the people. So in conclusion, <clears throat> So in conclusion, we understand that our physical health, mood, and performance on important tasks can be greatly improved by proper sleep practices. Longer duration of sleep along with good sleep hygiene practices ensure a better lifestyle. Unfortunately, this is prevalent among the, uh, among the adults of Pakistan, this the poor sleep hygiene practices. And our aim is to educate the masses by sharing the information ga gathered in this research to prevent the unnecessary mental or physical health problems and ensure a happier and better quality of life. So just in the end, this is a very nice picture that uh, gives us the do's and don'ts for good sleep practices. So some of the things that we need to avoid are heavy food, blue light, which comes from the phone screens, alcohol, smoking, caffeine, heart training, and stress. And some of the good things are getting up at the same time, a comfortable bed, a bedtime routine, a dark sleeping room, avoiding your phone, and uh, eating two hours earlier uh, before going to bed. So that wraps up my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Momal. It was very nice and short. Uh, but before moving on to our next presentation, I would like to announce that all the presenters must be uh, available online even after their presentations because we will be taking the question and answers by the end of this session. So please be available online. Okay, with that, uh, moving on to our next presentation. Aksa, are you with us? Aksa? Yes, I can start. Okay, so this is Aksa Saad. Uh, she will be talking on awareness, symptoms, and stigma for multiple sclerosis and neurological dis uh, disorders in general. Aksa, over to you. Okay, so hello everyone. This is um, Aksa Saad from Department of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Karachi. Today I'm coming with the topic Awareness, Symptoms and Stigma for Multiple Sclerosis and Neurological Disorders in General. So let's get started. So once before moving and indulging with the background and effects that why, why the study was conducted, let's get started with the facts and the some prevalences of the multiple sclerosis and neurological disorders in general. So according to WHO, the stigma associated with the neurological disorders as the social and economic burden with the stigmatization and to seek the treatment of hoping to avoid the negative and social consequences of diagnosis. So when we share the facts and the prevalence of a neurological disorders in a general population that leading cause of a day, the ALYS, uh, 276 million people and, and it, summing up and burdening up, burdening up every year without any awareness and with the lack of awareness and uh, education in the masses. Next is the background of the study that why this study was conducted. So <clears throat> The incomprehension of people regarding any health issues reflects hating burden of health crisis and it just it goes and goes increasing with every year and uh, um, later when I will uh, share you with the results and things then you will get a better idea that why I'm talking about this, the, uh, why it is increasing the burden of a health crisis in a society. The significant inequalities, stigma, and discrimination has fostered increased potential of unawareness regarding neurological disorders in the masses. So objectives, we had a very prime factors there in which we are focusing. The evaluation of a sample perception regarding multiple sclerosis, mainly 
but about the perception of our participants and of how they see multiple sclerosis, what the symptoms they do they understand or not, the symptoms associated in neurological disorders in general, and awareness, and also the stigmatization to stop the stigma and how the uh, rationale behind the insecurity and constraints uh, suffer experiences and what the people uh, think about it. So, um, as you can see, the, we disseminated the questionnaires among people. It was an e-survey, and uh, we had um, uh, participants, one, well, 108 participants we had. The study was conducted among the majority of students and professionals from various uh, circles of life. We had a, a pool of a, a majority of undergraduate and graduate students, teachers, parents, working and non-working individuals. The questionnaire was disseminated among students, 79.6%. Teachers were 13%. Parents were 11.1%, who's 9.6% serving as an educationist. So that's a, a summing up as a 108 participants overall with working and non-working individuals, 3.6% to, to focus primarily on response towards a neurological disorder and understanding of a multiple sclerosis and assessment of associated stigmas with it. So the results we obtained were, <clears throat> when we asked how often you have heard about it, the neurological, uh, neuro uh, sorry, and neurological disorders and as well as multiple sclerosis. When participants were asked and how frequently they have heard about the people talking about neurological disorders and their understanding. The 60.1% participants concurred that to the fact that they have heard very less, while 9.3% never heard, they said. So, and uh, going to specific, when we ask about the multiple sclerosis, when they were asked about the multi uh, term multiple sclerosis, exactly how often you have heard or that, the 47.2% uh, said that very, they heard very less, and 37% uh, said that they have never heard. And these are some of the stats with it. So um, when we talk about the symptoms, the symptomatic awareness of how they see multiple sclerosis and the symptoms uh, they know or they do or do not know. So and asking about the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, 50.9% associate the vision problems, numbness, fatigue, weakness, dizziness, all the um, main, the primary symptoms, the cognitive problems and tingling as a quite normal, usual things. They were they were thinking that it's it's normal thing that person can experience in a day-to-day -day life, or there may be other reasons not going specific to a neurological disorders because there is a reluctant, the people are reluctant to say that, no, uh, these things cannot associate us towards any disease, specifically if it is a mental disorder. So it's a Kind of huge thing to think or say. While a majority of a 63% participants found unsatisfied with a double a link of a double uh, vision and blurred vision and vision problems with a multiple sclerosis and that. <clears throat> so after that, we uh, talked about the hurdles in a treatment of a mental illnesses like the stigmas associated and constraints. So on asking the first thought that comes to the mind upon hearing mental disorder, it showed a quite bizarre and predicted both set of our reviews where majority used to associate it with stress, depression, emotional problems and trauma and few interpreting it as some sort of abnormality. And at point we, uh, to be noted it, and the, there was 9.3% participants told that they have multiple sclerosis patient in their friends and family. And lastly, we asked to categorize the main hurdles in treatment of a mental illness according to their um, thought, what they perceive. So results received as 24.1% said that a stereotypical mindset is behind the treatment, the, her, the main hurdle as a treatment of uh, mental illnesses, 11.1% said fear or rejection. Fear so of rejection three minutes and 8.3% okay. uh, uh, say that the fear of isolation, while 546 believe that all three as a main constraints in the treatment of a patient with a mental illness when he comes up and he has all the things in his mind and that stops or constrain him for, for the treatment and uh, receive some verbal suggestions and some advice uh, to regarding the importance of a mental uh, awareness and advancement that can be incorporated in a society for a better awareness and education. <clears throat> so after all this uh, the data regarding the 
um, education and awareness of people masses and uh, symptoms of multiple sclerosis, the uh, constraints, the stigma, the stereotypical mindset or the hurdles we can say people think behind the treatment or the awareness, all the three or four things that we focused completely on. So we can conclude that aforementioned results that adequate education regarding mental health should be incorporated at educational institutes to give the better outlook of condition because once we were talking about the multiple sclerosis people uh, didn't know about uh, some have heard the term on social media very some very few people and while other were very they didn't even know about that and we, you can see that we had a very a huge majority of educational people belonging to the educational institute students teacher and parents so they didn't have the idea of uh, symptoms and awareness of the disease. So resources in this regard are crossly inadequate to train the population in handling and tackling mental illness with acceptability, not only a specific one disease, but there is there's a huge burden of diseases if we have. So with other non-communicable conditions, neurological disorders, advocating policies and programs should be increased for the better health provision. Through this, we can foster a healthy society where sufferers won't be reluctant in sharing and will be dealt with dignity and empathy rather than commented as a misfortunes or a misfit. So here are some references. Thank you. So that's all about my presentation and uh, you can ask questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Aksa. Aksa, question and answer session will be by the end of the session. So please kindly wait. Uh, okay, with okay, that, we you. are moving to our next presentation that will be given by Ms. Habiba Rashid. Uh, on muscarinic uh, receptor role in episodic memory retrieval in mouse model of stress. Habiba, are you with us? Assalamualaikum. Yes, I'm with you. I have started screen share. Please tell me if you can see my screen. It is, it is just starting up. We cannot see it right now. Okay, let me check it again. Uh, now has it, it is started visible. now? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Dr. Habiba Rashid, and uh, I'm working as assistant professor at Khyber Medi Medical University, Peshawar. Today, I'm going to share a few of my experiments I did during my PhD. The title of today's talk is Muscarinic Receptor Role in Episodic Memory Retrieval in Mouse Model of Stress. Starting with episodic memory and memory retrieval, uh, as we all know that episodic memory is a type of long-term memory which is associated with all the things we do in our daily lives and all these things which we consciously recall. Uh, memory retrieval is the ability of utilizing information which is acquired in the past to make decisions and actions in present, present and thus it makes vital uh, for the survival of humans and animals. The brain circuitry involved in episodic memory formation and retrieval is majorly the hippocampus. Uh, the diagram here is showing the flow of information during memory encoding and retrieval. Gray arrows are showing the flow of information, new information uh, from neocortical regions to the hippocampus via anterior cortex. Here the information is stored, consolidated, means the short-term memory is transferred into the long-term memory. And also the retrieval, if you, the person or the animal comes across the same situation which he has already been through. So these the similar sig signals will be identified in the hippocampus and retrieval process will be initiated which is shown by the black arrows. So hippocampus is the main region of interest for episodic memory formation, consolidation and retrieval. Uh, there are many factors which are linked with episodic memories. First is the main neurotransmitter system, which is the cholinergic neurotransmitter system that plays a key role in formation, storage, and recall of episodic memories. Most of the studies were conducted on the role of muscarinic receptors, which is a subtype of cholinergic receptors on memory formation and storage, but um, the retrieval part was not much explored. Uh, moreover, Memory in terms of episodic memories, may gender play an important role as male perform better in certain type of episodic memory tasks while female perform better in the other ones. Spe specifically, males perform better in spatial memories involving the navigation and female in emotional memories and the object-related memories. 
So the first part of his study was to find an association between muscarinic receptors and gender in episodic memory retrieval. And second part was to find the role of stress in association with these two variables to identify it with memory retrieval as a stress itself is associated with uh, various cognitive impairments and is a starting factor of various neurological disorders. The type of stressor and the stage of memory during which the stress is exposed uh, either enhances the memory or impairs the memory. So the hypothesis of this study was that if the involvement of muscarinic receptors in memory retrieval depends on gender, then blocking these receptors before test will differentially affect retrieval in male and female subjects under different conditions that is psychological, uh, physiological, and the stress condition. Uh, for to identify the role of gender with muscarinic receptors, we divided BELPC mice into four male and four female groups. The control groups were not given any treatment, while the treatment groups were given scopolamine as muscarinic receptor antagonist, scopolamine and donepezil as muscarinic antagonist, and donepezil is the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, which increases the amount of acetylcholine in the synapse and MLA and DH beta E drugs were given as antagonist of nicotinic receptors. The study design comprised of 12 days. Five days were the training days in which the memory formation was performed without any treatment. Then a subchronic treatment regime was followed by uh, administering subcutaneous injections of respective drugs in their groups, and memory retrieval was performed on day 12. Two behavior tests were conducted. First was the Morris water maze test, which is standard for identifying hippocampal function during spatial memory formation and navigation. The test was performed in a circular pool uh, containing a platform submerged in opaque water. And uh, the uh, site in which the platform was located it was termed as target quadrant. And uh, three parameters were recorded for memory retrieval, which will be uh, shown in the results. And for fair memory, animals were trained in a specific arena and given with a conditional stimulus of tone co-terminated with a foot shock, which is the unconditional stimulus. Animal received the context of the chamber in which the foot shock was given and the tone with the uh, incoming aversive response and show a uh, freezing response, which is measured as their fear. Freezing is the inability to show any body movement other than the respiratory movement. And a fair retrieval was recorded during the context session in which no tone or foot shock was given and only the freezing was recorded. So under physiological conditions, we found that uh, the fig graph on left side of the figure uh, screen is showing that scopolamine uh, administration in male tend to reduce the fair recall, but not to significant level. However, the administration of donepezil reverses this effect significantly compared to scopolamine, thus showing a relationship of muscarinic activity in fair recall in, ma in main male subjects by enhancing the recall. But a contrasting effect was found in females, where co-administration of scopolamine and donepezil significantly impaired fair recall. Thus, subchronic muscarinic modulation differently affect fair recall in male and female subjects. Second, the spatial memory retrieval was assessed by recording time spent in the target quadrant, number of entries in the target quadrants, and the number of platform locations in the target quadrant. During the test session, we removed the platform and allowed the animal to explore the pool and uh, crosses over. If the memory is intact, it will Crossed, crossed over the platform location more in search of the platform. Dr. So Amiga, we, found... we have short of time. Please quickly go through okay. the results okay. and move to the conclusion. Okay. Uh, so the muscarinic antagonism impaired spatial memory recall in male. No effect was found in female, thus showing a gender dimorphic effect. Then we developed a stress model by inducing, uh, placing a subchronic stress in the animal using the uh, restrained stress. And we found that stress did not cause any impairment of fair memory in male subject, showed a slight reduction in females, while donepezil administration significantly enhanced the stress-induced fair impairment in both subjects, showing a role of muscarinic receptors and stress in uh, fair recall. 
Moreover, for a spatial memory retrieval, we did not find any association of stress or muscular activity in females, while in males, uh, stress impaired spatial memory recall, but no effect of muscular modulation altered the effect of stress in male subjects. Uh, this, uh, from this study, we concluded that male and female mice differently recruit muscarinic receptor under variable conditions for retrieving emotional memories. Spatial memory was not affected in female under uh, all the retrieval conditions and stress induced impaired fair retrieval in male and female was reversed by muscarinic activation. Uh, these are the future prospects of the study. Uh, the most important thing is we currently do not know the underlying mechanism of this gender dimorphic effect of memory retrieval and its association with muscarinic receptors and stress pathways. So this needs to be evaluated in our future studies. Uh, finally, I will acknowledge, first of all, Almighty Allah for uh, enabling me to conduct this study, and then Dr. Zaheer Ahmed, Associate Professor from NUST, who supervised this study, NUST and a Higher Education Commission. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abiba. It was very nice talk. Uh, with that, we are moving towards our next uh, oral presentation that will be given by Ms. Rabia Munawar on neuropharmacological effect of Vigna uh, Angulata and Fasilus vulgaris on depression model. Rabia, are you, are you with us? Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I am. I'm sharing my screen. Thank you. Okay, okay, sure. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, today the topic of my oral presentation is neuropharmacological effects of Vigna angulata and faceless vulgaris on depression model. First, I would like to introduce the authors of this research. This research is conducted by me, Rabia Manavar, associated with Jinnah Sin Medical University as a lecturer. And I'm supervised by Dr. Rahila Ikram, who is Dean of Salim Habib University and Dr. Sana Sarfaraz, who is affiliated with Department of Pharmacy, University of Karachi. And I must say she is a great supervisor. So now coming towards the introduction of my topic, uh, as we all know that depression is a rigorous medical condition that affects feeling, thinking, process and action or in simple words uh, we can say it is a depletion of uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin norepinephrine dopamine in central nervous system and uh, we uh, um, a small survey uh, suggested us that depression affects about one in every 15 person and one out of every six person, which is 16.6 .6 person will suffer from depression at some point of his or her life. Uh, normally the behavior changes in depression can relate to alteration in hippocampal function. A variety of inputs uh, to the hippocampus can affect mood, including norepinephrine as we as I already said, serotonin, cortisol, these all factors actually elevated stress. And these are th uh, thought to act through activation neurotrophins such as BDNF. Uh, recent developments in neuroscience have improved our understanding of the pharmacological foundation of medical treatments for depressive disorders. Dietary supplements are demonstrating neurological advantages in human life. Uh, now coming towards uh, the intro of my uh, beans, uh, which I have taken for this research. Uh, number one, uh, bean is faceless vulgaris, which is also known as kidney bean. Uh, it belongs to the family Fabaceae. Kidney beans are a high source of dietary fibers, which helps to reduce cholesterol. It also contains uh, vitamins, uh, minerals like uh, iron and zinc, pro uh, proteins, and it is very beneficial because it also contains isoleucins, phenols, catechins, which are uh, beneficial for maintaining health. Um, my second uh, bean is Vigna angulata, which is also uh, generally known as white beans or cow, cow beans. And they are belongs to, again, family Fabaceae. They are rich in protein, vitamins, minerals, flavonoids, tannin, isoleucine, lysine, etc. 
um healthy diets uh, actually uh, we all know that healthy diet indicate high consumption of vegetables fruit fish whole grains etc and these all can um, minor the depressive symptoms uh, as the all uh, other cross sectional studies indicated now i am coming towards the methodology of my research uh, we we have purchased um, beans from the local market which are then washed and rinsed properly uh, then these beans are boiled separately and dried the dried beans are then ground to the powder form and then we prepare pellets for uh, these beans uh, in our methodology we have took uh, 60 albino reds uh, uh, 60 albino reds and we have considered group 1 uh, as a control in which we have uh, taken 10 reds and we have given distilled water and standard diet to them. In group two, we, uh, we have give, uh, take, um, taken as a treated group in which we have given five milligram uh, uh, per kg white beans. In group three, we have give, uh, given five milligram red beans. And in group four, we have given thousand milligram white beans and group five, we have given thousand milligram red beans and group six is considered as a standard in which we have given floxacetine 20 milligram per kg. The study is conducted for 60 days and uh, we have uh, done the four swimming test on day 0, 7, 15, 45 and 60. And after uh, a 68 day reading, we, we dissect uh, the reds and uh, uh, withdrawn the hippocampus for histology, uh, histo histopathological assessment. All the data is assessed on SPSS 22. Now coming towards the result part. Our result in the, uh, as we can see, our results are indicating with the comparison of control. Um, Rabia, you have three minutes more. All right, all right. I'll try to continue, uh, conclude it. On 68th day, we have seen a significant difference uh, in all the groups, including the standard, which is highly significant. And on second number, we can see significance of 500 white beans and 1,000 red beans. And if we also see in this uh, graph that uh, when we compare red and white beans, so we have seen that there's a high significance between uh, red beans, 1,000 red beans, and 500 white beans. Now coming to uh, coming towards the histopatho histological assessment of hippocampus of reds. In this, uh, we can easily see that uh, the pyramidal layer in CA3 region has focal reduction in all the groups. And we have also observed that apoptotic cells are reduced in 1,000 red beans and 500 white beans. Oh, uh, coming, to, uh, coming towards the discussion, uh, beans are good contributor of micronutrient that we all know. They are significant source of iron, zinc, copper, and um, aluminum minerals. Our result indicated that the struggling time of rats is, uh, is uh, increased by in the presence of um, in red beans, which is showing the presence of zinc. Uh, zinc, when attached to its uh, receptors, uh, which are GPR39, it activates the downstream cyclic MP response element, which is dependent on the gene transcription, resulting in high levels of BDNF. And we have also seen that faceless vulgaris contain melatonin, which helps in reducing apoptosis in hippocampus. Vigna angulata contain tryptophan, and we all know that tryptophan is uh, used to uh, use in the synthesis of serotonin neurotransmitter, and which is uh, which in, increase the mood elevation and improve the confidence and ultimately reduce the depression. These are the references of uh, my research. Thank you so much. Rabia, thank you so much, Dr. Rabia. With that, we are moving to our next presentation by uh, Ms. Sidra Muyuddin on Morris Alpa, a ray of hope for mental illnesses. Sidra? Uh, your presentation will be controlled by Ms. Ujala. Please continue. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. The topic of my presentation is Morris Alba, which I believe is a ray of hope for mental illnesses. Next, please. Uh, it is a phyto. Uh, it is believed that phytochemical enriched plant extracts are highly used as traditional medicines to cure many different ailments. 
uh, talking about this one, which is also known as mulberry, it has over 150 species, among which Morris alba is the dominant one. Uh, a very brief introduction to it is a, it is a deciduous tree belonging to the family Moraceae, which is used for sericulture to feed the silk worm for silk production. Next. The white pattern of distribution of this plant shows that it can grow in a variety of climatic regions, soil conditions, and topographical uh, conditions, including Asia, Europe, Africa, North and South America. It can grow at altitude as high as 4,000 meters. In Pakistan, it is cultivated in Gilgit, Baltistan, including Hunza, Skirdu, Astor, and Gilgit City. Next. Uh, the chemical composition of mulberry uh, includes flavones, triterpenes, crude proteins, about 25%, amino acids, carbohydrates, fats, among which linoleic acid, palmitic, and oleic acid are the uh, major ones. It has fibers, minerals, including phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, sodium, ferrous, copper, magne manganese, and zinc. Uh, it has uh, fiber, alkaloids, vitamins, including vitamin A, C, and E. It includes flavonoids like polyphenols, carotenoids, anthocyanins. It has um, the active ingredients are moranolin, moran, cyanidin 3 glucopyranoside, quercetin, rutinoside. It has chemphirol, quanon S, cyclomulberin, cyclomorysin. It has genstein, which is a very important constituent. Next, please. Uh, health impact of mulberry, uh, the main mechanism of its beneficial use is the antioxidant effect that it uh, offers. According to many studies, uh, Morris Alba has high medicinal and nutritional value, including neuroprotective effects. This effect is due to the presence of cyanidin 3 glucopyranoside, which is present in the fruit extract. It contributes in neuroprotective effect on neuronal cell damage, which was found in a study that was induced by hydrogen peroxide causing uh, OGD oxygen glucose uh, deprivation. The fruit extract was found to inhibit cerebral ischemic damage. Uh, the tree leaves are known to possess antidepressant effects and cognition enhancing effects at much higher doses, it can be a sedative and it can alter muscle strength. Next, please. The fruit of mulberry can improve oxidative stress and it can enhance densities of cholinergic neuron in the hippocampus. Uh, it consists of zinc, about 50.2 milligram. All these were found to be isolated and separated by HPLC, which is high performance liquid chromatographical method. Zinc along with vitamin A, if taken uh, in mulberry, it improves long-term memory and it results in high uh, nerve growth factor in, which was uh, in a study of about three months on mice, laboratory mice. The study, verified, the study was verified by radial arm maze. The vitamin E in mulberry, it causes increase in neuronal cell size and volume in lab rats in in the CA1 pyramidal layer of hippocampus with improvement in behavior, which was also verified in a study by Ymaze. Next, ascorbic Sidra, acid is also there. we have short of time, so please uh, keep it quick and short as possible. Okay, I'm trying, thanks. Ascorbic acid uh, was isolated from the fruit. It improves morphological and functional recovery of degenerated peripheral nerves including neurons, Schwann cells, and macrophages. It speeds up the exon regrowth, density size, and remyelination of exon in injured nerves. Genstein is a major active ingredient it, in mulberry fruit. It helps regulate neuro neurotrophic factors found in, the, in a cultured rat astrocyte study. Astrocyte secretes uh, neurotrophic factors in brain. These factors included glial-derived nerve uh, neuro neurotrophic factor and BDNF. Riboflavin was also there, 0 0.088 milligram was isolated, and uh, it can also be used in Parkinson's, my, Parkinson's disease, migraine, and other uh, such neurological disorders. Similarly, niacin was also isolated, 
and uh, one of the things that amazed me was that 100 mg per kg mulberry leaf extract was found to be as equally effective to close a pain which is an antipsychotic and can is basically used as a last resort in treating schizophrenia and uh, it was mentioned in uh, an article uh, immortal musings in 2014 next please okay methods uh the methods that were used were um sorry the uh, to find the uh, objective was to find changes in cognition uh, learning ability behavior anxiolytic and antidepressant effects tests were performed at the pharmacological lab at the university of karachi after the approval by the ethical committee fresh mulberry was collected from hunza valley and they were sun dried for 48 hours packed and uh, traveled to karachi next extract of mulberry fruit was uh, prepared by maceration extraction and the stock solution was prepared uh, five groups of next piece five groups of 10 albino mice of mixed genders were given uh, water for injection in the second one they were given standard fluxetine or diazepam vari variable three different test groups were there all given uh, per orally for 30 days these uh, doses were uh, 7 mg per kg the second test group was given 12 mg per kg and the third one was given 16 mg per kg of the stock solution the first method was open field test um it's an open arena having nine equal squares mouse is kept in the middle of the field and familiarized with the arena and then we observe the number of squares covered rearing grooming number of entries in the center square uh, this is basically for um, testing anxiolytic activities locomotor activity and other such neuromuscular diseases next light and dark chamber in a box uh, uh, having two chambers uh, partitioned by an open door the time was taken in each one and the number of entries were also noted and this is also for anxiety related performance a uh, novel object recognition uh, is to evaluate cognition learning memory animal is uh, basically spends more time with a novel object as compared to a known one and uh, this one showed a uh, recognition new learning creation of memory short term memory uh, intermediate memory um it is also similar to the um, open field test next four swim test was performed having a um, water tank Uh, basically it it is to induce depression in the uh, animal and you should please can depression. you quickly move from the uh, methods and move towards the result okay fine um open field activity showed that the number of squares got decreased over time uh, of four weeks lesser anxiety more depression was observed rearing was uh, reduced Le uh, center square showed leaving center square showed willingness to escape grooming increase showing comfort and relaxed behavior so basically week 3 showed anxiolytic behavior but antidepressant effect was also observed uh, at week 4 light and dark transitions showed increased time spent in lit area showing anxiolytic effect less fear more comfort uh, normally mice tend to avoid uh, light areas novel object recognition also showed that time spent with the new object increased showing improvement in short term memory and sense of recognition four swim test showed uh, an increase in floating time showing anxiolytic effect of mulberry which uh, normally mice starts climbing to escape and then starts swimming or floating depending on the mood uh, all in all to conclude um, anxiety has affected almost one eighth of the global population therefore it's an important area of research in psychopharmacology mostly uh, doctors prescribe benzodiazepines which have very narrow safety uh, uh, narrow, narrow margin of safety mora salva is one of the most versatile and beneficial plants with least number of side effects it enhances memory cognition and improves motor skills it possesses anxiolytic as well as antidepressant effects both uh, in the north of pakistan these are consumed on daily basis which is one of the major factors in contributing longevity of lives Uh, due to its antioxidant capacity so we sh we should basically uh, advise everyone especially the younger and the uh, older adults that it should be taken as a supplement on daily basis uh, 
um as a you can just you know uh, supplement as a dessert as a confectionery so it has multiple beneficial uses thank you so much these are the references thank you thank you so much sidra thank you so much uh, with that we move on to our next presentation that will be given by asim mahmood on psychological impacts of covid 19 during and after lockdown on students of pre clinical years of medical education of a medical college uh, hello assalam alaikum am i audible yes yes you are audible okay so okay so uh, i am asim mahmood uh, i am from second year from shifa college of medicine islamabad so today the topic is uh, psychological impacts of covid 19 on the medical students uh, before and after the covid 19 lockdown uh, in my college which is shifa college of medicine islamabad so basically when i took a, a admission back in 2019 covid had already became a pandemic you know and life suddenly became um, to a stand still it come to a stand still and all the educational institutes were closed and the educational stuff had to be shifted online and with all these restrictions uh, my connection with the outside world was basically lost um, in itself and medical education is you know tough uh, but uh, without going to proper college and without seeing those cadaveric uh, demonstrations all the worries are just multiplied by the factor of the two so i became super depressed and then this uh, thought occurred to me that if i am going through this depression what uh, are the other factors and other depression that my fellow peers uh, are going are also going through it so i decided to, uh, to conduct a research and uh, i also decided to document all the findings that i get along the way so now coming towards the proper introduction of my research uh, so basically uh, after covid 19 there were isolation there were contact restrictions um there were economic shutdown which imposed um, a complete uh, change to world of the psychosocial environment in many countries and physical and mental sufferings uh, has a lot of potential to threaten the mental health of the students as well so the medical students uh, have faced uh, very serious psychological consequences of covid-19 pandemic and its uh, and its lockdown you know has affecting um, the mental health of uh, medical students uh, very specifically if we talk about so if we talk about the aim so the aim was to investigate uh, what is the current mental uh, health status of medical students um, during in the post lockdown uh, apart from that uh, what are the factors which are affecting the socio academic life of medical students so the methods we used uh, it was a conventional uh, data collection method uh, we uh, we used google uh, online google you know questionnaire forms Uh, we uh, opted for this method because um, we were not on going on campus and we have to you know we were isolated so we have to use the online uh, form for that and then um, we used all the information that was provided uh, to us as a source of data and then we used the latest sps software for data management and its analysis so coming towards the results and discussion so 76% of the students uh, did found, find that there were changes in their sleep cycles and 45.6% of the students faced insomnia during the lockdown so we also know that uh, during depression and uh, when someone's mental health is being affected sleep cycles are the one of the first change sleep cycles are one of the first indications um, that start to change and when they start to change we know that person is suffering mentally so sleep is one of the main indicator we know uh, of being mentally capable of doing uh, tasks but after the lockdown was uh, you know lifted 21% of the students felt felt the same like they did fa face insomnia after the lockdown uh, after the lockdown but um, i think seeing the trends there might be some time that things come to normal and this 21% will might go to uh, non existence number uh, after um, the you no know, the environment becomes normal as it was pre covid area uh then 40% of the students did admit that they uh, did stress eating in the lockdown but after the lockdown only 10% continued uh, the stress eating again this would go back to normal uh, once um, the things get back to normal 
so nine uh, if you talk about um, the you know there were a lot of rumors on the social media that there were certain myths that were social, created by the social media so uh, we uh, it was one of the objective uh, to find out that whether these um, you know myths are causing some depression in medical students or not so we found out that 9.6% of the students uh, were getting depressed by seeing these fake news on the social media uh, next is 18% of the students said feeling of loneliness anxiety and overthinking Uh, but after the lockdown this number has decreased significantly and they are feeling much better and then uh, 20% of the students uh, also thought of uh, doing harm to themselves uh, but this also this, but this number is also de declining as we are uh, moving away from the covid and covid is becoming an old news so in conclusion um, there was a very high pre prevalence of stress anxiety and depression but um, there has been seen uh, there, there is seen improvement in the mental and emotional health Uh, after the covid has been uh, okay so if you talk about the future so basically the ncoc has announced that there's a new variant of uh, covid or omicron uh, which might hit pakistan in like 10 days or so so uh, if that occurs the education education institutes uh, will go into lockdown again and if this happens then there will be um, again there will be serious psychological impacts on the medical students but this time these impacts uh, will hit the new batch of the medical uh, education that are coming in into the universities rather than the existing batches of the students okay. so there is a potential that um, the same effects will happen in the future so we have to take um, proper measures to avoid so so uh, thank you so much thank you thank you so much asim uh, now we have with us uh, taniyat faraz ahmed taniyat are you available right now Ah uh, yes, I am here. Okay, Dr. Daniel will be talking on plasma amyloid beta forty two and phosphorylated tau. Do not differentiate between Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative dementias. Daniel, over to you. Ah, uh, is my screen available? Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Okay. Okay, hey everyone. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Tahniyat, uh, and I am currently uh, serving as a lecturer at Dow uh, Medical College. So, uh, a lot we know that there is a lot of uh, emphasis laid on Alzheimer's disease and the related and related dementias these days. Um, so, uh, ke keeping in pace with that, uh, myself and my senior PT members, uh, which comprise of Professor Fauzi Amtiaz, who is the head of department at Dow Medical College, uh, Dr. Naila Shabazz, who is the head of neurology department at Civil um, uh, Hospital, and Dr. Uzma Zaman, who is uh, an assistant professor at the Biochemistry Department, along with a medical student, Afan Ahmed, uh, we uh, this our team performed um, investigated the uh, accuracy of plasma levels of amyloid beta forty two and phos. for related to uh, in patients uh, who were clinically diagnosed as having alzheimer's disease and healthy controls in order to uh, uh, to find the accuracy of these uh, uh, proteins in uh, diagnosing alzheimer's disease uh, so giving a background uh, Uh, in 2019 it was reported that in us around 5.8 million patients were uh, diagnosed to have alzheimer's disease with 70% of the cases new cases that are arising they are arising from low and middle income countries uh, keeping in mind that around the, the estimated cost for caring for dementia by 2030 is around 2000 uh, million dollars so that's a very very high cost um around the background that alzheimer's disease was first diagnosed by dr alois alzheimer in 1906 uh, since then efforts have been uh, were being made to uh, establish uh, the uh, uh, the diagnostic criteria along with understanding the pathogenesis of this disease and the first diagnostic criteria was published in 1984 by national institute of neurology and neurological and cardiac disorders and stroke and alzheimer's disease and related disorders uh, um, uh, association and according to this diagnostic criteria uh, diagnosis could uh, so alzheimer's disease was given a clinical construct and it was believed that clinical symptoms always coexisted with the underlying pathology no use of biomarkers were proposed that was proposed at that time and it was considered that diagnosis could only be confirmed histopathologically in the clinics which means that either at autopsy or through brain biopsy in clinics the disease could only be diagnosed either as probable or possible alzheimer's disease 
with the advancement in uh, the immunological assays and uh, the, uh, the which were able to measure protein levels in in the in in, in fluid in, flu, in the fluids of uh, of uh, people, uh, this criteria was revised in 2011 by National Institute of Aging and Alzheimer's Association. And in this criteria, Alzheimer's disease was given a clinical biomarker construct, which means that the main diagnosis rested on the clinical symptoms of the patient, but the bio use of biomarkers was proposed to support this diagnosis. The terms probable and possible AD continued in the clinics, but the disease now had a clinical biomarker construct. Recently, 2018, NIAAA again provided a recent framework in which Alzheimer's disease was given a completely biological construct, which means that uh, they separated the clinical symptoms from the pathology and suggested that, the, that it is completely possible that the pathology of Alzheimer's disease exists without the appearance of clinical symptoms. Clinical symptoms were considered the end stage of, of disease, at which time treatment is rendered ineffective. So, it, with this, they, it was possible now that the disease could be identified in the living through the use of biomarkers. The uh, terms of probable and possible AD were replaced by Alzheimer's clinical syndrome. So it means that in the clinics, clinically, when the patient was diagnosed, that patient is to be labeled as Alzheimer's clinical syndrome patient. Uh, the ATN classification was proposed in this 2018 research framework, which, uh, which divided the biomarkers into three categories, depending on the three hallmarks of the disease, which, can, which, which comprise of uh, amyloidosis, tauopathy, and neurodegeneration. Each category consists of a fluid and an imaging biomarker. The fluid biomarkers are measured in CSF, while the imaging biomarkers are mainly PET biomarkers or through our, our neurodegeneration is detected through MRI. Uh, in our research, however, now these uh, biomarkers in the CSF, they are pretty well established um, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as in research, and they have been found consistently altered in patients with Alzheimer's disease. However, the limitation with the use of these biomarkers is that PET scans are inexpensive and scarcely available, even in the developed countries of the world, and we're not talking about uh, underdeveloped countries. And lumbar puncture is very invasive, and it is not possible to carry out lumbar punctures in the OPD setting where Alzheimer's disease patients mostly report. Hence, our research is directed towards finding blood-based biomarkers, which are more uh, easily available and less invasive. Um, this research uh, marks um, uh, a, a new arena in Pakistan, especially because in Pakistan, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease rests on clinical, on clinical grounds. No AD biomarkers have been previously tested on Pakistani population or have been reported. Recently, a study was conducted by NAST in which the similar biomarkers were detected in blood, but they were done on cognitively uh, impaired patients, not particularly on Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, so we uh, compared the plasma levels of these two proteins and subjects who were diagnosed with Alzheimer's clinical syndrome and other neurodegenerative oh. dementia. To, uh, and the aim was to establish reliable diagnostic tools for early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, our methodology comprised of that this is an analytical cross-sectional study which took place in the neurology wards of the civil and Dow International Hospital Ojha campus. Along, we took some patients from uh, the AQ uh, Khan uh, Institute of Behavioral Sciences as well. The samples were collected through non-probability consecutive sampling and the patients who were diagnosed with neurodegenerative dementias and who consented to be part of the study were included, while those with neurologic or psychiatric diseases, brain injury, uh, TIA or CVA, which was followed within three months by cognitive decline, normal pressure hydrocephalus and brain tumor patients were excluded from the study. The study methodology uh, uh, was that uh, when the patients presented to the clinics, to the neurology OPDs with cognitive decline, they were assessed by the attendant, attending neurophysician and based on the clinical uh, presentation of the patient, his history, the MRI scan, Along with exclusion of other causes of dementia, the patients were, uh, when the patient was diagnosed with having neurodegenerative dementia, the patients were divided into two groups. One, 
with Alzheimer's clinical syndrome and the other with neurodegenerative dementias other than Alzheimer's disease, in which uh, in our case, they were mostly Lewy body dementias. Uh, informed consent was taken. The patients were asked to fill a questionnaire uh, with the help of the attendants uh, because they were cognitively impaired patients. And uh, five CC, which the, the questionnaire comprised of their demographic details along with their uh, lifestyle um, uh, uh, factors. Uh, five CC blood sample was drawn and was sampled. The sample was transferred to lab in ICE and centrifuged at 3,000 rounds per minute for 15 minutes at four degrees Celsius. Plasma was collected and divided into allocotes and it was stored at 80 degrees Celsius for further analysis, until further analysis. Just before analysis, the, the plasma uh, levels uh, were, the plasma was thawed on ice first, and then it was brought to room temperature. ELISA was run to find the, uh, to find the A, beta 42 and P tau levels quantitatively um, in each aliquot using the commercially available ELISA kits. Uh, that Dr. was but that were, uh, Please uh, quickly go through the study results. We have a limited see, time. Just, Okay, right. So this is, uh, I'm done with the methodology. Um, the research findings, this is the demographic table, which is self-explanatory. And the ma main feature in that is that both the groups that was one with Alzheimer's uh, 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 clinical syndrome and the one with neurodegenerative dementias, they were pretty similar because the p-values were all insignificant. So they were, uh, they were pretty similar in their age group, gender, ethnicity, and comorbids. Um, however, the, uh, the t-test did not reveal uh, any significant difference between the A beta 42 levels and P tau in the plasma of the patients with ACS group, with an ACS group and the neurodegenerative dementia groups. Similar uh, results were obtained by, through rock analysis in which uh, the, the rock analysis did not reveal promising results um, for is ACS versus ND groups, uh, which indicated that these two biomarkers uh, were not very effective in uh, differentiating Alzheimer's disease from other neurodegenerative dementias. Um, so the correlation analysis only showed a significant cor uh, weak correlation of phosphorylated tau uh, with um, the MMSE score of the patients. Uh, however, the A beta 42 levels were not related, were not correlated with the MMSE score of the subjects. The strengths, uh, the re reflecting on our study, the strength of the study is that it's among the pioneer studies on biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease in Pakistan, first to report results uh, uh, as far as our, to, to the best, to the best of our knowledge. The weakness is that it's, the study has a small sample size up till now. Uh, although the study is still ongoing, possibility of selection bias because the diagnosis was made on clinical grounds on the discretion of the neurophysician. Larger longitudinal studies can provide opportunity for finding blood-based biomarkers to detect Alzheimer's disease in its early stage and treatment where treatment is rendered effective. Future, in future, we suggest that CSF biomarkers should be measured in conjunction with the plasma biomarkers to establish a correlation between them. Uh, and A-beta 42 to 40 ratio is a better measure as compared to A-beta 42 alone. Uh, conclusively, uh, we, uh, we, conclu we, uh, we suggest that plasma amyloid beta 42 and phosphorylated tau do not differentiate Alzheimer's disease from other neurode uh, neurodegenerative dementias, and hence it cannot be used as effective biomarker for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, these are the references, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanyat. Uh, with that, we are moving to our next presentation by uh, Mr. Bilal Siddiqui on using respiratory parameters, analyze the effect of theoretical knowledge on stress during novel experiences. Bilal, can you hear yes. us? Yes, yeah. yes, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Tanya, please stop sharing your screen. Okay, Bilal, you may now share your screen.
Is my screen visible? No, not yet. Uh, I think Bilal is having some issues with uh, his connection. We can move our move to our next presenter, Rimsha Aftab. Rimsha, are you with us? Rimsha? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Am I audible? Okay. okay. Yes, yes. Miss Rimsha Aftab will be presenting on deliberate self-harming behaviors and loneliness and exploratory study on adolescents and young adults. Uh, Miss Rimsha, you can go ahead. Sure. Okay, is my screen visible? <clears throat> yes, yes, it is visible. All right. So, assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Rimsha Arsalan. And I am a PhD scholar at the Department of Psychology, University of Karachi. And I actually carried out this research study under the supervision of Dr. Rabia Riaz, who is serving as an assistant professor uh, at the Department of Psychology, University of Karachi. So today I'm going to talk about the deliberate self-harming behaviors and feelings of loneliness. This research study was basically carried out with the adolescents and young adults uh, population of Karachi. So self-harming behaviors are basically those behaviors or those acts which people engage in to, in order to uh, cause injury or um, any kind of damage to their own body parts, to their own body tissues. You know, uh, self-harming behaviors can be done with or without the intention to suicide. Generally, for a very long, harming behaviors were highly and strongly connected with the people who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorders, but now a large body of research has um, validated the fact that people who are not even diagnosed with borderline personality disorders can also engage in self-harming behaviors. The research estimates reveal that the self-harming behaviors can uh, start it, it can, you know, people can engage into it at any time of life and ge generally it uh, begins. It originates from the adolescence period, you know, the early teenage, um, teenage group. A few of the primary motivators for self-harming behaviors are regulations of emotions, alcohol consumption, and loneliness. But regulation of emotions is basically the failure to hold back your emotions when you're emotionally drained, when you feel you are emotionally disconnected from the people around. Alcohol consumption is something that we all know that is that can have so drastic and negative effects on the human mind and body. And loneliness is something that is experienced that the subjective state, state of this. You know, loneliness is not something that you don't have people around you. Might, you might have good friends, you might have family, you might have people around you. Still, you are just not in a way to connect psychologically or emotionally with them. Well, however, there is a large body of research studies which has been done on the self-harming behaviors and uh, uh, the feelings of loneliness around the world, and they have shown the very strong, uh, significant <clears throat> uh, research evidences, and they have also maintained. Um, and they've also concluded that, you know, it is highly prevalent among the adolescents and 20 to 50 percent of people engage into self-harming behaviors who have uh, been experiencing the feelings of loneliness. Feelings of loneliness are basically, you know, can, uh, you know, the first two decades of human life are very, very crucial to get into the feelings of loneliness, the extreme feelings, and ultimately engaging into behaviors that can be self-injurious and self-harming to your own self. Then we have, okay. The rationale, the reason behind carrying out this research study over here is that a lot of research has already been done, but they were all done. Most of them were done in this uh, in the Western regions for that. We don't have a lot of literature available on the similar topic for East Asian population in, in East Asian countries. So given the cultural disparity, we were interested to study, we were interested to, uh, to assess if these factors, you know, exist in um, this part of the world as well. For that matter, the for the for carrying out the research study, the hypotheses that were designed uh, aimed at studying the relationship between self-harming behaviors and the feelings of 
uh, loneliness. <clears throat> for that matter, the research design we opted for was correlational in design. 130, 130 participants were segregated into adolescents and young adults, and they were approached to purposive sampling and from different educational institutions of Karachi. In order to carry out the study, the measuring scales we had were ISAS by Klonsky and UCLA for assessing the uh, feelings of loneliness. Coming over to results and discussions of the research study, this is here you can see this table number one, which shows the most preferred methods that people engage into uh, for committing self-harming behaviors. It is, 41 per it is reported that 41% of people actually chose to bang themselves to uh, against the um, against any strong object or hard object or any wall or door to hit themselves then we have cutting then we have biting we have uh, pulling hair and severe severe scratching these are those methods for which people have reported to be highly um, you know inclined to for committing self injurious behaviors this is the second table which shows the recent self harm attempted that is when the research was conducted they were asked when they when they attempted into when they attempted to the self harming behavior and it was reported that 30.8% of the people of the population actually <clears throat> had engaged into the self injurious behaviors a week ago when the research was carried out and then this is the urge this is the table that is presenting the urge duration urge duration that is that shows clearly that 33.6% of the people showed that, that the urge to commit uh, self-harm or injure their body parts or body tissues in during the in less than one hour. Then they were asked if they wish to you know stop harming their own self. 27.4% people reported that they do not wish to stop harming them, their own self, their own bodies, which is quite an alarming figure. Moving on to the another um, stat statistical analysis of the study which focuses on the studying, uh, anal analyzing the relationship between loneliness and self-harming behaviors. We can see that for combating the loneliness, <clears throat> there's, they, they, you know, they reduce the interpersonal bond boundaries and for com combating the interpersonal boundaries, they have reduced feelings of uh, perceived loan, of, um, you know, uh, feeling the loneliness. It can be either, since we are just uh, interested to study re relationship. There we have loneliness and self-punishment people, have the feelings of punishment, uh, have the feelings of loneliness in order to punish themselves. Next, we have loneliness and self-care. When there is increased intensity, when there's high intensity of loneliness, there's decreased self-care. When there's, are, you know, uh, <clears throat> people who feel, uh, who experience loneliness, they have, they don't really, really care about themselves. Then we have loneliness and anti-dissociation. People who have feelings of loneliness, they usually engage, engage in trendy dissociation. That is, they dissociate themselves from their world and the people around. Loneliness and marking distress. Marking distress is something that is the that is the clinical distress. It is a very um, uh, increased level of distress. So people have, with feelings of loneliness, they actually you know get into the feelings of loneliness to combat with the um, this, the, the levels of distress they may be going through. Okay, how what we conclude from this research study is that that we um, you know it is very um, alarming that uh, we have got very high figures for the people who have reported to be engaging into self harming behaviors and for uh, future recommendations we can uh, see that they can that that the factors that can be further studied are self uh, self esteem internet usage life satisfaction perceived stress and there are a lot of academic and uh, factors that can be related to their personal life to assess the intensity of loneliness and their engagement into the self-harming behavior. So that's um, it from now. Thank you very much. And here are the references. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramsha. With that, uh, please uh, stop sharing your screen. Sure. With that, we are moving towards uh, our uh, last two presentations uh, by Bilal Siddiqui. Uh, Mr. Bilal, can you hear us? Uh, yes, so I can hear you. Okay, so the first presentation will be on using respiratory parameters, analyze the effects of theoretical knowledge on stress during novel experiences. Over to you. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it is. All right. So, Assalamu alaikum, Raiban. My name is Bilal Sadiq, and I'm a biomedical engineer and a research assistant at Air University, Islamabad, Pakistan. So, for my two presentations, I've conducted two pilot studies, one of which I'll be presenting in this presentation and the other in the 
Next one. So for our first study, we used respiratory parameters to analyze the effect of theoretical knowledge on stress during novel experiences. Now, in order to better understand what we are trying to achieve with this study, I will like to paint to you a situation. College students, and particularly students who are pursuing higher education in the field of medicine or biomedical engineering, are in a unique situation that they are faced with a variety of unfamiliar, unique, and novel stressors on a day-to-day -day basis. And frequent and repeated exposure to these type of stressors can evoke stressful responses, all of which have detrimental impacts on both their physiological and their psychological health. This repeated exposure to stressors affects both their health and then their cognitive performance, which is crucial and very detrimental for people who are working in such a high risk type of field. So what's the solution in this particular case and how do we address this problem of students facing stressors on a day-to-day -day basis? There are multiple solutions, one of which is to provide the students with an ample amount of training and give them ample amount of theoretical knowledge of the stressor that they will be facing or the situation that will be, they will be facing. This removes the element of surprise and the unfamiliarity that they have with the stressor and thus in turn diminishes the physiological and the psychological impact of the evoked stress response in the subject. Another way to look at this situation is we've all seen horror movies. An example of a classical horror movie tactic to induce stress or to scare a person is the jump scare. The jump scare works on the fact, factor of anticipation and the unfamiliarity with the situation. Now, if a person were to give you a detailed and thorough description of the jump scare that you're about to see, you'd still have an evoked stress response, but that response will be significantly diminished as compared to having no knowledge of what or when or when or what something, something might occur in that particular situation. Now, this brings us to our actual hypothesis that we are trying to address in this two-part study. So in this case, we are trying to investigate how much of a quantifiable impact does theoretical knowledge of a stressor has on reducing the intensity of the evoked stress response in the subject. And for this study, we focused on the respiratory parameters, most common of which is breathing rate. Now, a brief introduction to our study is that we have already thoroughly discussed what stress is, but in a layman's terms, psychological stress is the state of emotional distress or pressure and frequent exposure to it can have detrimental psychological and physiological impacts on the subjects, which is something we wish to avoid and we wish to investigate how that impact can be diminished. Now, due to the abstract nature of stress, because stress is a combination of reactions and situations all coming together in a person, both psychological and physiological, it is rather difficult to quantify as there is no perfect approach which can tell you that this person is stressed right now or not. And there are multiple studies being conducted on this particular subject as to what is the perfect way to quantify stress. One common parameter that is used is breathing rate. Now, few studies have explored this topic, but most of them used the stressor, uh, used a stressor which was either physical exercise or the standardized Trier stress test, which simulates a situation of a person giving a presentation to an audience or having a quiz or a viva being taken off them but they only explored as to what physiological parameters were affected by stress. <clears throat> we wish to investigate in this study, how much of a difference does theoretical knowledge of the stressor affect the evoked stress response through, in this case, breathing rate. Now for our methodology, the target students that we use, and since this is a pilot study, we used a total of 20 participants, 11 male and nine females, who aged around 19 years old, all from the Department of Biomedical Engineering of Air University, Islamabad. For a respiratory analysis and for a respiratory data, we used a power, the Power Lab 26T's capacitive chest strap. Now, this detects the thoracic movement, and the chest strap was positioned in such a way that it experienced the maximum amount of extension whenever a person breathed. So, every time the belt extended, a breath was recorded on the waveform and in the apparatus. Now, our <laughs> subjects could be divided into two groups. Group one is the students from the first semester, which contained 10 subjects, all of which had no theoretical knowledge of the stresses that they were about to receive. Whereas group two were the students from the third semester, which had some prior knowledge of the stressor, not particularly the stressor that we were going to give them in this study, but they had knowledge of the general knowledge of the stressor that they would be, uh, be seeing. Now, in order to investigate 
the difference between the theoretical knowledge, difference caused by the theoretical knowledge between resting and stress state, we had two states. In the resting state, we gathered data of the subjects in a stationary position for five minutes and the breathing data was collected. In the stress state, we gave the students a thorough and a gruesome description of a cadaver that they, and we were told them that they would be actually operating on that cadaver and would have to identify different components, perform certain procedures on that particular cadaver. This was told to both group one and group two of the subjects. Now, those who were from the third semester already knew what a cadaver was. They knew what to expect from a cadaver, whereas the students from the first semester had no idea what a cadaver was and what they could expect. The aim was to introduce anticipatory stress into the students, and this would help us determine whether theoretical knowledge does affect the evoked stress response or not. For ethical reasons, we did not use an actual cadaver, and we instead used a CPR dummy that was covered with a white cloth that simulated the look of an actual cadaver. For pre-processing, we used a 50 hertz nostril to remove the power line noise, and since this is a breathing signal, we are only focusing on the breathing rate. The frequency range from 0.1 hertz to 1 hertz was more than enough to filter out the breathing signal for both abnormal or normal breathing rates. For feature extraction, we extracted the each individual peak that we saw in the waveform as each individual peak corresponded to a particular breath taken at that moment in time. Since the release of adrenaline leads to stress and that increased stress leads to elevated breathing rates. Moving on towards our result. Since we were comparing uh, the same group and under two different conditions, that is the rest and the stress rate, we used a paired t-test to whether uh, to test whether there was a statistically significant difference between the two groups, between the two groups and within them, between the rest and the stress states. Figure one shows that in group one, there was a statistically significant difference of with a p-value of less than 0.05, which showed that the breathing rate st uh, significantly changed between the rest and stress states for the students of the first semester. Whereas if we take a look at the figure two, there was an insignificant difference between the breathing rate, which was as expected because they already knew what a cadaver was and what they would be expecting from the stressor they were, they were about to see. For further analysis, we did also a gender-based analysis within each group as to see which particular gender was more affected by the stressor. And in this case, we saw that in the first semester, males were the most affected by the stressor or the ability of not knowing the stressor. And this introduced a greater difference between the breathing rates when they were compared to the resting and the stress states. Whereas if you take a look at the third semester subjects, we see that both male and females had an insignificant difference between their, in their breathing rates between their resting and their stressed states. Which leads us to our conclusion. Then these results hence suggest that theoretical knowledge of a stressor does indeed impact the evoked stress response in participants as seen between the subjects of both groups. Thus, in order to reduce this evoked stress response and to improve their future cognitive performance and physio physiological health, we should better train the students and provide them with ample theoretical knowledge of the stressor that they're about to see or they're about to operate on. So this concludes the first presentation. Uh, I will be moving on to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Bilal. You can share your screen with the next PowerPoint. It is on uh, investigating the effect of theoretical knowledge on stress response using ECG. Yes. You, you can continue. Thank you. So for our second part of our pilot study, we investigated the effect of theoretical knowledge on stress during novel experiences. Now, say we are again faced with the same problem of the medical students and biomedical students all facing unique stresses in the day-to-day -day environment. And our main aim is to find a way to reduce the impact of the evoked stress response on those subjects so that they are able to better perform in the professional field and their cognitive performance is not severely or detrimentally impacted. A solution to this is to provide them theoretical knowledge and trainings as discussed previously before. So in this case, our hypothesis was to investigate the effect of theoretical knowledge of a stressor that it makes in diminishing the evoked stress response. But now we are focusing on a very common parameter that is also used to quantify stress, which are cardi cardiovascular parameters. 
Now in cardiovascular parameters, we have heart rate, we have heart rate variability, but the most common cardiovascular parameter is blood pressure, which is easily elevated whenever a person is faced with a stressful situation. There are multiple ways to measure blood pressure, one of which is the non-invasive way by using a blood pressure cuff, or there is, but the problem with that particular method is that it's not continuous and it is often strenuous to the subject whose blood pressure we are acquiring. Another method is to use, use an invasive blood pressure apparatus that continuously measures, measures their blood pressure, but uh, that particular case makes it already uncomfortable and introduces a new source of stress for that particular patient. So how do we measure the blood pressure of a subject continuously without impacting or introducing a source of stress from the apparatus and only focusing on the source of stress that we are trying to provide to them in that particular study? Which brings us to our methodology. Again, the same students were targeted for this particular study, 20 participants, 10 from the first semester, 10 from the second semester, a total of 11 males and nine females aged around 19 years, all from the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Air University, Islamabad. Now for our experimental setup, in order, our target was to acquire blood pressure. So with this, for this particular apparatus or for this particular protocol, we used two components or two apparatus a lead to ECG configuration in which we acquired the person's ECG in the lead to configuration and the PPG sensor, a piezoelectric PPG sensor that was attached to the middle finger of their hand using the same PowerLag 2060 acquisition apparatus. We maintained the same groups, first semester and second semester, those with knowledge of the stressor and those that did not have knowledge of the particular stressor. And the same protocol was used in providing them a gruesome description of the cadaver, but an actual cadaver was not used. Instead, we use a CPR dummy for ethical reasons. Now, the difference comes in the methodology between the two studies. In this case, we are dealing with two signals, the ECG signal and the PPG signal, the ECG or the electrocardiogram, which maps out the electrical activity of the heart, and the PPG signal, that is the photoplethysmogram that measures the blood flow and the blood concentration in a particular blood vessel where the PPG sensor is placed. In this case, the middle finger of the right hand. So for pre-processing, we first filtered the data using a 50 hertz notch filter to remove power line noise. Next, for the ECG data, we used a 0.5 hertz to 150 hertz band pass filter to clean the ECG signal because this frequency bandwidth covers both the normal range of an ECG and the abnormal range of ECG, which we were expecting in the case of providing them a stressor. And similarly, for our PPG signal, we used a 0.3 hertz to 20 hertz band pass filter to filter the PPG signal. Moving on towards our actual feature that we extracted, which brings us to our, the term pulse transit time. Since our aim was to investigate the change in blood pressure, pulse transit time is an agreed upon unit used in multiple literatures, multiple research studies that shows that it is a relative measure and a very accurate relative measure of the change in blood pressure of a subject. How does it work? Well, the ECG waveform, particularly the R wave in the ECG waveform shows the exact moment when the heart contracts or when the ventricle contracts. So that can be supposed as the point of time at which the blood leaves the heart. Similarly, if we focus on the PPG signal, if we, by, depending upon where the, we place the PPG sensor on the person, we detect the, blood, the income of blood flow or the incoming blood flow. And the highest amplitude that we see in this PPG signal, this one particularly right here, corresponds and is also known as the systolic notch and corresponds as the point where the maximum amount of blood flow was observed by the sensor at that particular point. So as the term suggests, the pulse transit time is basically the time taken by the blood to leave the heart and reach the point that we, where we have attached the PPG, reach the point of the body where we have attached the PPG sensor. And this time is a measure of basically how much the blood pressure has changed in the person because depending upon the evoked stress, there can be a change in the vasculature of that person. There can be vasoconstriction or vasodilation depending upon whether the stress response was significant or not. And this vasoconstriction and vasodilation affects both the blood pressure and the speed at which the blood flows from the heart to the periphery of the body, in this case, the right middle finger of the hand. So by measuring the time taken by the heart to leave the heart, uh, measuring taken by the time taken by the blood to leave the heart and to reach the periphery of the body is an accurate measure of the relative 
blood pressure and the changing blood pressure of that particular subject. So in order to measure it mathematically in our data, what we used is the, the point if time in which the R wave occurred was taken as the first point and the point in time at which we achieved the highest amplitude in the PPG signal was used. The difference between these two points, the difference in time between these two points gives us an idea of how long did it take for that particular pump of blood or for that particular volume of blood to leave the heart and then reach the periphery of the body. Which brings us to our results. Comparing PTT between the resting and stress states of the first semester and the students of the second semester between group one and group two, we saw that again in the first semester students, we observed a statistically significant difference between the resting and the stress states as they had no prior knowledge of the stressor. Whereas in the second group, which is the students of the third semester that had knowledge of what a cadaver was and what they were expecting, they had an insignificant difference between their stressing and stress states. For further analysis, we also did a gender-based uh, comparison in, this in these particular groups. So again, in the first semester, it was again observed that the statistically significant difference between resting and stress states was observed in the, men, in the male section of the subjects, whereas the female section only showed an insignificant difference between the resting and the stress states. And this is only for the first semester. Whereas if we go, move towards the second, uh, third semester, we again see that there was an insignificant difference between the two. Thus, in conclusion, we can see that in both of these studies, we saw that the breathing rate and the pulse transit time, both of them were affected in these semesters. And there was a significant, statistically significant difference between these two states in the resting and the, in these two parameters between the resting and the stress states for those students who had no prior knowledge of the stressor that they were about to see, which gives us evidence and which proves that by equipping students with proper theoretical knowledge and giving them ample training of the stressors that they're about to face, they're about to experience, they're about to operate on, can significantly impact the evoked stress response and thus diminish the detrimental effects of continuous exposure to stress. Thank you very much. And that'll be all for me. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal Siddiqui. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Bilal and Dr. Zia to share their views and comments and questions. The platform is open for that. Uh, thank you, Yusra. I think uh, uh, this is a great conference. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me in uh, such a prestigious and interesting conference. Although, uh, according to the engineering uh, aspects, we have very uh, little exposure to these kind of uh, uh, so, uh, physiological uh, conferences. But uh, I always believe that this kind of conferences will uh, enlighten our mind and open some new ways to perform different kind of researches in the field of uh, uh, um, psychophysiology as well as in the field of biomedical engineering. So I think the conference was really great. The best part was the uh, presentation of the Dr. Sadaf that was I really enjoyed. And although the uh, present free presentations also, the students are really working uh, progressively, uh, starting from the sleep apnea and, and with the uh, pulse transit time. So that was a good journey of uh, two, three hours which I really enjoyed and different phases in it start. Uh, sometimes uh, we discuss about the COVID and sometime hippocampus and detail a presentation on the hippocampus. That was also uh, very interesting. And I really enjoyed uh, the, this uh, time span, although on the Saturday, but uh, I really enjoyed that. And it was good to be in the presentation and see the, uh, the young minds are working properly uh, to uh, flourish our country in the near future. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Yes, yeah, alaikum. It's Dr. Bilal Sadeki. Thank you, Dr. Jamuddin. And thank you, Ujala, Yusra, Dr. Sadaf, and every team member of this uh, psychophysiology conference and I really appreciate and uh, you know the efforts done by the whole team of Eric uh, in terms of bringing the research and evidence on the forefront especially where the concept of uh, utilizing the new students uh, in, in bringing the research evidence on the forefront. So um, all the presentations were very well presented and I really uh, would like to, uh, you know, pinpoint this point, uh, this point, this uh, idea that 
the topics and the concepts which the students have brought in terms of their research evidences have helped all the you know present uh, you know listeners and uh, in the journals and evidence uh, has helped uh, will be helping us to uh, you know greatly in augmenting the research evidences available in the literature so all the topics are quite relevant and they are very well presented they were very well presented so i really appreciate it and um, especially one more thing i would like to you know suggest that um, some of the students they have not discussed the ethical issues concerning the handling of rats and animal cases in their studies so the concept of bioethics and the bio you know ethical issues concerning the studies should be discussed as well even in the slightest form but it should be discussed so that is from all from my side and i really appreciate and uh, thank you and you know uh, um, uh, thank you the eric team for their great effort in bringing such evidences on the forefront thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Bilal and Dr. Zia, for your kind opinions and comments. Uh, with that, I will move towards Dr. Sada for the closing remarks for the session. Dr. Sada, over to you. Thank you, Yusra. Um, uh, actually, this conference was first time being organized virtually. So it uh, was on experiment basis, obviously, because uh, always we got so many papers and we got so big scientific session. Uh, we never had such a small scale conference, but again, it is proved to be big in uh, a different sense because we had two very great mentors of ours uh, as a keynote speaker and plenary uh, speaker. And they have given a very great overview on the psychophysiology, the applied psychophysiology, how you can make career in that and how uh, we are uh, progressing with the, uh, this new birding field. Though it is not uh, new, it is being there since 75 years and uh, there is lo a lot of research and everything. I also acknowledge the uh, speakers, uh, on the one hand, we had uh, the pioneers of psychophysiology, Professor Dr. Richard Sherman and Professor Dr. Jerry Devore. And on the other hand, we had uh, Dr. Fazan Mirza and Dr. Shamoon Noshad for uh, just capping the message what we were doing, uh, that uh, how to do research in psychophysiology and what is this research we are doing in psychophysiology. Thank you so much for the uh, panelists, all the panelists chairs and co-chairs who were there with us and uh, hopefully this uh, with one year of gap that was the last year we never uh, uh, got the courage to uh, just organize the conference virtually as well uh, so we skipped that year but uh, uh, since uh, 2014 this conference uh, was making some mark and some waves in the scientific fraternity so this was the seventh year and next year, uh, hopefully, we will be gathering physically and uh, doing it uh, again big. I encourage all of the uh, presenters today uh, with so many diverse topics, with the animal and human studies and uh, how they have presented their work. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, are not doing the parallel session, so we uh, choose only selected presenters. But next time, uh, hopefully, we will do that. Uh, I, at the end, I would like to uh, thank all the audience as well, because they are watching us on live on the YouTube channel and uh, today who participated throughout the session. Uh, thank you so much for joining and uh, we will be updating you regarding our future events as well, uh, because this is just an effort to continue the tradition and continue to promote research in different domains in Pakistan. And hopefully we will be able to uh, uh, get acknowledgement from the global fraternity as well about uh, initiating this. Uh, already we are, are actually eng engaging the global peop uh, people who are working on the same grounds that psychophysiology establishing in Pakistan.